audiobook title, She Becomes a Passive Villainous Knot. Completed by Halloween Godspell Part 03. This work belongs to author Halloween Godspell, the little child, sacrificing his dignity to peel his uncle away from his mother and insert himself in his mother's view. Cryden charmingly reached out his hands to Ramir. The latter, clearly knowing what was up, couldn't say no as they were in the presence of their most beloved woman. And they need to keep their act of getting along together perfectly to see her smile. And true, Adira showed a happy motherly smile at watching her brother and son mingling and spending time together. She was truly blessed to belong in a family with the best people in the empire. Something she failed to appreciate in her last life. It's best you hurry Anne. Adira. Ramir was cut off with a very loud scream and rumbling sounds growing louder and louder before they all turned to the Duke Silverus, who, once again, lost his elegance and composure as he sprinted towards his beloved daughter with tears and snot on his face. Father and mother's been worrying so much. Father was especially bad, he looked like he aged ten gruesome years. Ramay shook his head while supplementing his sister with information before she was once again caught in a bone-crushing hug. However, she did not pull away. She had a vague idea how much her parents must have died a thousand times while worrying about her. And it made her guilty. I'm sorry for worrying you and mother, father. I'm very sorry. But you know, Heisa saved me. My baby did everything he could to bring me back. Adira flaunted her genius and very capable son and Silpha took the surprised child from Rami's shoulders and engulfed him in a tight hug as well. You 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 tilde thang chu, Emma dear grassen tilde tilde grandpa wavs chu tilde, thank you, my dear grandson. Grandpa loves you, Silpha thanked the child repeatedly as he rubbed his teary and messy face on the child's shirt while making that ridiculous noises unfit for a duke. Adira smiled warmly at them before she was also taken into a pair of soft and warm arms and felt hot tears dripping on her shoulders. It was a silent cry but it tugged at her heart most painfully. I'm sorry, mother. No, dearest. You've got nothing to apologize for. It wasn't your fault. What's most important now is that you're back. Safe and sound. Andrea spoke while caressing her daughter's hair before turning to her grandchild to thank him as well and snatched him from Silfa's arms. Give me my cute grandchild. You're so messy, Silpha. Clean yourself and straighten up. You're a duke, for goodness sake. And she was back to herself. Silpha obeyed his wife after giving Adira one more hug and went up to fix himself while Andrea was left to pamper her grandchild, who was also the hero that brought their daughter back. Thank you, darling Heisa. Thank you for not leaving your mother and saving her. Of course, Grandma. Heiser will protect mommy no matter what happens. The little boy adorably puffed his little chests proudly and Andrea couldn't be happier with his words. She was happy her daughter was loved by a child as wonderful as Heiser and a man as patient and loyal as Kasimi. After that, Heiser was pampered more than usual by the servants as well as their flustering around their mistress. The guards were even more alert as well. Now, the Silverous Castle was alert even though there wasn't anything out of sorts. Adira turned to Heisa and set her teacup down before calling the child and beckoning him over to which he wasted not a moment and skipped towards her before he jumped onto her with his little arms attempting to wrap around her. Yes mommy? He cutely looked up to her. Mommy plans to go to daddy later. Do you want to come with me? Heisa will go wherever mommy goes. The child instantly answered with a beaming cute smile and Adira couldn't help but pinch those cute cheeks before engulfing him in a tight warm hug. Mommy is so lucky to have you baby Tilda Tilda I feel like I won the grand lottery or something. She cooed which elicited a cheery giggle from this adorable child. Heisa is luckier because Mommy loves Heisa. Yes Tilda Tilda Mommy loves Heisa the most Tilda Tilda Adira, without a doubt agreed, and peppered light kisses all over the child's round face. She was indeed so damn lucky. While Lifer just watched this pair brightening up the greenhouse, no. Not only the greenhouse but the silverous castle more and casted this warm and happy atmosphere this castle had lost a month ago. She was genuinely happy and thankful from the bottom of her heart that this mother and son pair was reunited and was happy again. Nothing could make her happier than to see her mistress' bright smile on her face. A genuine beautiful happy smile. My lady, if you're going to the palace later, then I have a suggestion Tilda. Lifer suddenly spoke up 
attracting Adira and Heiss's attention, and had this slightly hidden smirk on her pretty face. Notes. Hi. So I was not able to update yesterday and to make it up to you, I updated twice today as well. Thank you for all the comments that I always, always enjoy and the 3k followers and of course, our 367k readers tilde yai. Banzai, let's keep this up. My vow to you, as the mother and son were traveling back to the capital, the king, currently on an audience with the council, was pressured. They were still demanding him to change Casimir's betrothed to Iris Latifolia. It wasn't that they were dubious of Adira's capability, they knew she was plenty capable and fitting for the throne she was to succeed should Casimir ascend and they marry. However, things were different now. Despite the transgressions of the Baron Latifolia, at least his adoptive daughter, who was innocent of the crime of her father, was clean. So they saw nothing wrong with making Iris, who was the legendary Maiden of Light, the queen instead. The observations they noted for the past few months they were made aware of her status, they saw nothing but a pure and kind soul in the embodiment of Iris Latifolia. In their eyes, she was fit to be queen. And what about the Lady Silveris? That girl is more rightful to rise and sit on the throne as the queen. A small fraction, who remained loyal and true to the Duke Silveris, fought back. Yes, but it is more important to secure power. Now that the Alinthi kingdom had been brave and dared to try and take over the empire, who's to say another kingdom won't try? Now's the time that we enforce our dominion over them and what better way to do that than marry the crown prince to the holy maiden? Another, from the opposite faction, said. More points and bickering were thrown left and right and Anastasius was getting incredibly annoyed and irritated with all their screaming and blew up. Enough. I will not absolve Casimir's engagement with the Silverous girl. That is final. The king firmly decided and stood from his throne with a frown before exiting the hall. He was so done listening to those monkeys bicker nonstop. They even had the time to worry about those useless things when the man involved, their crown prince, hasn't even woken up yet. It's been two days since Adira dropped him off the palace and went home and he still hasn't opened his eyes. Anastasius visited Casimir's room and saw the man still in a deep sleep with countless doctors and healers surrounding him, trying to diagnose and figure out why the prince wasn't waking up. How is he? The king asked. Your majesty, the prince remains unconscious. He is merely sleeping but he doesn't respond to anything. Even the Lady Silverist name isn't enough. What's not enough? A feminine voice interrupted them and all eyes turned to the door to find the very person they've been using as bait to wake the first prince but to no avail. And they all fell silent to her question. No one dared to break the news to her. Kasumi still hasn't woken up. It was the king who spoke with a sullen voice as he turned his gaze back to his sleeping son. He looked incredibly peaceful though so at least that lifted a little bit of worry off his chest. Why? Adira asked and approached Kasumi's bedside placing the flowers she and Heiser picked from the greenhouse on a flower vase on his table. We don't know. They've done everything they could but apparently he doesn't respond to anything. Why don't you have a go, child? Anastasia suggested, thinking that maybe if this stubborn man heard his wife's voice, then maybe he'll suddenly spring back to life. Because, wasn't he always like that? He'll even rise from his grave if he hears his wife calling for him, right? Casey, can you hear me? I'm here. We are waiting for you. Hi sir and I have a surprise for you and I hope you'll love it. The girl said while softly caressing his silver locks, gently combing her porcelain white slender fingers through his hair. When there was still no response from the man, she suddenly fished out a small maroon velvet box from Heiser's cute little panda knapsack. She then took something from it before sliding it on his left fourth finger. I had Heiser cast a defensive type magic on this so it will protect you when I can't. I'm sorry our wedding had to be like this, Casey, but I'm never allowing you to let go of me again and this is my vow to you. I pledge to you that into your eyes will I smile in the morning. I pledge to you my living and my dying, each equally in your care. I shall be a shield for your back and you for mine. Above and beyond this, I will cherish and honor you through this life and into the next. Adira said her vows before placing a kiss on the makeshift ring she and Heisa made for him and placing another one on his lips to seal her vow to him. From henceforth, she was the great demon lord's, Prince Casimir's wife. The gallery of healers, doctors, 
servants and the king himself looked at this beautiful and magical moment as the woman, the prince oh so desperately chased after, finally stopped and willingly tied herself to him. The servant ladies felt hot tears stream down from their eyes as well as the old doctors and healers. Anastasius also felt himself almost tear up before he hurriedly looked the other way and blinked really fast in an attempt to hide his tears. This was indeed a wonderful and heartwarming moment. And although the ceremony wasn't as grand as what a royal wedding should be, it was nonetheless perfect. Oh my sweet daughter, have you really thought this through? Yes, your majesty, no, father. I have made up my mind. Adira's smile at that moment was the most beautiful they have seen on her yet as she looked at everyone individually with that firm and absolute finality in her, entrancing ash-like eyes before she once again turned to the sleeping Kasumi. And her facial features softened into one that held undeniable love and she looked at this man like he was her whole world, before she added, I am, from now on, Kasumi's wife. Notes. Hi. A little trivia about Adira's vow. It is a Celtic's traditional wedding vow that I tweaked a little bit. So if you are curious about the original and the entirety of it, you can find it in Google. Thanks for the comments, votes, follows and love like always tilde tilde. Tilde, I will be waiting for your comments, okay? Love love love, aren't we? In his deep sleep, a product of all the days he was not able to sleep properly, Kasumi relived the days he spent peaceful and happy days with Adira. Their usual outings, which ends up with the woman bashfully claiming that they were out on a date, the late night tutorial sessions, those random moments when she drags him out of his office under the pretense that she was craving for something, but in truth, she just didn't want to see him cooped up in his dull and lifeless office. It was those simple moments he was most thankful of, to the point that it didn't fail to scare him that maybe he was taking things for granted. However, it was also in those dreams that he relived the pain of having to painfully let her go and watch her leave him as his fragile and gelid heart broke into a million shards. He relived that nightmare every time he closes his eyes. It was because of that very reason that falling asleep scared him so much. Adira. Adira. Don't go. He whispered in a soft and tragic whisper as he called for the woman's name over and over again, begging her not to leave him. And the woman, who stayed by his side, promptly took his icy hands into her small and warm ones, bringing them up to her cheeks, as she answered his call. I'm here, Casey. On the fourth day since he'd been asleep, Casimi slowly peeled his eyes open to the golden morning light that streamed in from his window. He didn't know how long he had been asleep, but he was definitely feeling as fresh as new. Although there was some sluggishness in his extremities, but he was, otherwise, fine. He tried to block the bright light with his arm when he couldn't do so as he felt something heavy on top of it. Curious, he turned his head. It took him a good few seconds to register the woman's serene and beautiful sleeping visage in his mind, who was using his arm as a pillow with hers draped across his chest. Maybe it was because he was too used to seeing her face in his dreams, that he gingerly reached out his other hand to caress her face. It felt too real. Getting annoyed with him touching and pinching her cheeks, the woman stirred awake and those lovely ash-like eyes gazed up to him and smiled sweetly. Ah, here comes the nightmare again. Good morning, husband. Her melodious and endearing soft voice called him with a peculiar name before she pulled herself up and placed a soft kiss on his lips. It's real. I thought. I thought you would not address me as such till we are wed. He asked, wearing a confused expression on his face, and arched a brow. But instead of answering his question immediately, she took his left hand that was caressing her face earlier before she kissed the makeshift ring almost coming, undone, and stared back into his platinum orbs with a smile and said, aren't we? He just woke up so he wasn't really understanding any of Adira's vague answers before his eyes drifted to the ring Adira just kissed. It was worn out now, given that it was only made from flowers and stems, kind of like a miniature flower wreath, and the idea finally settled in his mind that caused him to spring up from his bed and held his hand against a brighter light. Are we? Am I? Um, yes, Casey, we're married. You're my husband and I am not down for a divorce. Wait. Wait a goddamn minute. We're married. I married you? When? The man asked incredulously. I mean, how could an event as wonderful and miraculous as him finally marrying her and tying her to him happen without him knowing? 
He didn't get to prepare anything. He didn't prepare a ring for her, a priest to bind their souls for eternity, or an exquisite and grand ceremony that the woman deserves. This was too sudden. What's this? Did you perhaps not want to marry me? The woman asked calmly, not. She was heating up. A little more and she'll set the bed on fire. I want to. I most definitely want to. Kasumi hurriedly replied to calm the woman down, to which he fortunately successfully did, and he suddenly paused. He was having a bit of trouble wrapping his mind around this fact that he was married to Adira, that he was finally married to the woman he loved the most. I'm her husband. I'm her husband. Unconsciously, as he repeated that chant in his heart like a silent prayer, tears soundlessly spilled from his eyes and crawled down his perfect and handsome face. C.A. Casey. Why are you crying? The woman panicked. Maybe she went too far with her almost setting the room on fire and it scared him. Wait. Scared him? Anyway. Dearest, are you okay? Are you hurting anywhere? Should I call the doctors or the healers? Wait for me, okay. I'll be quick. The fretting woman wasn't able to even move a single inch when she was suddenly pulled into his arms and he felt him tremble badly. I'm your husband. I'm your husband. The man suddenly laughed joyfully and almost crushed the woman in his tight embrace as he pulled her back into the bed. And he continued to laugh merrily while he happily exclaimed, I'm your husband. He only stopped exclaiming when he held the woman's face gently and kissed her full on her cherry red lips, tasting her thoroughly before he felt a light tap on his back. He pulled back and watched his woman blush furiously under him before she tried hiding behind her hands and pointed at something beside them. No. Erase that. Someone. There, sitting with a very aggrieved frown on his cute and round, just woken up face. Heiser was crossing his short arms across his chest and puffed out his cheeks indignantly. Mommy is mine. He proudly claimed. Of course, my son. She's your mother. No one can ever take that away from you. Kasumi agreed and watched the child's face visibly relax as he heard those words before a smirk spread across the man's face and turned back to his red as a ruby wife. He dipped his head and kissed her yearningly and for a few seconds before turning to Heiser with a bright smile, but she's my wife. Life ah. Your plan of greeting the great demon lord with a good morning kiss back I read. I think I just flipped his switch. Notes. Hi Tilda free dog food everyone Tilda come get your share and relish this long overdue dog food you single dogs Tilda Tilda. Ho ho Tilda will Tilda I'll be waiting for your comments then Tilda Banzo i.e. Tilda Tilda. His queen. Triton returned back to the Dalriada castle and despite being its only heir and young lord, there was no one to welcome him home. The guards even acted as if they could not see him and ignored him. He expected this though. From the moment that he decided to take Adira and elope with her, he was resolved to relinquish his status and power the Dalriada name gave him. For her, he was willing to give everything up, the luxury, comfort, inheritance and the next highest rank after the king, and live peacefully and happily like common people. He only wanted to live his life with her at his side. He only wanted her heart. But this time, he will acquire everything to have her. If taking the throne and being king would make her look at him and marry him, then he will usurp it. He will give her the throne and the title queen. It won't be Kasumi giving it to her. She won't be Kasumi's queen. Triton walked towards his father's office, his brilliant mind thinking, pondering, and planning his next move. To acquire the throne he must first pull Kasumi down. And to do that, he'll need his name. Father, so you still know that I'm your father. The Duke Dalriada glanced up, an intense glare ablaze in his crystal blue eyes, and he placed his pen down to give all of his attention to his son that besmirched their reputation and their family name. A name the prior heads of many generations before a branch of the royal family protected well. To think that his very own son would be the one to destroy it. Triton steeled himself as he faced his father's impending wrath. He knew his crime very well. He knew the consequences his actions entailed but he never once regretted anything. Even if he was given a chance to stand again at that moment when he was presented with that choice, he will still choose to elope with Adira. He will, many times over, choose the woman he loves. The young lord stood tall and Osiris could see the firm determination shine brightly in his son's eyes. And he could only sigh internally to himself. 
If only he used that determination for something else and not this madness. It seems you're very much aware of the crime that you committed. Have you entirely lost your mind Triton? You're a brilliant man. So why the hell did you abduct the crown princess? She's not the crown princess, father. She was supposed to be mine. I saw her first. I proposed engagement to her first. Triton cried as he insisted on his claim on the woman. Childish as he may sound, but he really cannot accept it in his heart that Adira, the only woman he ever wanted, was getting further and further away from his reach. But they didn't accept it. And now she's engaged to this country's prince. To our prince? No. It is Casimir's fault. I know he did something to force Adira into this engagement. Oh God, this child has really lost his mind. Hoping that he could still pull his son back from this madness that was consuming him, Osiris punched him hard in the face. He cannot let him fall deeper than this. He cannot leave him to walk down the wrong path. It was his duty as Triton's father to guide him back to himself before this insanity, back to his respectable and reasonable self. But it did nothing to this Triton, who was hell-bent on his decision to usurp the throne, standing before him. There was still that burning determination in his eyes that didn't die down. Whatever you are planning right now, Triton, I implore you, stop this. There is no ending here where you end up with Adira, my son. Then I'll make one, father. Triton declared to his father with that unyielding resoluteness before he pivoted on his heel to start his work. Because he swore to himself, Adira will eventually stand at his side. He was going to see that through. I'll show it to you, to Kasumi and to the whole world. I will show you who Adira will eventually choose in the end. Iris, who sat and stared blankly outside her window, thought of Adira's words over and over again about how she had married Kasumi and even flaunted off her ring. But then, does it really matter? So what if she married Kasumi? Did it mean that she was at the end of the line already? It didn't, right? I mean, if she played her cards right or planned her moves carefully then there's a high chance that she could seduce the first prince, Prince Kasumi. Well, how hard could it be anyway? Kasumi was still a man. And men are weak to pleasures earthly desires and pleasures. She could give it to him. She could do it better than Adira could ever do. Feeling herself liven and cheered up as she started planning how to seduce the man, a knock briefly interrupted her before she grumbled and answered, come in. Her chambermaid came in, as soon as she heard her answer, and bowed in respect before announcing, my lady, Lord Dalriada is here. He wishes to speak with you. Took you long enough, Triton. Take me there. She answered and collected herself. It was high time that they formed a stable partnership to pull those two apart. Cause things will just get worse if they wild their time. Iris entered the lounge where Triton waited and curtsied as gracefully as she could. What an honor to be visited by the Lord Dalriada himself. To what do I owe the pleasure of your presence here, my lord? Triton, who stood by the window thinking about what he was doing, turned as soon as he heard the sarcastic remark from the lady and smirked. The enemy of your enemy is your friend as they say. I am here to present to you the chance of being Casimir's princess. Notes. Hi Tilda Tilda now the villains have joined forces. Best of luck and wishes to our royal couple Tilda. Tilda, please do cheer for them and drop it here Tilda Banzo i.e. Tilda Tilda. Suffer for a while. After rising from bed and standing in his full height with that wonderful toned body of Casimir seen through against his white shirt, Adira blushed and duffed for the pillow to hide her red face. Did you like what you saw? My wife. Casimir's teasing whisper breathed close to her ears and she slowly peeked from the pillow edge to gaze at the man's happy platinum eyes. I've loved them for a long time. Else, I wouldn't have married you. She answered back. You're not the only one who knows how to seduce the other. Damn it, Adira. If Heiser was not here you wouldn't be getting out of bed. Casimir growled low in his chest as he felt challenged by the woman who was teasing him back. Nothing was stopping him now. They were officially married and she was all his. And her in that nightgown, with a cute little blush on her face, wasn't helping at all. Only thing he was concerned of was, he needed to hold an audience with his father and the council to formally change Adira's status as a fiancé to his wife. That and Heiser's piercing gaze was sticking pins and needles onto his back, steadily and fiercely watching him. Adira, knowing that Kasumi was now only being held back by a few things, 
pulled herself up briefly, placed a searing hot kiss on his lips and quickly leapt out of the bed before sticking her tongue out at Kasumi. You suffer for a while first, husband, she said and coyly swayed to the bath to get ready first while Kasumi was abandoned on the bed feeling that intense heat burning and making him suffer indeed. His wife really knows how to get even with him. After a few minutes of torture I mean peace Roman, who was hurrying after he heard about Kasumi waking up, knocked on his prince's door. He was the one doing post-war rehabilitations which was why he only heard about how Kasumi has just woken up after the war ended and how Adira who had left for the Silverous Thief came back two days after. He hasn't heard about anything else, like their marriage for example. Come in. Roman heard Kasumi's voice answer him from inside and he suddenly had this urge to tear up as he felt great relief wash over his body before pushing the door open to see his prince healthy again. However, what he saw inside wasn't only that. There was also the Lady Silverus in a simple and thin gown, who happened to walk out fresh from the bath, and all of their eyes widened in surprise. It didn't even last five seconds before the gap between the door and the wall was coated with ice that almost froze Roman as well if he hadn't unconsciously taken a step. Back after seeing the red in Casimir's eyes. Why did you come out? I didn't know Roman was here. There was a knock and I answered. Why did you come out? The man repeated his words before letting the woman go back inside his bedroom where the child, who was shocked with their loud voices, peeped from. After a few minutes, when Kasumi was sure he was calm and collected and not on edge about plucking Roman's eyes out or banging his head to cause a concussion and make him forget what he saw, he thawed the ice. Roman, who was initially feeling greatly relieved of his prince's recovery, prayed that he shouldn't have woken up yet and saw that embarrassing scene. I don't want to die yet. What is the Lady Silverus doing here anyway? Why is she in his room? And wearing only that? So? What brought you here? Kasumi asked and although he sounded calm, his aura tells the poor subordinate otherwise. I I I. Roman, who was suddenly inarticulate and very red, trembled. Kasumi could only sigh before he clicked his tongue in vexation. He knew it wasn't anybody's fault but it still irritated him. You are a great subordinate, Roman. I'll miss you. Kasumi said and caused greater shaking on Roman's part. Stop scaring him, Casey. Adira, who finally came out after hurriedly dressing properly although with her hair still untied and unkempt, scolded her husband before turning to the frightened secretary. He's joking Roman. Don't take it to heart. The prince is not the type to joke, I'm afraid. Lady Silverus. Apparently, now he is. Adira answered and turned to her husband who only turned the other way and silently clicked his tongue after his plan of messing around with Roman, as a payback for accidentally seeing his wife, was thwarted by the very person herself. Although it was a joke. Jokes were still half meant, you know? Anyway, why are you here? She asked the man again after making sure that he had considerably calmed down from the earlier fright her husband gave him. And the man in question could finally speak and think clearly again and responded to the girl's words, but not while stealing glances from both father and son giving him a sticky glare. Please spare me. I didn't mean to see her. He silently cried in his heart. The council has assembled and his majesty has commanded me to escort you two to the throne room. He bent his body from his hips after stepping aside to make way for the both of them. Adira and Kasumi both shared a look before they each held a determined expression on their beautiful visage. After fighting back the neighboring kingdom, it was time to fight the council. Adira only had enough time to fix and comb her hair down a bit before the newlywed both followed Roman to the throne room where the council was divided evenly and stood on each side of the carpeted floor. They all snapped their heads towards the door as soon as they heard it creak open and revealed this beautiful pair of husband and wife, with the woman clutching the man's arms and elegantly floated down the hall. Who, after paying respects and bowing to the king, turned to them and suddenly announced their marriage. I have officially tied the knot and married the Lady Adira Ramiria Ear Silverus, who shall be known from henceforth as Princess Adira Ramiria Silverus Vasilis. What? Everyone, visibly shocked and floored with the sudden news, all had a common response. But it didn't mean that they also had a common outlook on this union. Some were happy while some were already dying in their boots. They cannot allow this marriage. Our prince. 
A Marquis, who Casimir knew was a fairly close associate of the Latifolias, came forward and bowed all the way down to the floor on the lower end of the steps and cried, Please reconsider this marriage. Please divorce the Lady Silverius and marry the Maiden of Light instead. Please think for the greater good of this country. He cried which Adira couldn't hear all that clearly when Casimir immediately let go of her hands to block her ears. He didn't want her hearing such type of nonsense. However, the woman could vaguely tell that the Marquis was spouting something bad about her. Because, why else would the temperature drop a sign her husband was upset if not for this idiot testing his patience? And there's not many things that can easily upset Casimir. I dare you to say that again. Casimir spoke through clenched jaws as he took hold of his sword. Your Highness, Marquis Devich, if I may, I see no reason for you to oppose to our marriage. I was promised to Prince Casimir since the tender age of six and that is not something a Marquis like you can suddenly ask to change just because what? The Maiden of Light suddenly appears? Do you mean to tell everyone how you doubt your prince's might and prowess? Do you mean to question his and his majesty's decisions? Because careful, my lord, we could take that as less majest. Adira dared to intimidate this Marquis, who may be of lower rank but still a long-time member of the council. One wrong step and she could turn every one of them against her and that will be troublesome. I do not mean to threaten you, my lord, but I love his highness so much and I willingly married him. Is marrying him really that bad? Adira, putting on a disappointed face and teared up, started her act to get this man to change sides. If force doesn't work, why not use charms? Notes. Hi. Thank you for all the encouraging words. I'll try to do what I can do. I'll just continue to write and if you do not want to read anymore, just drop this without saying anything. I think it's better that way. You're not hurting anybody else's feelings. Thank you. Banzo I.E. Tilda. P.S. I edited a little bit errors I found. P.P.S. About this new unknown Marquis suddenly having a name, please just ignore that. He's not really someone major. I just hate not giving him a name so I randomly picked one. Please don't pick on that again. Thank you. Isn't that sad? La Lady Silverus. That's Princess Adira now, Lord Devich. Casimir instantly corrected the Marquis and the latter shakily nodded his head before turning back to Adira's crying face. Princess Adira, I didn't mean to offend His Highness, Prince Casimir, and His Majesty. I only want what's best for this kingdom. And having the Maiden of Light as the Queen can pressure the neighboring kingdoms into submission. But, my lord, haven't it crossed your mind that such a thing isn't a solution? The Maiden of Light is a human too. She can only live for long. And when she dies, what happens to that pressure that you spoke of? As for me, by marrying Prince Casimir, not only do I strengthen your prince by leaps and bounds by simply staying by his side, I can fight alongside him if he needs me. Casimir, himself, can assert dominion over these kingdoms. He can raise our strength himself. We don't need the Maiden of Light because I believe in my husband's capability and he can only do that if I am by his side. Adira insisted on her stand and her place by Casimir's side. It wasn't the first time she had to do this to simply stay by the side of the man she deeply loved since from the first cycle, the people didn't really want her as well. She only got by because she was the only duke's daughter a perfect rank to solidify Triton's sudden ascension to the throne and that she was his fiancé in the first place. That and she was immensely beautiful. A trophy they could flaunt to the neighboring kingdoms or a token if push comes to shove. And Adira knew that. She knew how shaky and unstable her position was so she had to do everything to build a stable enough foundation where she could stand. She had seduced Triton and did whatever it took to carry his child, but the latter didn't want it and instead stopped sleeping with her as soon as he knew that she wanted his child. She fought at the front to stave off the powermongers who came like ants as soon as they heard about the royal prince's death. She was always at the helm because she had Hysa, because she was the only one who had a dragon then. Although she didn't want to use Hysa as a weapon, she had no choice. It was kill or be killed. And she needed to stay alive so she could return to Triton's side. Also, Hysa was as loyal as he could be since he refuses to leave her side. But even after all that she had done, Iris kept hammering her way in, breaking and chipping away at the shaky foundation Adira stood in. Until it didn't last long and it crumbled down, broken at every joint and weak link and Adira also came undone. 
It was when her heart died that she also felt that this world must die. Remembering all the suffering she had survived, tears spilled like rain from her eyes much to the surprise of the council, especially the Marquis. How could he make a woman as gentle and fragile as her cry so painfully like that? I'm... I'm sorry, my lord, but... Please... Don't take his highness away from me. And our son. Son? They had a son? Their eyes widened like saucers before they turned to each other with great confusion and shock. Then the soft creaking of the door managed to attract their attention to find beautiful sapphire eyes looking at them with wonder. Such a cute child. Whose child is it? Is he lost? Wait. Is it? Mommy. The child beamed as soon as he saw his mother but was immediately replaced with worry when he saw the tears spilling down from her eyes. He ran towards her and shielded her from the council's large eyes. They were her and now his enemy. Hi sir, child, come to grandpa. The king beckoned over the child but he refused and shook his head before wrapping his arms around his mother. Hi sir not leaving mommy. And well, watching the child and the mother like that. They figured their discussion won't be going in any direction so they decided to leave it unfinished for a while. Before the assembly was adjourned and the council dispersed and retreated, Kasimi, who felt his heartache while watching his wife's tears, walked over to her and took her into his embrace as he softly coaxed and comforted her. They were gonna pay for every drop of her tears. Atilda those geezers really is a lot to handle. Eh? Who knew I had to cry too just to get them to shut up? Luckily I told Heisa to come here in five minutes or so. What's this? My baby is such a good boy Tilda Tilda oh Tilda that's why mommy loves you best Tilda Tilda. The woman, who was bawling her eyes out a minute ago, was now coaxing and kneading her son's cheeks while peppering light kisses on his face to which the latter was, enjoying so much and giggling happily. Yo, oh? Did I get my husband as well? Can you believe that, baby? Daddy fell for it as well. Adira cheered and high-fived their son before they danced a little victory dance. What the hell? While back at the Niveria's fief, Rame just finished a transaction with this good and honest baron and was on his way home when he figured he should bring something for his little sister since he had been gone for almost a week now. And after all, she'd die for the Niveria's specialty cakes. Thinking about how she'd cheer and jump for joy when he brings her the sweets. He couldn't help the enthralling smile from gracing his handsome countenance. And well, you can't blame him if he ensnares women's hearts from that. The lady baker, who stood behind the stall, looked, not quite, stared at him with dreamy eyes as Rame pondered on his choice. He also figured he should buy two should the little demon snatch his gift for his sister. While he was contemplating between a chocolate cake and a strawberry one, a woman, he remembered was the ex-baron Latifolia's daughter came forward and spoke to him. Good day, my lord, what brought you all the way here? Oh. I just met with Baron Niveria for a transaction. It's just tedious process, really, so I'm walking around for a while to bring gifts. Rame politely answered her. He didn't know of Iris' schemes and her answer with Adira which explains how kind and easygoing Rame was in talking with her. To him, she was still a Baron's poor daughter who got caught up in her father's mess. That is such a sad thing, don't you think? What is? You're doing all these tedious and menial tasks while your sister is living the high life as the prince's fiancé. Isn't that sad? Iris spoke. Now, turn around and help me destroy her. Not at all. All the work has been pushed onto your hands while she enjoys all the free time she could have. And everyone in the silverist dukedom would grieve for days if they can't even see her for a while whereas if you were gone for weeks or even months. They'd act as if nothing's going on. Isn't that a bit unfair, Lord Silverus? I'm only worried for you. Iris asked with a worried face and touched Rame's arm sympathetically as she tried to poison his mind, plant ideas in there so he'll grow to hate his little sister, favored and beloved by everyone. However, Rame only had this empty and confused look on his face. Because, those ideas never once crossed his mind. If anything, He'd even gladly shoulder all the work for his most beloved little sister. Did he say that he'd even die for her? Not at all. Rame replied, as calmly and as plainly as he could. If me shouldering all the work could make my sister happy, then I'll take it all. If me being the next duke would spare her from this cruel and tiresome job, then so be it. 
I'd even steal this position from her if she happened to be the one to succeed it and then I'll find out how taxing the work is. I am very happy to do all of these tedious tasks in her stead, Miss Latifolia, you need not worry about me. Ramir immediately dashed the idea aside like it was nothing but dusts in his hands and smiled politely. He returned his gaze to the cakes in front of him and decided to buy both before bidding the lady farewell and went on his way all done in less than two minutes. He had this gnawing feeling that Iris didn't like Adira and was ruining her in his eyes. He needed to hurry home and warn his beloved sister of her plan. Since Ramir could tell that he wasn't the only next in line or current head she has approached, she could very well have spread these seeds everywhere and destroying Adira. And he must do something to counter this. Cause how dare she ruin his beautiful, cute and lovely sister. How dare she mess with his precious treasure. Although, he wouldn't mind providing for her instead should she be stripped of her title as the prince's fiancé. But he'd hate that. Cause then, he'll see nothing every day but her tears. So he must make sure that nothing this woman says will affect the heir's heads. Because, he would literally do anything just to keep his precious sister happy and safe. As for the current heads, guess he could leave that up in Casimir's hands. Well, how'd it go? I would have gone myself as I've always done these past few days but that Ramir always hated me since forever. Triton yammered while sipping from his black and strong coffee, the same kind Adira always hated yet had to endure because she wanted to be closer to him. His eyes followed the woman that was, as clear as the bright day outside, incredibly upset and agitated. Seems she failed, huh? Iris plopped on the couch and rested her chin on her propped up elbows while wearing this frown that told Triton everything he had to know. I did tell you Ramir is as hard as a stone to crack as Kasumi is. What is so good about that woman anyway? Even her stepbrothers all gung-ho about her. Iris grumbled and started punching at the throw pillow on her side, venting out her extreme irritation at this woman who always, always took what she wanted, even though it should have been hers. Well, it's understandable. Because she's perfect, is all. Triton murmured under his breath to keep the raging woman from hearing as he smiled softly to himself. And of course, the perfect woman should belong to the best man, right? Who else was perfect aside from he, himself? Just a little bit more, Adira. And I will offer the throne to you. Are you still not talking to me? Adira asked as she leaned her head on top of Kasumi's desk while the latter flipped from pages to pages, wearing this sulky frown, and refused to acknowledge her. Come on, I said I was sorry. I didn't know you'd also believe that. Well, sorry, I believe everything that you do and what comes out of your pretty little lips. The man shot back with a disgruntled soft and sulking glare before turning back to the papers he was trying to read but to no avail. Oh Tilda so my lips are pretty Tilda. The woman stood up and rounded his table before taking off the papers he's been flipping over and over again for the past hour off his hands and placed it on top of the desk while smiling mischievously and teasingly. No. They're not. Kasumi stubbornly tried to retract his earlier words and turned away. He didn't hear anything from the woman anymore and figured that she must be done talking with him and felt a little sad. That was until he felt her whole weight dropped on top of his lap and her arms snaked around his neck before a pair of lips hotly placed themselves there leaving a mark. That stamped their territory. Damn. It. Adira. Oh Tilda Tilda. Why Tilda Tilda? Weren't my lips not pretty Tilda Tilda? You can just ignore them then, husband. Adira continued to tease and she peppered brief and quick kisses all the way up to his sharply angled jaws, to his ears and all the way back to his cheeks before Kasumi, losing his self-restraint, grabbed the woman's face and claimed those cherry red and delicious lips. He pushed his tongue in the moment the woman breathed for air as he continued to dominate her, devour her. Kasumi briefly left her lips to admire her very seductive and beautiful blushing face gasping for air. That beautiful ashen eyes looking up to him with overflowing love. What? You don't get this chance very often, husband. If you stop now, Heisa will be back before you know it. The woman continued to provoke him before he started to undo her dress buttons and revealed her snow white shoulders that hasn't seen the sun. He gently grazed his teeth and bit lightly at her skin making the woman moan softly and arousing him even more, before he lapped at a spot on the crook of her neck and left his own mark as well. That was payback for the mark she left. As he was about to go further down, 
a knock shocked the both of them before the woman hurriedly fixed herself and slid down on the little space beside Casimir's large desk enough that it hit her. Your high, Ness. Um, damn, what did I do wrong? Roman immediately thought as what he met after just opening the door was that amazing angry glare on Casimir's eyes as if the man was dying to kill him any time now. You. Again. Roman? Casimir tried to speak calmly albeit miserably failing as he clenched his jaws to keep himself from roaring and killing this poor clueless subordinate in his spot. Um. Did I do something? Wrong. Roman haltingly asked as he quivered and cowered at Casimir's intense glare. It was then that he noticed the red dress, that was a stark contrast to his silver floor and dark grey carpets, peeking from the corner of his desk. It made him pause a while before he had this eureka moment and blushed furiously at his blunder. Oh my goddesses! I'm terribly sorry your highness. I left something. I'll be back later in the middle of the night. Or tomorrow. Please excuse me. And with that he ran far. Far away from the great demon lord's sights as he screamed his apologies in his heart. Oh God! I'm really, truly, deeply sorry, your highness. Notes. Hi Tilda updating twice calls why not? No classes so I got the chance to write. Anyway, thank you for the support as always Tilda love you guys a loot. Banzo i.e. Tilda Tilda Tilda. Asterisk the art above is Roman by the way. Tenting problem. After Roman almost walked into Adira and Cassini making out, the woman awkwardly excused herself under the pretense of planning to make him an high city and snacks. The man, although reluctant to let her leave, couldn't get a word in as he watched the furious blush on Adira's face as the woman hurriedly escaped from sheer embarrassment. And he was left in his office, with a huge tenting problem and an outstretched hand, watching the door close behind his wife's back. My wife. That blush and embarrassment is very very cute that I could die but don't leave me to deal with this alone. The man could only cry silently in his heart as he cursed Roman repeatedly and dealt with his problem himself. I'm adding more work for you, Roman, you bastard. While Adira, who leaned her back against the door, suddenly melted down to the floor with a very red blush on her face that she could only partially hide with her hands. Oh God, how embarrassing. How could you do that, Adira? Throwing yourself onto Casey like that. Have some shame woman. She scolded herself after checking if there was anyone around, who might unwittingly see her embarrassing side again, and then smiled softly. Thank you God for giving me such a damn wonderful and delicious husband. Princess. She, once again, felt her heart leap up to her throat and jumped up in fright. No. It was a joke. Adira exclaimed before she slowly turned to the man who was also shocked with her sudden outburst and unconsciously took a step back, and breathed a sigh of relief. Oh. It's Alex. What were you doing squatting in front of the prince's office? Did something happen? And with Alexander's question, Adira's mind automatically replayed that intense almost went too far make-out session she and Casimir did, which she shamefully instigated herself. Nothing. Nothing happened. Come on. Come with me to make sweets. The woman dragged her knight by the wrists while the latter willingly let himself follow after her, his cheeks burning as he remembered how beautiful and cute she looked, with the blush she wore earlier. I hid it perfectly, right? The man mentally asked himself wondering if he was able to somehow mask his blushing earlier. Evening rolled around with Adira barely staying by Casimir's presence and instead stuck by Heiss's side. She cannot allow herself to be alone with him for a while since what happened earlier was much too embarrassing for her. She was too forward. And it had been too long since she had seduced anyone. My wife, are you avoiding me? Kasumi asked as soon as he managed to trap the woman in the chair she lounged in while sipping her tea and watching Heisa learning how to write now. Um. Husband, in case you cannot see, Heisa's here. Don't try anything funny. I'm not doing anything. I'm just interrogating you. Heisa will understar yeah, maybe not. Kasumi quickly doubled back as soon as the ridiculous notion of Heisa ever siding with him against Adira crossed his mind. How impossible, right? So can you please remove your hands? Adira sweat dropped and pointed at his hands that kept a tight grip on her chair's armrests, caging her in. Oh? Why? Does my presence bother you, my wife? 
Kasumi thought it was time to pay her back for her earlier teasing and razzed the woman. Casey, I swear to God, don't you dare do that. Do what? My wife? Damn lord. I know I said I'm thankful for having such a hot husband but he's too irresistible. And Heisa is here. God give me patience. Don't give me strength or I might just push him down instead. Another knock, which earned an irritated click of the tongue from the man, seized their attention before Heisa suddenly bolted up and ran to the door. Oh? Then the person outside is, Auntie Lifa. Heisa beamed and immediately grabbed for the sweets the maid took with her and ran back towards his mother, who was finally released by Kasumi. It wasn't only Lifa though. Rame came with her too. Brother. Adira beamed and happily hopped into her brother's open arms already missing how he pampers her every chance he gets. Hello, my little bunny. How are you? I'm fine. Casey's been taking good care of us. Adira replied with a very happy and brilliant smile as she enjoyed Rami petting her head lovingly. It was clear on those radiant ash-like eyes how happy she was and how blissful her everyday had been. And that was all Rami could ever ask and hope for. He only wanted her to always wear that kind of smile. He better be. Else, I'm taking you back home with me. Sorry, brother, but Adira's my wife now. Her home is here with us from then on. Kasumi asserted and, once again, clashed with Ramir. The latter never really liked the idea of his sister doing a shotgun marriage with this man but if it makes her happy then he'll try his best to accept this man with much difficulty. Oh how he felt incredibly faint the day his sister came back with this bastard and suddenly announced how she had married him. Even now, thinking about it was giving him both nightmares and trauma. And oh, don't get started on how the Duke Silverus reacted when he heard the news. Sigh. That man had his worse. So much worse. He's still my beloved sister, your highness. Brother, did you come here to fight with Casey again? Are you not here to see me? Adira wore a very sulky face before Kasumi could even bite back and distracted Ramir. Of course not, my little bunny. I am here for you Tilda Tilda don't sulk like that, okay. Look, I even got you that famous chocolate mousse and strawberry shortcake from your favorite pastry shop at Baron Niveria's Fief. So, forgive brother, okay. I'm not here to fight with that man Tilda brother's here for his very cute little bunny Tilda Tilda. Ramir coaxed the woman, like how he usually does way back when they started getting closer, and patted her head again to pacify her. Although he loved that cute pouty cheeks, he'd rather not upset her anymore. The consequences when she got upset was entirely devastating. Really Tilda? You did? Yay! Thank you, brother. Adira cheered, very much like how Ramir imagined her to be. She pulled the man down to peck him quickly on his cheeks as her thanks before happily skipping towards Lifa, who was preparing the cakes for her and Heiser to enjoy, and left both men on their spots. Big brother, please avoid having inappropriate thoughts about my wife. So what? She's still my cute little sister who loves her brother the best Tilda you only come seco, um. No. You come third, old boy. Rame hackled the great demon lord drunk from his barrel of vinegar again. Third, does he mean he goes next after Heisa? Notes, a light-hearted chapter for everyone Tilda and free dog food Tilda Tilda O oh, Tilda Casimis sharing his barrels of vinegar to everyone so take one if you want Tilda. LOL. Anyway, thank you for all the wonderful readers who left me comments to read Tilda I love you. Banzo I.E. Tilda, a monster. Rama's visit didn't last long since he had works piling up back at home. He just wanted to see his lovely sister and inform her of a possible attack and went home. Later that night, Adira couldn't get Rami's words out of her head and dreamt of that moment, the time when she surrendered herself to madness and sought revenge against everyone that turned their back on her. She dreamt of that hell she rose, the people she mercilessly killed, the screams that begged for help, surrender, that begged her to stop and yet she turned a deaf ear to all of those. She dreamt of the bright blade that pierced through her heart and killed her. She dreamt of that light pink hair that fluttered against the dark velvety sky as she fell down to her death. Adira woke up with a start, feeling beads of sweat trickle down from her forehead as well as felt chills running up her spine. It was a nightmare. Casey. Hi sir. She immediately looked towards her side to check if both father and son were beside her and she was not inside that gruesome nightmare anymore. Breathing a sigh of relief. 
She gingerly reached out her hand to caress Heisa's face snuggled beside her and Kasumi who had an arm draped across her. Good, it's only a dream. She thought to herself and remembered Ramu's words earlier. Maybe it was because of those that she was reminded of how she died, of how she's supposed to die. So what's the deal with you and Latifolia's daughter? Rame suddenly asked that made Adira embarrassingly choke on her tea. The former was alarmed, like he always was when it came to his favorite little sister, and patted the girl's back softly. Careful now. My God, how am I supposed to leave you alone when you're still as clumsy as this? Rame commented which made Kasumi clear his throat, not because his throat was itchy but because someone was forgetting his presence. Yeah, yeah, I know you're there. I just choose not to see you, brother. Why do you ask? Because the girl approached me, said something vague about you, which didn't sound nice at all, before I excused myself. And I'm sure I'm not the only one she's approached. I swear that woman's plotting something against you, Adira. You best be on your guard and be prepared for whatever she throws at you. I'll do what I can on my side as well. Her brother reassured her while petting her head as gently as she remembered him to do whenever he tries to comfort her. And this gesture warmed Adira's heart. No matter which life, she knew her brother loved her more than life itself. She knew she always had her family at her back. And though she was not able to protect them from her mistakes back then, she will make sure she does this time around. Thank you, big brother. Adira walked back inside from the balcony when a shine, reflected from something, caught her eye and she saw a woman in maid clothing raising up her hand, a knife in her hand, as she stood beside Kasumi's side of the bed. In one smooth and quick movement, Adira already had a sharp bread knife against the woman's neck before the latter could even make a move. One wrong move and you die. I really don't want to make a mess in our bedroom so you'll have to come with me. Adira eerily whispered into her ears that the maid could only follow her demands. So they moved next door and there, Adira extracted as much information as she could get from this assassin. Who are you and why were you attempting to assassinate your prince? Who sent you? Adira, who elegantly sat with crossed legs on a burgundy high-backed chair, asked the maid, who was on the floor while feeling her knees trembling too much. The latter, trying to find her voice, opened and closed her mouth a few times and shivered even more while under this princess's intense gaze, a gaze akin to a large, monster eyeing her prey. So? I don't have enough patience to wait forever you know. Tell me who ordered you to assassinate my husband. Talk or you die. PP princess. I I swear. I do not plan to assassinate his highness. That's the truth. The maid cried in panic at being threatened by this dangerous woman whose eyes glimmered dangerously. She oddly fit too well with the gloomy and dark aura of the night. The darkness wasn't really helping as it even made her incredibly more threatening, with her ash-like eyes gleaming like that against the dark night. Of course, it would scare the living daylights out of anyone. And you expect me to believe that? Do I look like an idiot to you? Just because I act sweet outside, doesn't mean I can't kill. Trust me, my dear, I've had my fair share of death and I'm not afraid to shed more blood if I need to. The maid was too scared for her life as she sweated like crazy while being held at knife point and begged for the woman to spare her life in exchange for information. It wasn't the prince. It was you princess. I was paid to assassinate you. Adira was taken aback. It was the first time she had an assassination directed at her. For the longest time, it was always Kasumi, who was always targeted, and she even swore to herself that she would protect him from it all. But was it really Kasumi's life? Is it Iris Latifolia? Adira suddenly asked, already sure who the culprit was, but the maid shook her head in response. There's no use lying to me, you know. I've known for a long time about how much that woman hates me. It really isn't her. Princess. It's the ex-Baron Latifolia. He thinks you are the reason why his daughter can't rise to the throne despite being the Maiden of Light. He wants to kill you so the Lady Latifolia could be queen. At the servant's words, Adira froze for a little bit. She wasn't expecting the Baron to target her. She didn't have to deal with him from her past life because his wrongdoings and underground dealings were not uprooted. Because Iris thrived and succeeded at seducing Triton, the next in line after the prince's assassination. And because Kasumi didn't have a reason to investigate him. So he continued to live the high life. However, when Iris decided to use an aphrodisiac to make trouble for Adira,
Kasumi had to use whatever means to exact his personal revenge against the girl who hurt his woman. The Baron was just collateral damage as the prince accidentally uncovered his trafficking business and that basement littered with dark spells and forbidden rituals. I see. So they've started to move, huh? How much is he paying you? His whole fortune, princess. Which clearly isn't much by now. Adira mused quietly and struck a thinking pose before smirking evilly and languidly leaned on the armrest making her look sadistically beautiful. It was enough to blow the girl away. I'll pay you double the amount he's offering you. In exchange, I want you to act as my eyes and ears in their midst. Of course, the choice was a no-brainer as the girl on the floor bobbed her head in acquiescence. It wasn't just because of the large sum of money being offered to her, but also because this woman, who exuded might and strength, spared her little life despite being paid to take hers. And also because she was starting to like this princess, who was light years away from the image she displayed at daylight. She was, in truth, not all that sweet. Go back and make sure they do not suspect anything. Yes, princess. And with that, the woman went out to return to the baron and report her failure. Adira was also about to return, after she stayed for a few more minutes thinking and planning for her next move, when she heard a cold voice speak from behind her. Am I supposed to be wary of women as well from now on? Notes. Hey, I'm back. I rested and slept after our exams and was feeling refreshed so I decided to write the new chapter. I really love how Adira keeps this hidden evilness, because I don't want her to be just another damsel in distress main character who can only wait to be saved. So anyway Tilda thank you so much to everyone who expressed their support for me and even asked me to rest. I love you guys a lot. This chapter is dedicated for all of you. Banzo i.e. Tilda. How to kill? My god. Don't scare me like that, Casey, Adira exclaimed while hiding the blade she had been playing a while earlier and stood to walk closer to the man, who looked upset. Well, of course, he would be. He suddenly wakes up to find himself draped to the neck in blanket without his wife in between him and Heisa. And then, when he finally found her, she was secretly alone, in the room next door, with a woman he did not recognize. I mean, what the hell is this? Is she starting to recruit women into her harem as well? The man thought while trying real hard not to succumb to her sweet talking her way out of this suspicious meeting in the middle of the night. Really, why do you always get jealous of everyone around me? Even though I love you so much I even married you myself because you were taking too long. Adira muttered, and acted disappointed, while she wrapped her arms around the man's neck. Kasumi's originally cold and frozen expression slowly melted into a loyal puppy while watching her act like that. Although he knew that she was only acting as such, he still let her have her way. Oh how he spoils her. Bringing his lips down to her head, he picked her up in his arms and carried her back to bed after whispering a sweet apology and surrendered to her. Casey? Adira suddenly spoke as soon as Kasumi laid down beside her. Millimeter? Do you have books about the legend of this maiden of light? Kasumi fell silent at her question as he was reminded of Heise's words about her secret. He didn't know if she was aware of her status as being possibly the real Maiden of Light or what but it scared him. It scared him to think that if Adira knew that she had this incredible strength laying dormant inside of her then she would leave him. If she knew that she was a hell lot stronger and more powerful than him, then she will leave and find someone else stronger who can protect her. Why? Um, I'm just curious about her legend. I've always heard how crazy strong she was. Adira answered before yawning and snuggling back into his warm embrace to which the man gratefully welcomed her and watched her eyes flutter to a close. Why do I always feel as if you're flying out of my reach? Kasumi whispered before planting a kiss on the sleeping girl's head and hugged her tightly. He was about to drift back to sleep as well when the girl's soft yet groggy voice answered him. I won't leave you. I can't because I love you too much. After being confessed to by his wife, although done groggily, Kasumi couldn't help the light blush that covers his cheeks when he remembers her words. It wasn't often that Adira was as blunt as that. She was always playful and liked to kid around. She often avoids having to show too much affection and receiving one like receiving something akin to that burns her as if it scares her. And looking at that woman, who was the same as always and lounging in his office while teaching their son how to write, he felt at ease for once. He loved days like these the most where they would all be together and spend the hours as peacefully and as happily as possible. 
Adira noticed a gaze on her and turned to the only other person inside that gloomy room to find such heated and full of order pair of platinum eyes looking over them, with so much love. And though she was very much happy to see that, she can't help the reflex to shy away from it. Um, husband, can you lend me a book about the Maiden of Light? The girl asked again trying to divert the man's attention away. And this time, it wasn't only the father's attention she attracted but also the little boy's. The latter turned to his father, waiting to see how the man would react to her request, when Kasumi just sighed in surrender and took a book from his drawer. In truth, he had already gone and searched for the book after he heard her mention it last night. He just hoped she had forgotten about it. Beaming at seeing the book, Adira hopped towards his desk, leaned across it to give the man a quick peck on his lips, before taking the book gratefully and walking back to Heiser's side. So jealous. The child complained in his head before he, himself, tottered close to his mother and showed her his work to fish for compliments and maybe try his luck to also fish for, kisses. Mommy, did Heiser do a good job? Of course. My baby is brilliant. A genius even. Very much like daddy. Adira very naturally complimented the child which wasn't really what he was gunning for. So he pouted and averted his eyes before murmuring, I'd rather be like mommy though. And who could resist such an adorable child wanting to be pampered and complimented by his mother more, right? Adira's heart squeezed tightly at watching Heise's cute sulking face and felt almost fainting from such an attack before she pacified him and showered him kisses. Then baby is like mommy. The girl instantly corrected herself much to the child's absolute happiness. Yep. It really is best if mommy loves Heise more. And of course, the great demon lord also couldn't back down from such challenge right? So the next hour was spent with the father and child trying to pamper and serve the mother so much just to get rewards like her kisses. As you can guess, Adira didn't get to do much reading from trying to accommodate two clingy beasts. So much that she had to retreat and find somewhere quiet to read all about this maiden of light and how to kill her. Well, Iris and her family were the one who started to target her life. She wouldn't be a proud Silverus and now of Asylus if she took such attack lying down and not doing anything in return, right? Flipping to the first page, there wasn't anything too important about this legendary woman but just that she was the beloved child of heavens, which probably meant that she was a hell a lot luckier than an average person, more beautiful, and all sorts. It only implied how she was a cut above the rest. What sort of crap is this? More beautiful. Bah. Not to brag but I'm, at least, a bit more beautiful than that Iris. Adira bashed Iris in her head while staying hidden in one of the greenhouses in Kasumi's palace. Now, how he had won, she doesn't know. It's been there since after she started visiting more often after she learned of his identity. What she liked about this particular greenhouse were the flowers that bloomed inside. You would never have guessed that the first prince liked this particular type of lilies as well her favorite white Madonna lilies. Adira continued to flip through the pages till she came across this part where it said, The Maiden of Light, although sent to bind nations together, when in the wrong hands can also sink a nation to the depths of hell. When that happens, the only way to end this carnage is to kill her heart. What? Kill her heart? Like literally stab her? Adira murmured before turning to the next page which was clearly ripped out. What the hell? Such an important book. How could you care for a book like this? The audacity. She angrily nagged before closing it with a loud thud and held her temples to gently massage it. Now what? How do I end that backstabbing leech? Do I stab her? Is that it? Ah. Uh. While Kasumi, who was sitting in his desk, was snapped out by Roman knocking and slowly opening the door before peeking his head incautiously. Ever since being punished by more work for a week, He's been especially edgy about visiting Kasumi's office and reporting in. At most, right now, he tries to spend a good few minutes just waiting outside and debating with himself when it was fine to go in. Your Highness, is now a good time? He asked. Yes, come in. Kasumi answered and stowed away the paper he was reading before giving his subordinate his undivided attention. What were you reading? Nothing. Important. You kill her heart by killing her love. That's when she's at her weakest. That's when she's most vulnerable. A part of the paper read. Notes. Hi. I love Madonna Lily so much. 
So here's a little trivia. Madonna lilies represent purity, royalty or rebirth. And I thought, oh, it suited Adira. So there you go. Anywa. Expecting your lovely responses soon. Love you. Banzai. Alexander's woes. Have you ever wondered what it was like to be Adira's knight? Well, Alexander has it tough. Here's some of the reasons why he thinks his mistress is trouble. 1. My mistress likes to vanish. It started back when Alexander was just starting to adjust as the Lady Silverus Knight after being transferred so suddenly by the first prince himself. At first, it boggled his mind why Kasami did what he did. Because he knew how overly possessive this prince was to even allow other men within a particular set of distance close to his fiance. So him, assigning Alexander, a man, as her knight along with Leon was confusing him. The first Alexander met this Lady Silverus was when she dropped by the student council office and exchanged a few words with the prince and upsetting him during the course. From then, he didn't have a good opinion of her. Because, she came off as aloof and cold, he thought that they would not get along well with the prince. The next he saw her was when she was drugged with an aphrodisiac that upset the prince so much he created chaos on his own name day all because of her. And might he add that he was also one of the men whose jaws dropped when she appeared and floated down like a celestial deity. Alexander was standing guard outside her room when Lypha, the lady's maid, came and brought with her tea and snacks. Oh, it's her afternoon tea time, huh? Very noble lady-like. Alexander turned around wordlessly and knocked on Adira's room before asking for permission to enter. My lady, your tea has arrived, I'm allowing your maid in now. They didn't hear an answer from inside the room and Alexander, clueless and thinking that she might have not heard him well, pushed the door open to find the room empty and the windows wide open. What, my lady? Lady Silveris. Alexander rushed to the open windows but couldn't find the woman. The Lady Silveris is missing. He cried and was about to speed away when he saw, from the corner of his eye, how calm Lypha was and quietly placed Adira's tea on a table. How can you be so calm when your mistress is missing? Lypha, figuring that Alex was obviously talking to her, smiled with meaning before answering, Oh. She does this a lot. She'll be back before you know it. And true to Lypha's words, Adira came back, a few hours later, with a happy grin and a full stomach. But she didn't pass through the windows this time but through the doors. Did you have fun, my lady? Lypha asked with a fond smile on her face. Yep. Hi is getting better at baking and Owen's gotten taller again. Oh. Peter's still a big softy. Adira giggled and turned to Alex before handing out a white box. Here, I brought over one for you as an apology. Adira beamed before retreating back to her room to enjoy the tea Lifer reheated for her after Alex unwittingly took the box from her and opened it to see a strawberry. Shortcake. I don't like cakes though. The man thought while happily enjoying the sweet treat his mistress gave him. 2. My mistress is a sweet busybody. Right after Adira returned and they won the war with the Olynthi soldiers, Adira went out to have fun and, of course, she wasn't allowed to do so without an escort. Alexander, who was dragged left and right by his mistress, was carrying piles and piles of boxes with additional bags on his arms as they entered the NTH store. Even her hands are full of bags. Why is she suddenly going on a spree? The man asked himself as he opted to wait outside then risk the boxes from being toppled over by the limited opening of the entranceway. What was more perplexing by this sudden shopping spree was, she never once, even a tiny bit, bought anything for herself. It was either kids' clothing, toys, or men's clothing. And it was as clear as the blazing sun beaming down on him who it were all for. Alex, are you tired already? He heard her sweet voice ask him right after the soft tinkling of the bells attached to the store's doors reached his ears. Certainly not, my lady. Really? I'm sorry for dragging you around like this. We could go home now if you're tired already. Adira worriedly told the red-headed knight. It was very unreasonable on her part to drag this knight around like a lowly servant when he was supposed to be the third strongest knight. This is nothing, my lady. I have a lot of stamina. So where to next? Actually, I'd rather you drag me around than you slipping through my guard and then vanishing. That always gave me heart attacks. Millimeter, there's this store I'd like to visit. Then let us depart immediately. 
Alexander enthusiastically cried and started marching forward before he felt a gentle tug on his sleeves and attempt to stop him without pulling him too hard. But before that, come eat with me, Alex. She beamed and carefully dragged the man to a nearby restaurant where they could partake on a quick meal before setting out to buy loads of things for her husband and son again. The next store they went to was a store that sold Lucky Charms. Thinking it was too girlish for his tastes, he remained outside to wait for her again. When he heard the same familiar ringing of bells again, that told him she was done, he wordlessly stood up from the bench when he was stopped by a hand on his shoulders and was forced to sit back down. Right after collecting himself from the brief surprise, he saw a silver chain with a red little dangling pendant being worn on him. This is for my favorite night, Alexander as my gratitude for always staying by my side and my prayer that you always take care of yourself. Adira smiled cheerfully and watched the shocked expression on the man's face before gingerly touching the necklace Adira personally put on him. It strangely felt better than any honors that he ever received before a wonderful smile with a light blush melted his cold exterior. Thank you, my lady. 3. My mistress likes to unconsciously disturb my heart. It was a peaceful afternoon. Adira and Heisa were out playing in the garden while Kasimi had to stay at his office to finish his paperwork so he had Alex escort them both. Adira and Heisa were making flower wreaths and laughing merrily while Alexander stood a bit of distance away and watched them with a warm heart. The princess is really a great mother to Prince Heisa. It's so great to look at them playing happily like that. The girl, who noticed Alexander staying a bit too far from them, called him over. And the latter, who was already conditioned to respond to her beck and call, obediently walked close and did her every bidding. Crouch down, Alex, and close your eyes. She suggested and he submissively did what she said. He then felt something citrusy waft through his nose and something soft fell on his head. And then her lively giggle filtered through his ears before he peeled his eyes open. The first thing that he saw was her radiant and lovely ash-like eyes that always glowed with the sunshine as she looked right at him with eyes filled with mirth. Seeing his own reflection in her eyes was stirring something he countlessly and tirelessly tried to bury and forget. It seems his mistress had placed the reed that she made on his head. I dub thee, Sir Alexander Vorai, as the Rose Knight of the Silverous Silver Crescent Moon Knight Order. His mistress played around however he could only smile softly in response. He had missed her smiling and kidding around with him when Prince Kasimi allowed Lord Dalriada to take her away a month ago so much. So much so that he decided to play along and placed a fist over his heart to pledge his loyalty to her once again and accepted the title she bestowed upon him, shamelessly. I, Alexander Vorai, thank my princess for bestowing me the title of the Rose Knight of the Silver Crescent Moon Knight Order. Well, aren't you more handsome when you smile like that? I'm sure finding your dream woman will be easy when you're like that Alex. Adira commented when she saw Alexander give her a very soft and warm smile, like a fresh gentle breeze of spring blowing over his hard countenance. I've already found her though. Alexander answered her vaguely. Oh really? Well, why didn't you tell me? Maybe I can help you woo her. It's a little inappropriate princess. She's someone I'm not supposed to love. Oh. Forbidden love. Adira excitedly thought about this secret she accidentally discovered while playing around with Heisa and Alex. She didn't know Alex was capable of harboring such passionate emotion under that hard and strict face of his. He strangely reminded her of Cassini's past cold and uncaring personality, which was getting better these past few weeks. It'll be fine, Alex. Maybe you might get lucky someday and she'll turn your way. When she does, don't think about anything else and sweep her off her feet immediately. Adira advised him enthusiastically before Heiser tried to tackle her in a bear hug and gave her the flower reed that he made. I'm afraid that is impossible, princess, because your eyes can only ever see his highness. Alexander thought and a sad smile graced his handsome face that slipped through Adira's attention. He only hoped he could continue to watch over her and love her silently like this for always. Notes. It's a little tribute to my favorite knight who wasn't getting any screen time lately. Who else here likes Alexander? Drop a comment. Love YA guys tilde banzai tilde. The greenhouse angel. Stefan ran around aimlessly and happened to pass by one of Casimir's greenhouses. In hopes of shaking off his pursuers, um, 
his retainers, he went inside the open greenhouse and shut it carefully behind him before crouching low to hide himself in the bushes. He lied in wait for his retainers to breeze past through the greenhouse before he let go of a breath he didn't notice he had been holding in. After he was sure they were out of sight now, he figured he might as well while his time inside his brother's greenhouse that housed nothing but white lilies. He walked around, trying to find the perfect spot where there was a cool shade. To find a spot where he could rest when he chanced upon this sleeping and enchanting angel breathing so peacefully she almost seemed like she was perfectly right where she should be. Surrounded with those white lilies, her plum-hued dress stood out so much it was impossible to tear one's gaze away from her profile, that sweet and innocent face that doesn't fail to stir reckless and fervent emotions deep inside a man. Stefan carefully walked closer to her, as if akin to a magnet being attracted by its polar opposite, like gravity pulling him closer to something he knew was dangerous, and like Icarus that couldn't help himself but fly closer to the sun. How beautiful! He noted when he was close to the woman now, close enough that he could smell her intoxicatingly sweet strawberry scent mixing with the light aroma of the lilies around them. Reaching out a hand, he carefully swiped away a lock of hair that strayed to her face. He couldn't help but want to see more of her beauty even when he knew he mustn't covet her. Even when he was painfully aware how she had become his sister-in-law. He still cannot help the pitter-patter of drums in his heart and the wildfire that quickly burns him from inside whenever he so much as glances her way. Adira. He tried speaking her name and felt that wonderful squeeze in his heart. Millimeter. The woman groaned and adjusted herself as she turned her head towards the man, who sat on the floor beside the couch she slept on. Why do you disturb me so? He muttered and laid a gentle kiss on the string of ashen locks he's been twirling in his fingers. He briefly lifted himself off the ground and dipped his head to leave a kiss on her head when the woman suddenly woke up with a start and immediately sat up, thus, colliding with the man's nose. Stefan fell back on his ass and wailed in pain, rolling around and clutching his nose, before hearing her sweet yet horrified voice call his name. Stefan? The man sat up, with small tears in his eyes, as he tried to glare at the woman before it instantly melted away upon laying eyes on her tear-stricken countenance. Why are you crying? What? Adira asked and raised her hands to touch the wet tracks of her tears before stubbornly trying to deny it. I, I was yawning. That's why. What's wrong? What happened? Did you get in a fight with my brother? Is that why you were sleeping here? Stefan, unconvinced with her lie, ignored her words and asked his questions. No. Casey and I did not fight. I also did not notice I fell asleep here. Adira answered two of his questions and fell silent. The latter, who was waiting for her answers to the other two, grew impatient and chose to ask again albeit softly and gently, like treading on a path laden with landmines. What's wrong? What happened? And without warning, the woman's tears rolled down from her eyes as this stupid prince's words reminded her of her nightmare and memory of that night but also in addition that she caused her husband's and her son's death. I, I dreamed. I, I dreamed I killed. Casey and Heisa. I was so scared and lost. I couldn't control myself. I killed them with my own hands. The woman bawled and cried heavily while watching her trembling hands as she reiterated what she saw in her nightmare, blood-stained hands and Casimir and Heisa's corpses. She looked so vulnerable and shaken that Stefan was not able to think before his body moved and took the woman into his embrace while gently coaxing her, whispering to her softly that it was all just a dream and her family was safe and sound. It felt so real, Stefan. It. It felt too vivid. She continued to bawl in his chest. It made his heart ache to hear and watch her cry like that. So, in an attempt to stop her from crying, he made a little earth golem pluck out a white lily and offered it to her before adding, Why don't I accompany you to see my brother and Heisa? So you can see with your own eyes that they are absolutely well and fine. He smiled to lighten Adira's heavy heart even a little bit. The latter nodded to his suggestion while cutely taking the flower from the golem and smiled sweetly. Thank you, Stefan. Stefan, caught off guard with this sweet, docile and girly side of hers blushed and flustered as he denied his actions vehemently. I, I I didn't do this for you. I I just cannot leave a a crying girl alone. That's it. I know. Geese. You don't have to be that hard on it. Adira, 
back to herself again after seeing Stefan deny her gratitude that much, stood up and took the flower with her before pausing by the door and turned back to the second prince that remained on the couch. What? Are you coming or not? I thought you were gonna accompany me to see them. She haughtily demanded from this prince who couldn't help but sigh to himself while riddled with the mystery of what was in her that attracted him so much. Yeah, yeah, your highness, I'm coming. That should be big sister for you, you know. I am, after all, your brother's wife. No way, in seven hells, am I addressing you as such. Notes. So, I really like Stefan and Adira's interaction with the former being as dishonest and prickly as he could when his speaking with Adira. Very different from his sunny and lively talks with other noble ladies. And also because he hasn't been appearing lately. Anyway, I loved your responses, Banzai. In the middle of the night, Adira and Stefan shortly arrived at Kasimi's office. The former, still feeling her hands tremble involuntarily as she was reminded with her nightmare, unconsciously grabbed for Stefan's sleeves. He turned to her when he felt her tugging him and smiled softly at her uncharacteristic cowering form. He reassured her that everything was fine, that beyond that door was her family waiting for her. Breathing deeply and making sure she erased the traces of her tears, she softly knocked before pushing the door open. A pair of platinum and sapphire eyes both looked up from their respective papers and turned to her, feeling confused why she was standing there frozen while clutching Stefan's sleeves. Kasimi was the first to react and immediately stood up from his seat. He particularly did not like what he was seeing. He was halfway close to her when she suddenly had this relieved expression, like a weight was lifted off her shoulders, and beamed radiantly before she dashed forward with, wide open arms. Still feeling perplexed with her uncanny mood swings, Kasimi automatically also opened his arms to receive his wife when the woman did not stop and instead passed by, him, baby. She cried and went straight to Heisa, who was standing just a few feet behind his father, and engulfed the child in a tight bear hug. Not understanding anything, Kasimi turned to his brother and asked, What happened? I don't know. I just found her sleeping in your greenhouse where you kept those white lilies and then she suddenly woke up from a nightmare. Stefan supplied the necessary information and fluidly omitted some parts lest he say goodbye to his life. Heiser was hugging his mother back while listening to both men talk and tightened his hold on her after hearing the reason. That nightmare must have been so scary to shake his firm and strong mother this much. Mommy, Heisa is here. Heisa will protect Mommy from those bad dreams. The little boy reassured his mother and puffed his chest for emphasis which made Adira's heart swell with pride and overflowing love. Yes, they are here. They are safe. Stefan's right. Those are all just dreams. Well, I shall go ahead now. I still have things to finish. Stefan bid his brother farewell and turned on his heel yet briefly paused after hearing his brother's question. You are never someone who sits still to do work. What happened? I just think I might need to do better than this if I want to snatch a woman's attention. Well, you better watch your back, brother, cause I'll be catching up in no time. Stefan lightly gave his declaration of war and smiled meaningfully before he walked away and waved his hands as a gesture of farewell. Stefan. You haven't given up yet, huh? The afternoon went by uneventfully as Adira chose to remain where she could see both her husband and son and put her heart at ease. She tucked Heiser under the covers, when the night rolled in, and sung him a lullaby. In less than ten minutes, the child was already deep in sleep as he curled and snuggled in his mother's embrace. Adira slept soon after as well and Kasimi blissfully watched both mother and son sleep peacefully in each other's arms that he couldn't help but want to join there dreams as well. So he hurriedly finished his remaining work and promptly laid down beside Adira wrapping an arm around her torso and fixing her in place inside his arms. He must have slept for a few minutes or so when he felt the woman squirming and taking his arms off her before sneaking out of bed. Thinking that she must have went to the bathroom, he waited for her to return but she didn't. So he was reminded of what he saw a few nights ago when she suddenly vanished in the middle of the night and was in fact in a secret meeting with a woman that he didn't, know. Feeling that something didn't feel right, he also climbed out of bed and, once again, checked the room next door where he found them. Lo and behold, his wife was indeed there. 
However, she was alone in that lonely darkness as she sat in a backless couch and silently stared at the quiet world outside through the tall open windows. The night's temperature was dropping and the woman did not seem to mind it. So he, worrying that she might catch a cold, grabbed for a blanket and gently draped it over her shoulders. Feeling her jolt with his sudden gesture, she turned to him and there he saw the tears spilling down from her eyes. What's wrong? Why are you crying? Casey? Yes, it's me. What happened? Casey tilde tilde the woman instead bawled when she saw him standing beside her and clung to him for dear life. The real article was warm and breathing beside her. He was fine. Don't you ever leave me, please. I don't know what I will do if you leave me too. Kasimi, stunned with her worries about him leaving her, took his crying wife up into his lap and tried to comfort her, coax her into calming down and then maybe she'll realize how impossible her words sounded. What are you talking about? I won't leave you. Even if the world stops spinning, even if the sun never rises, even if you burn me to death. I won't ever leave you. Do you understand me, Adira? Casey, I'm scared. What if I go mad and burn this kingdom to the ground? What if I rise hell? And what if I die? Adira asked him into his ears. It oddly sounded too short sure, like she was reiterating facts that only she knew, like she knew it was gonna happen eventually. It'll be fine. As long as we're together, you will be fine. If you go mad then we'll be there for you. If you burn this kingdom then I will stop you and if you die, well, I'll die with you. Kasumi responded and with each responses he placed gentle yet searing kisses on the woman's forehead, nose, and her lips, easily igniting wildfires inside the woman's body before she responded to his kisses and deepened it. She needed to feel alive. She needed to feel him. Sliding his hands down to her lower back. Kasumi tried to draw comforting circles on her back before her deepening and sultry kisses were quickly making him go insane. Adira briefly parted away, gasping for air, and stared deep into Kasumi's lust-filled and lovely platinum eyes that reflected how badly he wanted her and how much his been restraining himself. She leaned closer to his ears and seductively whispered an answer to the question reflected clearly in his eyes, unspoken yet loud. Tonight, I am yours, husband. She pulled the loose neckline of her white silky nightgown off her shoulders and let it drop to her waist while she straddled Kasumi's bulge obviously aroused and, raring to go. Given the green light, Kasumi partook on the meal being offered to him and carried her up effortlessly, while still locked lips with Adira, before moving on to a spare bed in that room. Of course, this time he made sure that nobody could interfere as he coated the room's doorknob with a thick layer of ice. Kissing the woman senseless, gormandizing her, he left marks of his possession all over her smooth and white skin as he finally consummated their union and marriage. The cold night that enveloped his wife's lonely soul was now being covered with the burning passion of his embrace. To Adira, it was all a big swirl of hot love and pleasurable pain washing over her and filling her to the brim, body and soul. And to Kasumi, it was one of the happiest memories he shared with his wife. Notes this is a little bit mature so sorry Tilda also I can't write a full-fledged mature scene for the love of my chocolate cakes. So you'll have to make do with it and let your perverted imagination run wild Tilda. Anyway, thank you so much for the support like always Tilda and happy 100 chapters to us. Banza i.e. Tilda Tilda. P.S. I updated a whole lot early since I've got an exam I need to study for. Thank you for the love my lovely readers Tilda I look forward to reading your comments. Always magnificent, unable to believe the truth of that night, Kasumi woke up earlier than usual. He craned his head to find his wife, with her bare white shoulders peeking out of the blanket that covered her and her arms draped across Kasumi's chest. Seeing that the woman was as naked as a baby underneath this thick cloth, it confirmed Kasumi's thoughts about their union as nothing but a wonderful reality. He reached out a hand and caressed Adira's face as he felt his cold heart mellow out entirely. In this small room existed his whole world. In this room, everything was perfect and peaceful. He didn't know how long he'd been staring at her sleep peacefully without a care in the world when the dawn's morning rays started to filter in through the curtains and he knew it was time to move. Kasumi quickly prepared for the day and as soon as he stepped out of the bath, all prim and properly dressed, Adira stirred awake. Good morning, my wife. Greeting her with a good morning kiss. He was reminded of that morning she shocked him of the news that they were married. And somehow, 
that brought a very handsome and happy smile on his otherwise barren face. Good morning, husband. She greeted back and adorably reached out to him, demanding for an embrace. And of course, Kasumi jovially obliged. But that wasn't all the woman had in her mind. As soon as she snaked her arms around his neck, she suddenly pulled him back down with her which, if not for Kasumi and his insane reflexes, he was able to thrust out a hand to support himself and not crush his wife under his weight. Adira giggled at the confused look on Kasumi's face before she pulled herself up and gave the man a sultry kiss. As much as Kasumi enjoyed her kisses, it was a little bit too hard for his manhood when she's basically naked in front of his eyes as her sudden movement made the blanket, that was her only cover, slide down from her frame. Goddammit, Adira, you're astonishingly beautiful. My wife, I still have a little bit of time. He let the sentence hang, not so subtly implying what he wanted, and watched Adira temptingly bite her lips. Oh how she wanted him as badly as he wanted her too. However, the sun has risen and Heisa will also be up anytime now. So she had to somehow get this man out of the room before she also loses it and lock him inside this room not to be seen by anyone for a while and have him all to herself as she claims him over and over again. She kissed Kasumi while also gently pushing him to the door. Needless to say, the man was clueless to what she was doing up till he saw the door's frame and the open door in front of him and his wife clad in the loosely tied blanket remaining inside the room. A short time doesn't satisfy me, love. You've also got work to attend to, husband. So I'll see you later. Love you. After blowing a kiss and winking, she closed the door on his face and tended to herself. Even after they did all that work last night, it was not a wonder to her why she didn't feel the least bit dirty or sticky. He must have cleaned me. How sweet and embarrassing. The girl sheepishly laughed to herself while wearing an embarrassed face. While Kasumi, who was left outside, blinked a few times in confusion before he felt his knees almost go weak that he couldn't help but squat down and hit his burning face. God, I love her so much. He whispered against his palms with a very happy smile before he successfully collected himself and was all energized and refueled with his morning dose of Adira. Supplements. I'll see you later, my wife. Kasumi, for the last time before moving ahead, blew a kiss to the closed door and walked on. While a servant, who happened to pass by, couldn't help the urge to squeal that she had to tightly clasp a hand over her mouth to stifle her excited shriek. What kind of cute creature is this? Is this really the great demon lord of the empire? Oh my goodness. My eyes have been blessed. I need to share this with everyone. Well, you can just guess how quickly such gossip spread throughout the castle servants and guards that, of course, it eventually reached Roman's ears. So this aide was as relieved as hell about his works. Because he knew, no matter the mistakes today, the prince will just brush over it softly. Hurrah for the Princess Adira for taming the Demon Lord again today. What's with everyone's stares lately? Kasumi asked Roman while they walked along the corridor and noticed the blushes on the whispering lady servants as well as the butlers. Our prince is just looking very magnificent today. Roman replied with a bright smile on his eased face to which Kasumi replied with an arched brow. I'm always magnificent. Of course, your highness, but even more so now. Roman continued to suck up to this flighty and as warm as spring prince. Oh? It's the princess. Roman suddenly exclaimed and Kasumi, who was feeling very narcissistic a while ago, fumbled on himself and made sure he looked presentable and handsome before quickening his steps and followed after his wife, who went into the kitchen. Look at you, panicking and making sure you look fine when you face your wife albeit feeling very confident just a second ago. Adira was wearing a simple dress so it was easier to move around and assiduously worked on the kitchen as she baked something. When strong and lean arms snaked around her torso and she felt a hard and warm body plaster against her back immediately knowing who it was without having to look. Because of that familiar minty wintergreen scent. Hello, husband. She smiled and twisted her body to give the man a kiss. Are those for me? He asked. Of course not. Adira simply replied with mirth coating her words and the man simply pouted. The lady servants and cooks inside the kitchen widened their eyes upon seeing this side of their cold first prince and silently filed out while they still didn't have anything to do and while they have the chance. It seems the gossip circulating around the palace was true after all. 
The prince had indeed changed. Fetsi you. Adira helplessly sighed as she watched her husband sulk from her little joke and swiped a little bit of the melted chocolate she was working on and smeared it on the man's smooth face that which caught him off guard. Yes, you're a lot more handsome like that. She crooned and kissed the man on the chocolate smear on his face. Tasty too. You really shouldn't be doing that on broad daylight, my wife, or I will whisk you away and lock you up in the room. Kasumi sexily suggested and kissed the woman on her lips and of course, he delved deeper into taste her thoroughly. Sweet. Ehem. A man, who walked into them, cleared his throat to snatch the couple's attention. Kasumi let out an exasperated sigh before conducting himself properly and coldly and addressed the newcomer that interrupted him. Yet again. Father. He nodded. While Adira curtsied and flashed the old man a lovely and warm smile before greeting him sheepishly, Father. Anastasia surprised and happy to see his son getting along so well with his wife, chuckled softly at the imperfect image of this empire's first prince. Look at you, playing and acting spoiled around your little wife like a boy. Why did I not have a cute daughter instead? The king lamented and hugged the girl, who only giggled at his words. Well, I doubt you would have married me off had I been your daughter, your majesty. Of course. Anyway, Kasumi have you thought about it yet? Anastasia suddenly shifted and turned to his son gently wiping the chocolate stains off his face and pulled his wife back into his arms to also wipe her off him. Truly, it wasn't because he was jealous or possessive or anything. Millimeter. I'll go. He answered briefly that piqued Adira's curiosity. Where are you going? She asked. I'm going to go visit a neighbor. Elinthi Kingdom. Adira asked, although the tone she used wasn't as calm as it used to be. And, call him crazy or whatever you want but, it made Kasumi happy to hear her so bothered about one particular princess. Don't worry, my wife, my eyes cannot see anyone but you. It better be, Kasumi. Or, so help me God, but I will break the two of you in half and feed you to the dogs. Adira darkly threatened the man after grabbing his collars and pulled him down so he knew how serious she was. So he better be careful about how he acts around women especially now that he's a married man. I'd rather be fed to you though. Kasumi chuckled before planting a kiss on the woman's lips and caught her off guard instantly dissipating her earlier funeral. And I'm not going to the Alinthi kingdom. Our alliance ended when they chose to attack us. So now, they are no longer under the empire's protection. They are on their own now. In fact, they were attacked by another kingdom after what happened here and they lost miserably. So the princess Thea was taken as a token. He informed his wife while keeping her caged inside his embrace completely ignoring his father who only rolled his eyes at this man that liked to show off and unnecessarily feed people with dog food. Adira, although relieved that she wouldn't have to worry about Thea anymore, also felt sad about her current circumstance. No matter how she tried to take Kasumi away from her, as she heard after waking up from her coma, it was very sad to end up being offered to another kingdom as a token. Don't be sad, my wife. That is how this game is played. You win, you get to keep your spoils of war. You lose and that's it. I know. I know that very well. Adira spoke with a voice that suggested to the man that she knew what it was like to stand in Thea's shoes and this caused a little bit of panic to rise in his stomach. As he hurriedly reassured her that she won't ever be in such a situation. He even swore that as long as she was there and she loved the empire and the people in it, he will do his best to protect this kingdom that they will soon rule together. I won't ever allow any other man hold my dearest treasures. After the issue about Kasumi's departure was settled and all, Adira gave the cakes and cookies she baked, with the help of her husband who refused to go back to his office, to Heisa. Do you like it, baby? The woman asked her precious little sweetie pie. Of course, mommy. Anything you make is delicious. The child happily replied to his mother with sparkling little sapphire eyes. Daddy helped mommy make those, you know. Kasumi inserted before settling down on the child's other side. I know which cookies mommy made because you don't know how to make anything. Heisa replied to Kasumi with a snob before wolfing down the sweets his parents made for him. Daddy made the ones you are happily munching on though, baby. The mother sweat dropped as she watched this father and son's love-hate relationship. Finally convincing her husband to go and finish his work, Adira took Heisa out to shop and play of course, escorted by Alexander as always. 
Look at that, baby. There's that cotton candy that you loved so much. Adira beamed upon seeing the same man she used to buy cotton candies from. Back when she couldn't take Heisa out yet and it was only her and Kasumi. But this time, she had a little lover holding her hands. She walked close to the shopkeeper and the man immediately recognized her as the pretty lady who shamelessly demanded a handsome man to annul his engagement with his fiancé. And now as the Phoenix Queen. Although she was still that shameless pretty girl in his eyes. Yo. Pretty lady. Did you finally break that man and his fiancé apart? The shopkeeper, although aware that she was also that fiancé she was talking about, went along with her craziness and asked. You bet, mister. He's my husband now. And we even have a son. Aren't I great? Adira winked and flaunted her handsome and adorable son to the man. Not only are you a shameless fiancé turned wife, you're even a very doting mother. Ha! Huh? You really are the greatest, pretty lady. You even snagged a man as great as that one. You're not the greatest Yuri Almighty. The man corrected himself and guffawed loudly before giving Heisa a big blue cotton candy for free and that was because his mother was pretty and he was cute. Thank you, mister. Heisa adorably, with pinkish tints in his cheeks, thanked the man and quite successfully added another heart into his sack. The way this mother and son pair easily capture hearts is scary. Alexander mentally cried. Melissa Niveria. Baby. Do you want to go on a vacation? Adira suddenly asked the child as she turned to him to gently wipe his chocolate-stained face. Heisa stared back at his mother's pretty dark ash eyes that waited for his answer. Of course, he would love that. But truly, to him, wherever she goes is where he will go. Even now, when she whimsically went to Baron Niveria's fief to visit her most favorite shop, Heisa would tag along and stick to her side like a clingy koala, or in his case, a dragon. So the child, sensing that his mother wanted to go on a vacation, nodded his head in response and Adira smiled happily and excitedly. She now had an excuse as she decided on her course of action and planned to accompany Kasumi when he visits this neighbor that he spoke of. Then let's tell daddy. She shot up and excitedly turned around only to bump into a waitress that carried the sweets and orders of the people sitting at the booth next to theirs. Oh my. I'm so sorry for my clumsiness, madam. She quickly asked for forgiveness and excuse for her maladroitness. Oh dear. Please let me help you. It was my fault for suddenly standing up like that. Adira quickly bent down and helped the girl clean up when the latter suddenly looked over to her with a very surprised expression on her face after recognizing that sweet yet sultry and elegant voice. As she called her the way people used to address her. Lady Silveris. Mel, Lady Niveria. What are you doing here? And in those clothes, Adira cried and was astounded with this discovery. A noble like this Melissa Niveria was actually out here and helping out as a waitress in a shop. It was unheard of. Nobles don't usually come down here and don on a waitress uniform, you know. The girl, who was still surprised at finding the great Lady Silverus all the way out here in their backwater of a thief, blinked a few times and sheepishly answered, Um... I often help out at this shop without my father's knowledge. So can I please ask the Lady Silverus to keep this a secret? She knew it was presumptuous of her to even ask this lady, who was on her way to standing at the highest spot of their society's hierarchy, to keep her working a secret but she had no choice. She didn't want her father to know and ban her from coming back ever again. Well, the Baron was generally kind but he was also strict. Adira, having a look of understanding as she finally found the kindred spirit who was so much like her, smiled brightly and nodded her head with enthusiasm. Of course. I actually do that a lot too. Although my father knows. Really? And the Duke allows you? Well, he can't really do much since, no matter what, I always find a way out. Adira answered with a helpless and bashful smile while helping Melissa up. She wasn't proud of her stubbornness but she figured the other needed someone who could understand this quirk of hers. Heisa, who was quietly and cutely peering up to Melissa, waited for his mother to notice him and quite possibly introduce him to his new target. He needed to know if this woman was a friend or foe so he can recruit her to his side if need be. Oh. Hello child. Are you lost? Melissa smiled as soon as she noticed the blue-eyed dragon assuming the appearance of a child looking up to her. Um, 
Adira tried to answer Melissa instead but Heisa beat her to it. No, I'm not. My mommy's over there. Heisa answered with a cute little shake of his head and pointed Adira. Melissa turned her head towards the direction the adorable child was pointing at but only saw Adira. So she looked past her and strained her eyes more to find his mother and maybe help him back to her. Oh dear. I cannot see her. Is she really over there? Yes. She's standing there. Where are you looking at, big sister? Really? Where? Melissa tried really hard to find this woman he was speaking of when she found a nicely dressed lady wearing a white A-line dress with blue ribbons under a white umbrella standing in front of the fruit stand that was barely visible from the shop they were in. Melissa beamed after finally finding the lady and turned back to him. Oh. Is she the pretty lady with the white dress and blue ribbons? Is she buying you a fruit? That is so nice. After being looked on with a confused expression and an arched brow from this adorable kid, someone cleared their throat from behind her and that was when she realized she had forgotten that Adira was still there. Oh dear. Forgive me, my lady. I it slipped my mind that you were still here. Please forgive this clumsy me. Calm down, Lady Niveria. Actually, I am that child's mother. Adira informed her that made the poor noble lady stop in her mind tracks. This new information was too out there that it practically felt like she was listening to an alien language. Eh? What? Melissa was too shocked to even utter another word as she wordlessly turned to Heisa and pointed at Adira with an inquisitive gaze, to which the child happily nodded his head in confirmation. W who is the father, Lady Silveris? Is it the prince? Or no? Could it be you got together with Lord Dalriada indeed? There was that rumor that he took you away after all. No, it couldn't be. No. I mean, how could that demon allow it, right? However, I also think that the prince is the type to let you go if that is what you want. But, but, Lady Niveria, Heisa is my and his highness, Prince Casimir's child. I would appreciate it if you wouldn't associate my name with that person. Else, my husband would not like it and he gets scary when he's jealous. Adira said with a smile while fluidly pitching in her marital status and how she hated hearing her name being linked to Triton. Actually, it never even crossed her mind that there would come a day when just hearing Triton's name would make her feel nauseous. She had indeed come a long way from her past self who only knew and cared about this particular lord. Oh, I'm sorry. I see, of course, your husband will get mad. Wait. Your husband? Yes, I married his highness in secret so in exchange for me keeping your secret, you need to keep mine as well. Isn't that a fair exchange? Adira winked and Melissa blushed at realizing that maybe Adira noticed how she had been very ashamed of asking her to keep this secret life of hers outside their manners. Gates. She beamed happily and nodded her head enthusiastically at Adira's suggestion. Truly, the Lady Silveris, no, the Princess Adira was a good and kind soul to each and every individual alike. Even after all these time, she could not see the demoness a fraction of the nobles, like the Lady Latifolia, sees. She could not see the villainess they painted her to be. This princess was too different from everyone. She was both a noble and a commoner. And needless to say, she attracts a variety of individuals each with different personality power and status and manages to capture their untainted and complete loyalty. Wasn't it obvious? Even Marquis Vorai's heir, Lord Alexander Vorai, follows along her wherever she goes. And now, she and this amazing lady shared one thing, they shared each other's secret. Just like friends. How presumptuous. Melissa smirked and scoffed at herself mentally as she dared think she could even be friends with a lady like Adira, their empire's future queen. This is nice. I'm glad to have a friend like you, Lady Melissa. Adira suddenly exclaimed and held the other's hand that briefly shocked her before large beads of tears dripped down from her chocolate brown eyes. The former panicked while flustering about what she did or say wrong that caused those tears in her eyes. Did I perhaps overstepped my boundaries? Did she not want to be my friend? Is that it? Oh God. I, I am. I'm sorry, princess. Wow. You adjust quite quickly. It's fine. I'm sorry for presumptuously calling you a friend when you didn't want to. She apologized to which the other girl vehemently protested. Nonsense. It would be my family's and my life's honor to be your friend, princess. If you would allow a clumsy fool like me, 
Please be my friend, princess. Melissa passionately thrusted out her hand in an awkward attempt to shake Hadira's hand when the latter didn't take it and instead engulfed this cute lady in an embrace. She had always wanted a true friend within the noble girl's circle but they were too afraid to approach her. However, even if she did make the first move and approach them, then they would be too stiff and awkward with her. So she had long given up on making friends with other noble ladies. Not until today. Are we tilde or too cute, Lady Melissa? Oh, um, princess. Please. Please just call me Melissa. Then Melissa can call me Adira as well. After all, we are friends. The lady beamed happily and once again introduced Heiser to her. Because, now that she was his mother's friend, she was a new addition to his family tree. She had successfully claimed the other seat as Heiser's aunt. But truly, it only meant another woman pampering, spoiling, and supplying him with more sweets than he could ever ask for. And that was the best. That was pure happiness. Aside of course for the moments he spends with his mother. That was the absolute and the most happiest for him. And maybe also those he gets to tease his father. Maybe. After having procured a new friend, Adira, together with Heiser and Alex, were heading back to their carriage to return to the palace before sunset else she cannot help but shiver what the demon lord would do if they didn't. Especially since they did not ask for permission to come all the way here to Baron Niveria's domain. Her mind was too preoccupied with making plans about how to break it to Kasami that she and Heiser will be tagging along with him to this neighboring kingdom, when she clumsily again bumped into someone. A much taller man this time. I am sorry. I wasn't looking where I was going. She automatically apologized and raised her gaze to meet his vibrant and piercing amber eyes underneath that monocle. It's quite all right, my lady. Rather it is my fault for not stepping out of your way. I didn't hurt you, did I? He asked in a worried and hypnotically sweet voice as he reached out a hand to check her when she visibly flinched after she felt his cold hands touch her. Oh dear, you're pale. Are you all right? Do you want to go sit over there for a while? You look like as if you'll faint in a time. He spoke again and, as much as Adira wanted to, she couldn't move nor take a single step away from this man. She was just frozen there on her spot, unable to move. For how can she? She remembers him no matter how much she wants to forget him, to the point that even if she bashed her head in, she will still remember him. And even if she somehow miraculously and blissfully forgets him, her body will tell her otherwise. The shivers will still remind her who this man was. This man was too unforgettable that she'd rather die again than meet him again this lifetime. Why? Why is he here? Why are you here? Why do you continue to haunt me? Why? Why? Notes. Hi. I understand I've been missing for a week now. I had five consecutive exams I needed to study for so I couldn't find the time to write at all. So, to somehow make it up to you, I made this chapter extra longer. Again, go Menasai. Please love me. My lady? Are you all right? Please don't. Adira suddenly screamed horrified, shaken and pale to the tips of her fingers as she trembled badly, reflexively hugging her body in an attempt to move as far as she could from the man. She felt her back touch the frigid stone walls and hear the loud and cold clanging of chains. Princess? Mommy? Both of Alex and Heiser wondered what happened to Adira as she continued to look unto this man with fear evident in her ash-gray eyes. She looked as if she was looking at the devil incarnated itself, while softly repeating to herself, Please, no more. Please stop. My lady? The perplexed man watched the fear-stricken eyes of the lady before she jolted yet again and averted her eyes while muttering an apology over and over again. Alexander and Heiser, not understanding what was happening to Adira, immediately shielded her from this man's sight. There was something not right here. A woman as strong and as brave as Adira can't suddenly act like this, as if fearing for her life, without reason. And he didn't smell right to Heiser's nose. Something about him was familiar yet not. Something so rotten and sinister that makes him want to gag. The man, confused to what was happening, immediately raised his hands as a gesture that he did nothing and meant no harm to the lady. Heck! He didn't even know why she was acting like that. I'm sorry? No. Please excuse us. It seems our lady wasn't feeling well in the first place. Alexander politely bowed to apologize in behalf of his mistress. 
Because, it was true that he did not do anything. Adira just suddenly had this anxiety attack he never once saw before. She was always so calm, firm and collected. She never broke down or anything. She always stood strong. So seeing this vulnerable side of hers made him want to protect her even more. Something unnecessary was kicking up a fuss again, but he was not gonna bother to stash it in this time. Alexander pivoted on his heel and offered a hand to the frightened Adira and smiled warmly when she looked up to him. It seems to him that she needed something or someone to keep her grounded. Alex. It's Alex. She muttered and suddenly clung to him. The Adira right then have long stopped thinking what her actions entailed nor the consequences after it. She only needed something that would remind her that she was way past this man now. That she had lived through and escaped him. That this was not her first life anymore. That the chances of her fate and future being interlinked with this man was way below zero now. Because Kasumi would not allow it, her husband this lifetime would not allow it. Let's go back to the palace now. Alexander softly spoke to her and, even if it was not the right moment or the most appropriate time, he took the chance to embrace her in his arms and feel her warmth. A chance that was as rare as the blue moon. Yes. Let's go home. Please take me home. To Casey. Adira muttered weakly and tightened her grip on Alexander as he helped her up. Heisa, who was still keeping his sharp and doubtful glare on the man, reached out for his mother's hand. He was briefly stunned with how cold she was and immediately directed his anger at the man that triggered everything. Who are you? Why is my mother scared of you? Like a ghost that has come back to haunt her. Hi sir, baby, let's go. Don't let go of mommy's hand. Don't leave me, okay? Don't let me go. Adira spoke to the child shakily, as if starting to doubt Hysa's loyalty to her, as if when Hysa lets go. Then she'll forever be lost inside that nightmare this man brought with him. Heisa won't leave mommy. I love you mommy so I won't leave you. I won't ever let you go. Thank you, baby. Keep loving mommy, okay. The pale woman bent down to plant a kiss on the child's forehead as soon as they were inside their carriage and settled down comfortably well, maybe not. Even as they reached the capital and she hadn't seen the man for a while now, she still can't help trembling involuntarily. His piercing amber eyes still continued to haunt her. She believed she would not see him ever again this lifetime because Kasumi loved her. Because it was Kasumi she decided to marry this time. But why? Why is he still a part of her story? Mommy, Heisa is here. Heisa will not leave Mommy. Heisa will always go wherever Mommy goes so Mommy can't leave Heisa as well. The child, not tearing his eyes away from his unstable mother, tried to embrace her as much as he could and give her his warmth. She was shivering too badly, feeling her son's arms wrap around her, gradually warming her up. Adira's shivering gradually settled down and she kissed the child on his head while whispering her gratitude and returning his hug. It was fine. Everything was different now. Seeing the man once doesn't necessarily mean he would be a part of her life again. Not again. Arriving back at the palace, Adira had considerably calmed down and forgot about her grave encounter with death a while earlier. She and Heisa walked towards Kasumi's office only to be met with a quivering Roman standing in full attention and a very cold and dreadful aura hanging inside that cramped room. The man, who emitted this glacial aura, was seated there and briefly glanced up at them before turning back down to the papers that almost looked bloody red with the marks he left. Even the slightest mistake didn't escape his eyes this time. Princess, why you re back? Thank heavens. Please help us. Please pacify the da. I'm the first prince. I shall take the little prince and leave the both of you. Good luck. Roman rushed his speech and immediately took Heiser away, much to the surprise of the little child and growled dangerously at Roman but stopped when he saw Adira's helpless smile and gestured for him to follow his uncle Roman. It'll be okay, dear. Mommy and Daddy will follow soon, okay baby. She said before closing the door and turned to her fuming husband. Um. Husband. She gently tried to act cute and pitiful to try and pacify this demon lord acting up again. But there was no response. Sweetie. Dearest. My king. My love. She tried different endearments but still to no avail as the man remained silent and didn't even glance at her again. It was the first time his sulking reached this far without him giving in to her acting cute. Man, you really challenge me every single time. 
Let's see how you ignore the Hana trap then. Deciding and braving this storm, Adira shuffled towards Kasumi's back and slowly and seductively ran her hands across his chest before she dipped her head and kissed the man's cheeks and whispered, go on and ignore these unpretty lips, then. She smirked when she felt the man's muscles tense up under her touch. Of course, you cannot endure me this far. Stop making things difficult for you, Casey. She continued to gently pepper light -like kisses on the man's forehead, eyes, cheeks and all the way down to his neck and renewed her stamp of territory. And, try as he might, he couldn't hide the effect his wife's touch always has on him. It magically makes things better even when he's practically an inch close to blowing up and quite possibly making everyone's life a living hell. But, he stood his ground this time, he was not gonna be swayed this time. The man continued to ignore her, even when his body practically cannot, but he was trying his best. A few minutes into him ignoring his wife, her small hand suddenly cupped his cheeks and forced him to look at her. He never once glanced at her again cause he knew damn well that when he so much as sees her pretty little face, then he'll be forced to surrender again. He needed to be loved as well. And he was sulking about how they left him and went to Baron Niveria's fief to have a date. So he was gonna act spoiled as much as he wanted to. However, all his plans crumbled down when he saw the tears silently streaming down the woman's face. There was a complicated look in her eyes. It was somehow a mix of sadness, fear and relief. Look at me, please. Don't take your eyes off me, please. I'll pleasure you, love you and serve you as much as you want so please, don't let me go. Keep loving me, please. I'll give you everything anything you want so keep holding on to me tightly. Love me always, please, Kasumi. Please, Casey, not you. Don't betray me. Don't ever stop loving me. Kasumi was too shaken with her words as she begged him over and over again, each words piercing him deeper than the last. He might have went too far this time. I won't ever stop loving you. You know that. No matter what happens, I'd rather die than let you go. I'd rather let everything else go but not you. What do I need to do so you'll always remember that? Kasumi spoke as he felt his wife's pain, doubt and uncertainty. He felt as if she was walking on a tightrope always on guard beneath that calm and easygoing smile. And now, she was acting as if something upset her balance, which must be why she suddenly answered him, make love to me. Notes. A second update since I will be absent again next week. Love YA. CYA. I'll see if I can find time to write again. Love you guys. Banzo IE. P.S. I was crying while writing Adira's please. I don't know. I somehow feel a woman's pain when she begs for another's love. Anyway, that's only me though. Prince Kasumi 2.0. Kasumi swiped the stray ashen locks of the woman sleeping peacefully in his arms and sighed contentedly. No matter how many times he woke up with her still sleeping inside his embrace, it still feels like as if it's the first time. Gingerly tracing her rosy lips with his fingers, he was overcome with the urge to place a kiss on them softly so he wouldn't disturb her peaceful rest, before he gently slipped out to grab food for when she wakes up. He may have overdone it a bit this time and really exhausted her. Well, he can't help it. He missed a date with her and their son and that was unfair. He ought to have his fair share of her attention as well. Arriving at the kitchen, where Roman kept Heiser cooped up and distracted by letting the maids. Servants and cooks feed him with sweets and whatever the child wanted, he briefly stopped on the door before scanning the room to look for the head cook. Everyone turned to look at their sloppily dressed prince, wearing only an untucked white dress shirt. And Roman immediately knew what this man did for the past few hours, and why the princess wasn't with him. This man. Was he that upset? To the point that he overdid it. Think about your wife's constitution, your highness. Your highness. How rare, do you need anything? An elderly woman, who was the head cook and was the one primarily responsible for preparing their everyday meal, smiled warmly at the newcomer. Soup. Warm soup for Adira. Please. Kasumi answered and the mere word of request surprised everyone. They were practically staring at this handsome renewed creature with wide eyes. Like an upgraded version, Prince Kasumi 2.0. It was a different feeling to personally witness his changes with your own eyes. It really does feel like a dream. 
Like the person in front of them wasn't really the first prince of the empire, popularly known as the Great Demon Lord, and was someone who uncannily looked like him. Of course, your highness. The woman beamed happily before she got busy. Kasumi, noticing Heisa's eyes dart all around as he searched for his mother, walked close to pet him in the head. She's sleeping so don't disturb her for now. Just eat your fill there. Heisa felt sad at not seeing his mother but decided to distract himself with the sweets the servants lined up in front of him. Mind you, those sweets were also Adira approved. They were strictly instructed not to feed Heisa anything she hasn't tried or tasted. That was why everything that was given to Heisa underwent meticulous taste testing from his mother. By the way, Alexander Richter Vorai. Kasimi called the knight's complete name along with the sudden change in his temperament and atmosphere. He suddenly entered frost mode in a split second. Yes, your highness, came the immediate and firm reply of the red-headed knight as he knelt in submission to this prince. When you escorted my wife and son earlier this afternoon, what happened? The man asked with a strict and hard tone which suggested that he was very aware that something was wrong with his wife. How could he not know? He knew the way Adira usually behaves even with his eyes closed. He's as observant as that. Ehem. He's not a stalker, I swear. Roman commented in his head while watching this prince interrogate his wife's knight. We were about to head back when the mistress bumped into a man. A man? And with this information, the temperature dropped yet again as he seemed to have reverted back to his cold personality. Really, almost everything about him has changed save for that jealousy. Yes. It seems as if she knew him however the man did not know her. I also noticed how terrified she was of this man. What did he do to her? Kasumi asked with a calm and quiet tone but was betrayed by the shadow looming over his dark figure and his expression. His mood was plummeting deeper and deeper with each information. Yo your highness, keep calm, okay? We don't want the little prince telling on you to the princess, right? He'll tell your wife if you lost your composure and raged here, you know? Roman tried to pacify him and save everyone's lives by baiting him with Heisa and Adira. They were after all, for better or for worse, the only thing that could stop him. The latter, taking his aide's words into consideration, breathed deeply to calm his raging nerves and finally the tension let up a little bit enough for all the servants to breathe a little bit better. He did nothing, your highness. The mistress suddenly had an anxiety attack and we promptly returned to the carriage. That can't be right. Why would Adira be scared of him if he didn't do anything? He smelled wrong. He reeked of fetid rotten meat with a disgusting stench of blood. Heisa, who was still eating his cakes, gulped down what he was chewing on and told his father of what he noticed. He didn't want to remember what the man smelled like because it made him nauseous but he maybe it might have something to do with his mother acting weirdly like that. Kasimi, Alexander, and Roman both turned to the child and the former had this pondering look. If Heiser said that he smelled that way then he must be. Dragons have keen senses that was leaps and bounds better than humans. So if it was, then that man might be trouble. Not like he could judge him. Because, he was gravely aware that he must have that same smell as well. He was no saint, might I remind you. Maybe she instinctively knew he was dangerous and thus she reacted that way. While both Roman and Alexander, especially Alex, just stared in confusion at the little child chiming in and saying what the man smelt like when even Alexander himself, who stood directly in front of the man, did not notice such scent on him. Anyway, I shall ask Adira about this when she wakes up. In the meantime, try to look into that man you bumped into, Alex. Kasimi said. Adira's soup was also done just in time before the other servants placed it in front of the prince and he carried it away after excusing himself. Returning to his room, the creaking and the gentle sound of the door closing stirred the woman awake as she immediately called for his name. Casey, did I wake you? Did you not rest again? His wife replied him with her own question before she pushed herself up and grabbed and wore Casimir's tunic shirt that went all the way down to her thighs. Stay in bed. I got you soup to warm you up, he said while adoring how she looked too comfortable and small wearing his shirt. Somehow, he loved that look as well. Noticing Casimir's stare on her, Adira smirked while rolling the tunic sleeves up to her midarm and tried to tease the man. Like what you see, husband, no. And his quick and brief reply surprised the girl that she momentarily halted on her tracks. Well, 
she didn't expect that answer from him. But, he wasn't finished yet as he added, I love it. Adira blushed before she let out an exasperated sigh and smiled sweetly. My, even though we're already married, you still love to make my heart flutter, huh? The man only gave her a small loving smile before he placed a kiss on her head and remembered the question that's been bugging him since. Adira, will you tell me how your day went? And she immediately knew that her husband had seen through her. That he was more or less aware of what transpired earlier but wanted to hear it directly from her. So she took a deep breath before deciding to disclose the reason why she acted the way she did when she met that person. After all, it wasn't good nor was it healthy to keep a secret in a marriage. I was reminded of a distant dream. A nightmare about a life that was a bit too different from my life right now. Notes. Hi. I'm back. This week was hell. The exams were too hard to the point that I felt very nauseous and dizzy. Anyway, enough about that. I'm sorry for being absent but I hope you are still looking forward for more chapters. Love YA guys. Banzai. One life. In that life, I never married nor even met you, Casey. Instead, I was married to the Dalriada heir, Triton. I was so hopelessly head over heels for him that I did and gave him whatever he asked. I fought for him. I slayed his enemies. I sold my soul to the devil and became a demon all for him. I married him to be his strongest pillar of support against those who didn't believe in him. And then, on this war I cannot remember with whom, I met this man. He was the king of his kingdom and he took fancy in me. Here, your majesty. A soldier came into her tent, which she barely used, and placed her share of the ration on the table before quickly fleeing. They never felt comfortable with her presence. But they needed her talent and strength as well as the dragon's power, so they had to grin and bear with their setup. Adira, having finished unhooking her armor off her petite body barely holding up, turned a brief glance at the soldier's back, who was gone as quickly as he came, and sighed. Silently, she picked up her tray and went out to somehow share a meal with Heisa. Also, to make sure he was getting enough meal to eat especially since he was a growing dragon. When the moment she swiped the tent's curtains away, she suddenly heard a soldier say, she's as stuck up as ever, always looking at us condescendingly like she's so almighty, she can only swing the sword a little bit better than us, and if she didn't have that big ass dragon under her, she wouldn't be as powerful, you shouldn't say that, she's already poor as she is, even though she's the queen, his majesty, King Triton, still sent her to the front lines. I also heard the king is planning to take Lady Latifolia as a concubine. Poor her, even though she should have been the queen. Now, she has to settle as the concubine because his majesty needed the power of the queen's family. Adira, hearing enough, decided to shut them out and ignore their words before turning to walk towards where Hysa was kept. It wasn't far enough to her tent but she was staying a bit too far away from the troops. When the dragon noticed her coming, he had this worried and pained look in his eyes. It was like he felt heartbroken for her. Like he could feel her pain and wanted to console her. So she smiled brightly at him before settling down beside him. She had this thought that maybe the dragon heard what the soldiers were gossiping about. Don't listen to them. They don't know what they're saying. Triton loves me so much that he even tried to stop me from coming here. But I did because I want to protect him and the kingdom that he rules. She spoke to this intelligent dragon and comforted him instead. But even as she said those words, she knew that they were nothing but empty lies. She knew very well how shaky her position as the queen was even her position as the wife was being huge as well. She can only comfort herself with these lies that have become her truth solely on the basis that it was her triton married in the end and not Iris. The dragon whined sorrowfully and nudged his large head at her, trying to cheer her up. But even if she laughed merrily, they both knew that there was not a shred of happiness in there. Dawn rolled in and the fighting resumed. Adira was still at the forefront, leading the army, when their foe's commander finally came forward to face her himself. He had this short hair with a handful of extra long uncut locks on the right side that framed his face and commanding amber eyes that stared right back at her as they locked swords. You must be the Ash Demoness, the queen of the Vasilis Empire, and if I am, what is your husband thinking sending you to your death like this? He suddenly asked that momentarily shook Adira's concentration and psyche that she had to retreat and place enough distance from him. The man was strong and with her being unstable and weary as she was then, 
with the addition of him poking at a sensitivity subject, she stood no chance against him. Your Majesty, what do you say we stop this unnecessary war? He proposed. It will only end if you surrender. And Adira hatefully spat at him. There was something about him that was making her alarm bells blare loudly in her ears, her instincts telling her to run the hell out of there. Is that so? Well, how about I surrender and hand over the glory of victory to you? He smiled brightly and harmlessly that confused her so bad. It was making her more wary of him. Surely, no ruler would give up as easily as that. Adira knew that there was a catch to his surrender, if he really was. What do you want? My, how perfect indeed. He whispered softly that was barely audible to Adira's ears before he added, You. I want you. Adira heard his ridiculous demand and couldn't help but laugh derisively at him. It was a fresh and different kind of approach directed at her. It was the first time someone ever wanted her, albeit it disgusted her to her core. Who says my husband would allow that? And why wouldn't he? He's even crazy enough to send you here to the battlefield, who's to say he's not a little bit sane enough to give you to me? One life in exchange for all his citizens. A fair trade, might I say. His words struck where it hurt her the most that she lost herself to anger and attacked him relentlessly. Gone were her techniques, plans, or even her ability to look at the bigger picture and assess her battle. She was just one-sidedly trying to hammer her way into him and release her anger. She was just single-mindedly, with a simple pattern and manner of fighting, just pushing her way in. And the man easily deflected everything she threw at him like he was playing with his prey. Like he was letting her exhaust her anger and strength. Adira used her fire but the man easily dodged it as well. So she whistled and called on to Heiser to incinerate this man and reduce him to nothing but ashes. The latter immediately obeyed and landed beside her before breathing out fire towards the man that angered Adira, his chosen master. Being engulfed in fire, Adira did not feel anything remotely close to pity for this man but only relief, stemming from the idea that she won't have to deal with him ever, again. But she was wrong. When Heiser's attack ended, the man emerged from the fire unscathed. Adira didn't know what he did but it seemed as if he used some kind of protection spell that shielded him even from dragonfire. No. Well, I hope you have more than that to dish out against me. However, you have to make sure you'll be able to kill me, darling. Because, after this, I'm taking you back with me no matter what. And well, you could just imagine how Adira panicked so much and became too desperate that she simply threw every single strong attack she had at her disposal. However, nothing worked against this man. What's? What's with this bastard? Adira wheezed as she leaned on her knees for support. Are we done now, your majesty? Can we go home now? The man spoke as if he was a very lenient husband who was letting his angry wife vent out as much as possible and take on no matter what she threw at him. And it was causing strong feelings of repugnance from the woman even more. Because in her eyes, no one matched up nor went above Triton. And oh, just so you know, while you were practically out here risking your life and trying to kill me as soon as possible, I already went ahead and asked you from your husband as a token of ceasing this war. Would you like to know his reply? Adira could feel her entire being shake in fear. She was fervently praying that Triton had a shred of decency or respect for her left in him enough that he would not let her go and give her to this man. Seeing that Adira could not even find her voice, he continued, Well, we are free to go back to my home after this. So, shall we, little darling? The nightmare. Adira lost all strength and fell to her knees when she heard what the man said. That her husband had entirely relinquished his hold on her. That he had given her as a peace treaty token between their kingdoms and abandoned her. He has no more use of me. He doesn't need me anymore. She muttered to herself while lifelessly and unflinchingly letting the enemy commander take her away. She had gone with him without a fuss and, of course, Heisa wanted to go with her if only she said the word. But the last that she told him was to stay and protect the people, especially Triton. Soon, they arrived at his kingdom and the people warmly welcomed this man. Adira watched how very well loved he was and how very bustling and prosperous their kingdom was. It looked very much like their empire before Triton assumed the throne. And even if she very much loved that bastard, she could also see how the empire slowly deteriorated under his reign. Welcome back, your majesty. A girl, who seems to be a bit younger than Adira, 
came forward to greet him and curtsied. The king reached out and petted the girl in the head playfully before speaking with mirth in his words. What kind of nonsense is this, Riv? You're not suited for anything close to elegance. What the? I even practiced that whole night because you said you were gonna bring back that maiden whosoever back. You could at least praise me. The girl complained indignantly to their king and Adira feared for her life. Back in their empire, when someone so much as talked back to Triton then there was hell to pay. Someone even unfortunately lost their tongue because of such act and this girl was carelessly running her mouth right in the presence of their king. Adira was prepared to step in if need be should the man decide to cut this girl's tongue for shamelessly complaining to him, when what he did made her freeze on her spot. Okay, okay. It could pass for an average lady. And yeah, I did bring her back. He surrendered and then stepped aside so the girl could see Adira better. This is Queen Adira Ramiria Silveris Dalriada. The Ash Demoness. Adira, this is my sister, Rivian Sito via Aestia. He introduced Adira and the woman jolted back to her senses before she curtsied like a real royal and noble lady, which weirdly awed the girl. Oh Tilda you're right. Mine indeed was crappy in comparison to the real deal. I didn't know true elegance could be as beautiful as that. Told you. So, she's staying here as your new queen. How were you able to snatch this beautiful woman anyway? The girl curiously asked but unconsciously pried on Adira's still fresh wounds as they opened again when the king answered her. Her husband gave her as a token. Wow, what a bastard. And on pure reflex, Adira grasped for the sword on her waist and would have killed the girl on her spot if only her sword wasn't taken away. Luckily it was. Else, she might have unnecessarily took this girl's life away just because of one bastard, indeed. Rivian was amazed at the swiftness of her footwork, stance, and everything but most especially of that bloodthrist that was corrupting the air and making it a bit too difficult to breathe. Okai Tilda let's stop there and get inside. The king broke the tension hanging in the air with a loud clap of his hands before guiding Adira in. For the week that Adira stayed there, everyone was very kind and gentle that she almost had this delusion that maybe her life might be better here where everyone liked her, where the people do not know the horrid things she did for love. But, it was yet to be another one of her misfortunes when the first month rolled in. It was then when her nightmare began. This horrible king started to chain her up and lock her inside the room allowing only the Chamberlain ladies to go in and tend to her needs. Another week passed and he started to question her about the secrets of this maiden of light, what she was capable of and what could be her bane. Adira did not know what to answer as she never tried to get to know the maiden of light. All she knew was that this so-called prophesied queen stole everything that was hers. But the king did not believe her so he started to torture it out of her. He broke her so bad that she didn't know how she was able to last so long. He wrecked her, disfigured her, and destroyed everything that was Adira before making her his puppet. One that opened her legs for him and him only and one that did his every bidding. He essentially broke her to make her completely his. And he succeeded. Every time she hears the door to her room open, she would start to tremble and then surrender herself. Because if she didn't, then there would be another torturous night. All day and night, the only sound that she could hear, in the desolate room she was kept in, were the clanging of the chains. All she could feel was the cold wall she always cowered in after he uses her, after he vents out to her. She was taken from another demon by the devil itself. She escaped the fire only to fall into the burning embers. Her life by Triton's side incredibly looked more appealing to her then. Because even if her heart broke every day, at least she wasn't degraded to a mere pleasure doll like this. And all along even after she lost her life, she never knew the real reason she was given away. It wasn't because Triton was a scum to the deepest of his bones but because Iris made it possible. She made sure she would not be able to return by purposely poisoning Triton's mind that his queen had ran away with the enemy king. That's the reason I suddenly had that anxiety attack. I'm sorry for worrying you. Adira apologized while wiping the silent tears that cascaded down her face. It was a brave thing to reiterate her nightmare even when she shook badly while telling the tale she lived through. What a nightmare. But where was I in your dreams? Kasumi asked her as his heart broke while watching his wife's tears. The story of this nightmare that she spoke of seemed too vivid, it felt too true. You. Died, Casey. Died? I have a hard time believing that. Right? 
Who could even kill the great D.E.M. on the great first prince of the empire? Adira quickly corrected herself before laughing and relaxing her tensed shoulders within Kasumi's warm embrace. But, how disappointing of the me in your dreams to allow all of those to happen to you. And that bastard Dalriada, how could he be so blind as to let you go? I swear that man has no taste in women. He was lucky enough he got to marry you in your nightmare, though I really want to kill him now. But to give you away, that bastard has gone crazy. Kasumi nagged, uncharacteristically, as the temperature dropped more. But Adira didn't mind it. She loved the way Kasumi's coldness comforted her. She loved the way her husband was supposed to be cold but was, in truth, adorably warm. However, you don't have to be afraid of those dreams, my wife. I'm here. Haisa is here. As long as I'm alive, I won't ever allow that to happen. I will kill whoever wants to take you away from me. Kasumi pledged and peppered light kisses all over the woman's face and body that inevitably led to another exercise yet again. Thank you, Casey. Thank you for loving me. A month had passed and everything was already prepared for the royal family's trip. The reason for Kasumi's visit to the neighboring kingdom was to grace the invitation they received for the coronation of their new king. And although he initially planned to take Adira along with him, his wife beat him to it and proposed that they must accompany him even saying that it was a chance to have another little family trip together. Kasumi could only smile in a pampering way and nodded to her request. Who was he to reject his wife's wishes, right? And how can he even? So this little royal family went together to Bycrest Kingdom, to the far west of the Vasilis Empire, and took their sweet time by stopping at various places to have fun. They had time after all. Their entourage was a little ways behind their carriage to give their family some privacy on the first prince's orders, of course. He wasn't about to allow any more knights and soldiers to see his beautiful wife's brilliant and happy smile. She already has too many men ensnared with her charms and is not allowing any addition to her ever-growing harem if he can help it. Husband, look at this. Isn't it cute? Adira happily pulled him along while showing him a necklace with a little butterfly pendant that had rainbow-colored glass wings. Kasumi took it from her hands and held it against her before smiling softly and handsomely. He then proceeded to wearing it on her and whispered, It looks more beautiful on you. The lady shopkeeper blushed at this couple's dog food show while clutching her fastly beating heart. A god and goddess was right in front of her and showering her with too much dog food. She didn't know if she should be thankful or sad she didn't have a man like this handsome creature. Not only was he incredibly handsome, the most handsome she's seen all her life, but he was also incredibly caring and loving to his wife. She bets he was amazingly loyal as well. Well, who would not even be loyal with his wife's beauty? Can't you smile a little less when we're outside? Adira muttered with a cute blush on her face. Why? Calls your seducing women left and right even though you're with me. The woman adorably pouted that struck such a big arrow into her husband's heart and awed the lady shopkeeper as well. Oh Tilda she plays nice as well. But I'm trying to seduce you though. Oh and he comes back. Dharma, Mommy, Heisa is hungry. A little child interrupted the couple's hot atmosphere that effortlessly seized the shopkeeper's heart immediately. What's with this family's level of attractiveness? So godlike. The shopkeeper could only cry mentally as she was blinded with their brilliance and beauty. They looked like they were on a different plane of attractiveness, as if they were carved with the likeness of the gods themselves. Just one of them was enough to take one's breath away. How much more when they three were together? It could cause serious cardiac attack. And it wasn't only one poor shopkeeper, who had to deal with this, but practically everyone that came across this little family of three. They were a disaster in their own right the most beautiful disaster they've laid eyes on, and one they will welcome no matter how many times. Notes. So I've been away for so long because I had two week-long exams and I had a short vacation after the gruesome hell we went through. So I'm recharged now and I hope I can write every day again. Thank you for all those that kept looking forward for more updates. I love you guys. Banzai. P.S. I wrote a long chapter this time to somehow make it up to you. Adira's Jealousy. It took the family a whole week before they arrived at the Bycrest Kingdom, which was right on schedule. Because Kasumi planned their trip ahead of time, even before Adira proposed it to him. And he purposely left a week before they were expected at Bycrest so they could spend more quality time together and have fun. 
The prince, to be crowned as king, and princess of Bycrest weren't with the ushers and welcoming party that met their party at the gates. Their excuse was that he still had a lot of things to attend to for the coronation and couldn't free his time. So he opted to send a large number of his aides and knights to meet and welcome them instead. And Casimi magnanimously and miraculously understood and let it go. To be fair, he didn't even get off the carriage to face them since Adira was sleeping on his shoulders while Hysa slept in her arms, which explained why he didn't make much fuss and instructed them to speak softly. So they guided them towards the palace they were supposed to use for the duration they stayed there. Kasimi hated to wake his wife up but he had no choice since prolonging her sleep in their position would be hard on her body especially since he couldn't help but exhaust her a little bit lately. The woman stirred awake but instead of getting up, she ended up snuggling closer to him, and it was incredibly cute that the man couldn't help but to kiss her awake. Adira responded to his kisses by biting his lips that made him groan before she finally opened her ash grey eyes and smacked at him. That was for stealing kisses while she was asleep, though she didn't hate it nor even mind it. We've arrived, huh? She rhetorically spoke and stretched her sore arms after the little child, in her embrace, woke up as well. Mommy's sorry for waking you up, baby. Why don't you sleep some more? Mommy will take you inside. She smiled at the child and he obediently went back to closing his eyes and slept more. Kasimi, knowing full well how heavy Heiser had gotten lately, promptly took the child off her arms and carried him inside instead. It was such a very heartwarming sight that the female servants could only melt in envy at watching the empire's first prince's hidden husband persona. Adira's sharp vision didn't miss the way their eyes glimmered at watching Kasimi carry Hysa in his arms that she had to unreasonably and forcefully feed them dog food, by pulling the man down suddenly and connecting their lips. What was that? Confusion was etched on the man's face, though he didn't mind it at all. In fact, he very much loved her kisses even surprise ones. Just felt like it. Adira shrugged her shoulders with a slight blush and clung onto Kasimi's arm possessively. The latter, still confused and refusing to believe it was nothing, turned his head around and saw the maidens casting him dazed and personate gazes. It was then that he thought of an idea as he asked Adira, Were you, perhaps, jealous? I, I am not. Why would I be? Adira pouted and averted her gaze to the opposite side, trying to hide her expression from this man that sees through her each and every time. Yes, why would you be? When you're the only one for me? Kasimi, who was genuinely curious and confused, smoothly swept away her jealousy and anxiety that she couldn't help but giggle at her silliness. Really, you never failed to sweep me off my feet, husband. Evening came and there was supposed to be a welcoming banquet for all the guests to be held at the Great Oaken Hall, as the palace servants called it. It sounded strangely familiar to Adira but she ignored it while she got busy trying to coordinate matching outfits for their family. Heisa wore a white suit with golden lines on the edges and black undershirt finished with a raven-colored feathery coat and a dark sapphire ribbon on his neck. His shiny raven hair was fixed slick back that made him more handsome than cute as he exuded the same type of frigid coolness his father had. Kasimi was made to wear an all-black suit, also with raven feathers and dark-hued flower brooch pinned on his jacket hung over his shoulders and a silver shawl casually draped underneath it to add a little bit of contrast to his dark image. His glossy and soft silver hair was left as it is since he looked perfect no matter how he was done. He was just impeccable like that. While Adira wore a black empire waist gown that hugged her voluptuous body before it fell straight down to the floor like waterfalls and golden scales sitting atop her, shoulders connected by little dangling golden chains hanging off her open back. Completed with a black chiffon Watto train on her back as well as golden with sapphire stones hair ornaments, also connected in thin chains, they fixed on her ashen locks. This royal family of three exuded perfect elegance as they matched perfectly well under the wife's orders, to which the boys happily humored her with. To Heisa, it didn't matter if he matched with his father as long as he also matched with his beloved mother. And to Kasimi, well, needless to say, he will always go along with what makes Adira happy, because this woman deserved all the happiness in the world, so he will give everything to her. Then they proceeded together to the hall after they finally escaped the crowd of servants that gathered around them and rained them with praises. As they proudly entered the hall and seized everyone's attention, Kasimi suddenly whispered into Adira's ears, 
I finally get to escort you after countless failed attempts. Kasumi commented with mirth in his voice that made Adira giggle softly. It was true indeed that he finally was able to escort her to a ball after they kept missing the chance. Well, you better do a good job then, husband. She whispered to him which earned her a smug smirk from him before he replied with, I will do it perfectly, my wife. Their type of entertain was a bit different from the one they were used to back at the Empire. Here, they had a sideshow of dancing women clothed in skimpy sequined cabaret bras with fringes and free-flowing panel skirts of different shades of color. A woman, who seemed to be their best dancer, had a solo stage that entranced almost every man in the hall. Adira was just entertaining a ridiculous thought that maybe Kasumi was also into that when she turned to him and saw how focused he was on the woman dancing and swaying, her hips alluringly and winked towards his way. She clawed at her armrest when Kasumi also showed a small smile right after that woman's wink. The nerve of this bastard. She furiously stood up and walked away which finally snatched this man's attention and he followed after her. He was just in time to hear her order a servant to fetch her a costume just like the woman dancing in the middle and the latter hurriedly scurried away. The mistress didn't look too happy and she feared she might get caught in their crossfire. Adira, what are you doing? Oh, what am I doing? I plan to show you what a real dance looks like. I will dance to the point that you can't tear your eyes off me and seduce you till you will want to die in your seat. So sit back and enjoy the performance, husband. She spoke with a deadly calmness in her voice that even though she was smiling, you could also vaguely see her veins popping from her anger. And is that a demon's mask illusion behind her angelic face? Before she left the man, who was lost and confused with her words, why she was doing it, and why she looked incredibly mad. What was it that he did? Well, the truth of the matter was, Kasumi was just blankly looking ahead of him while his mind returned to earlier when they just arrived. He was reliving his joy and happiness at seeing his wife being jealous over the lady servants, who could only adore him from afar. That made a smile break out into his cold and stoic face, which, unfortunately, coincided with the dancer winking at him. Hence, the misunderstanding. So he could only return to his seat, still very much confused, and settle down uncomfortably. It might have been a bit late but, didn't she say she'd seduce me, in front of all these guests? No. They're not allowed to see that side of her. Kasumi bolted up and was about to hurry up and stop Adira from her plan when the soon-to-be king of Bycrest Kingdom suddenly arrived in front of him. My deepest apologies, Prince Kasumi, for not being able to meet you, myself, and for being very late on my own banquet. There were some minor issues that needed my immediate attention, you see. Yes, I understand. I didn't mind it so it's fine. Kasumi tried to keep their conversation short so he could hurry up to Adira but this king was persistent. My, the rumors were true indeed. The first prince of the Vesilus Empire really is a man of few words. He cackled before striking a series of new conversations with Kasumi and kept him still in his spot unable to move or leave. Until an announcement of a surprise event where a guest was to showcase a dance herself, once again seized the guest's attention and, of course, Kasumi's nervous regard. All eyes turned to the big and heavy red curtains before it was pulled away slowly and revealed a woman, with long ash locks flowing down her back, donned in white sheer fabric above a golden cabaret bra with moon ornaments on her chest, along with the signature ruby trinkets of the Bycrest Kingdom all over her alluring and transcendental figure. She was even wearing on her arms the same crest the soon-to-be king was also wearing on his wrist. Now, it looked as if she was his pair instead of Kasumi's and this aroused unnecessary rumors among the guests. But none of it reached Adira's ears. All that mattered to her was to fixate Kasumi's gaze on her and only her. Cause she planned to seduce him till he'll beg her to stop. Watch me well, Kasumi. Notes. Don't you just love it when Adira suddenly goes crazy and does something crazier when she gets jealous for nothing? LOL, I love it. Anyway. Thank you so much for the love and support always guys tilde I loves yous. Banzo i.e. tilde tilde. Bewitching. A flicker of her hand, a wave of her hips, a brief seductive glance from that glittery and fiery ash-like eyes and a beautiful and teasing smirk on her lovely face. The woman did stick to her word. She was seducing, enticing, 
and enchanting every guest inside that hall, man or woman, they couldn't tear their eyes away from her bewitching dancing form. It was like they were spellbounded to offer every single speck of their attention to her. The men couldn't help the fire rising up within them as their eyes followed her every move. The dancer wasn't looking or even as much as glance at them which made them thirst for her regard. They wanted her to look at them even just once. And there were few guests mixed in them that vaguely recognized the dance. It looked like a dance native to the Bycrest Kingdom but at the same time not. There were far too many modifications for it to remain as a dance that solely belonged to Bycrest. It was far more ravishing and beautiful. Adira continued to sway her hips and twirl around the dance floor with the melody while also modifying the dance that was hammered, tortured and battered into her from her past life to please the devil that imprisoned and used her. Because to her, this dance wasn't a thorn anymore. She was using it as a weapon to punish her husband that dared to smile at another woman that was clearly trying to entice him. Kasumi was gripping at his own armrest while getting angrier and chillier by the second especially when he was gravely aware how everyone's eyes were currently glued to his troublemaker of a wife, who was punishing him for some unknown reason. Not only that, he was trying real damn hard to keep himself still and control himself from getting a reaction. He was struggling so much he felt like dying. Adira was really creating a headache for him and Kasumi was having trouble trying to keep it in. Until such that the man reached the end of his patience, which didn't even take five minutes, when he couldn't hold it in and with an angry shout his chair's armrest also broke under his tight hold. Stop! Kasumi bellowed so loudly his voice reverberated across that large hall, snapping everyone out of their trance. Panting and very red in the face, Kasumi stomped forward towards the woman that only smacked at him while planting a hand to her hips. He ripped his jacket off his back and wrapped it around Adira's very exposed figure, which was supposed to be only for his eyes but she just went ahead and showed it to the world while still looking very mad yet with a tinge of victory and pulled her incredibly closer to him she was practically plastered against his hot body. What is she on about? That's enough. He spoke in an eerie low and agitated voice. Adira, who refused to back down as well, cupped the man's cheeks with one hand before whispering to him. Then you should do well not to stare and smile at other women from now on, husband. Stare? Smile? Since when did I ever stare and smile at another woman? You were staring at that dancer earlier. Adira shot back, still angry, and stood her ground. No amount of fury or bitter wintry gaze from Kasumi could bring her down and make her submit. Partially because she was damn sure Kasumi would surrender to her instead. That was how it always was. Figuring that they would not get to the bottom of it properly while still standing here in the middle of the hall, Kasumi suddenly bent down, picked up Adira and slung her over his shoulders. Put me down, you fiend. Leecher. Pervert. Cheater. Adira flailed but still tried to keep her voice soft so as not to cause the commotion she started to flare up. Is everything all right, Prince Kasumi? Adira heard a voice that made her stop and freeze, speak to Kasumi. Yes. Forgive us for cutting halfway through your banquet, but it seems my wife and I have some straightening out to do. It's fine. Marriage does have bumps along the road. I hope you can fix it soon. Kasumi vaguely replied and politely gave the man a small nod before turning a little bit to beckon Heiser over so they could go back. The child tottered towards them after seeing his father gesture for him and walked beside them. While Adira just behaved and tried not to see the man Kasumi just spoke with. But he was staring at her while Kasumi carried her and she saw those vivid amber eyes again, those same eyes that always haunted her both past and present. It's his. Coronation. It seems no matter how much she changed some events from her first cycle of life, some things were just bound to happen no matter what. And he waved her farewell, with a smile on his face, before the doors shut on them. Kasumi was concentrating on his self-control and temper that it took him a while before he noticed Adira's silence. He adjusted her so he could carry her properly in a princess carry and then saw her horrified expression. Thinking that he must have scared her, Kasumi internally panicked while thinking of ways how to pacify and comfort her. I, I am not mad, my wife. He blurted out that snapped Adira out of her stupor. Um. What? Ah. Uh. Okay. Kasumi studied how she looked too disconcerted and asked her, is something else wrong? Nothing. I just... 
I just don't wanna lose you, Casey. I'm sorry. It's just. The more you pamper me. The more I want to possess you, to have you all to myself so much I easily get drunk with jealousy. I'm sorry I turned out to be such a green-eyed monster that only brings you troubles. Kasimi listened to his wife ramble on and cutely buried her head on his chest. And with every word that she let go, he could feel his heart swell with extreme happiness. He felt incredibly happy when she was being jealous and possessive over him. If she wanted, she could even chain him to her and he wouldn't say a single complaint. Because, wouldn't it also mean that he could chain her to him as well? So isn't it a win-win situation? He planted a kiss on her head, to her eyes, and cheeks before locking lips with her to somehow express to her how much he loved her no matter what. I'm pretty sure you're getting jealous over nothing but you can be as possessive as you want and you don't need to apologize for it. You can be the most hideous green-eyed monster and I will still love you no matter what you become. You're the only one who can make me feel like this, my wife. No one else. Kasimi, no matter how many times it took, reassured his wife brimming with unsolicited insecurities. And even though he didn't know where it was all stemming from, all he could do was love her so much those insecurities will die out by themselves. He can only wash them away with his overwhelming and overflowing love for her. And besides, no one can ignite such blazing fire in a cold man like me like the way you arouse me. Kasimi whispered with a smirk which earned him a light slap from his blushing wife before she turned slightly to check if Heisa heard anything. Notes. Hey, 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 lol to those who get that, I love you. Anyway, is it just me or did I just make Kasimi dirtier and dirtier? Lol. Anyway, you don't mind it, right? So thank you as usual am I lovelies. I always have a lot of fun reading your comments so keep em coming. Banza I. My hero. You were staring at that dancer though. Adira mumbled in a pout as her husband carried her in his arms and the latter could only raise his brows in utter confusion. Well, I did stare at you tonight. I'm talking about the woman before me. Kasimi stopped to think about this woman Adira was saying he was staring at, which started this whole fiasco, but couldn't even remember what she looked like. I don't remember this dancer that you're speaking of. Don't lie to me, Kasimi. I clearly saw you staring at her and then smiling oh so handsomely. Don't you dare make a fool out of me, Adira said as she punched the man's chest angrily. It was one thing to stare at another woman and another when he tries to lie when she clearly caught him. I wasn't staring at her. Maybe I looked like I was but I wasn't looking at her. Damn, I don't even remember what she looked like. I was thinking about something else. He defended himself against his wife's accusations and straightened things up once and for all. Though he loved seeing Adira jealous of the women around him, who didn't even cross his line of sight, he didn't want her thinking he was cheating on her. Even if he bet his life on it, he knew very well that he would never be able to cheat on Adira. What could you've been thinking of that made you smile like that? Huh? She clutched his collars and pulled herself up to his face to somehow try and intimidate him, though she knew it was a futile attempt. But Kasumi only smirked at her burning ash-like eyes before stealing for himself a kiss on those sweet cherry lips before answering her in a suave manner. You. And the woman, even after they've been together for so long and still hopelessly weak to that smile, could only blush, melt and surrender in his embrace. I hate you. I love you too. Kasumi chuckled softly at the cuteness of his wife before he felt someone kick him in his Achilles heel. He peered down and saw Heisa pouting his cheeks in jealousy. It seems their son had reached his limit of allowing him to monopolize her. But not yet. He still wants her in his arms just for a little bit longer. Mommy's tired so daddy is taking care of her. Daddy's bullying mommy, baby. Avenge me, my hero. Adira retorted to Kasumi's words and, once again, played the damsel in distress, but now, to Heiser. And this adorable little dragon puffed his chest out and started to attack Kasumi's back, which of course did not hurt him at all. They had such a very happy and warm atmosphere around their little family that made it difficult for anyone to cut in their conversation so everyone left them alone. So the next few days, Heiser had complete monopoly of Adira's time and attention due to Kasumi having some business with the newly crowned king, his royal majesty king raiding Captain A.S. Steer Bikerest, and his constituents. They visited many shops, played around a lot, bought loads of stuff for Kasumi, Heiser and also her brother, 
father and mother. She bought souvenirs for all of them. As usual, Alexander accompanied them when Casimir was away and Roman accompanied the man when the wife was away. But on their last day of visiting the Bycrest kingdom, the king threw a tea party for his guests that came for his coronation. It was just a simple party held on one of the castle gardens. But truly, it was just another socialization and fostering connections with other noble families under the guise of a party. Adira stepped out of the stuffy social circle of those haughty nobles with Heisa and went to the bridge near the garden they held the party in. It was a tall bridge and, just looking at the strong rivers below, it was an absolutely terrifying sight to see. Feeling lightheaded, Adira stepped away from the edge and accidentally hit someone. I'm so, hello, princess. You your majesty. Adira almost blurted out a curse when she, fortunately, got a grip of herself immediately and curtsied stiffly instead. However, it didn't slip anybody's eyes the way she trembled while facing this man. Did I perhaps? Do anything that you didn't like, princess? Raiden asked carefully. It wasn't the first time that she bumped into him and trembled this bad. If he did her wrong, he hoped she would let him apologize for whatever it was. Oh. Um. No, your majesty. I just. Maybe I just had too much coffee this morning. Adira lied as she averted her gaze away and even as she tried to stop the shivers, she couldn't. Her body remembered every single torture she suffered on his hold. Oh. Please, be careful over there. He tried to reach out to her to pull her away from the bridge's edge, when she flinched away and felt incredibly nauseous when he approached her. Trying to find her balance, she tried to stabilize herself by leaning on the bridge a little bit. Little did she know that by stepping away from this man, though unconsciously, she neared the edge and slipped through the outer edge of the bridge and fell out. It was a little bit high of a drop and Raiden rushed forward in an attempt to catch her but it was her that didn't want to be held by him. Hi sir, wide-eyed and shocked with the sudden turn of events, was overcome with alarm. He couldn't turn into a dragon there since Adira strictly told him not to turn into one in public especially now that they were on foreign grounds. So, he could only turn to the other person that could definitely save his mother. F.A. Father, Kasimi, who was talking to a few noble heirs and heads of their own household, heard a very distressed, high-pitched and childish voice cry that seized his attention. And the first he saw was Heiser's alarmed expression while pointing at something below the bridge where he stood and his missing wife. He felt as if his world darkened or blacked out when a scary thought pervaded in his mind. It couldn't be that his wife. Mommy. Mommy fell down. After being frozen momentarily with fear and shock, he ran towards the child. And while he was approaching, he saw the king attempting to stop a man but the latter jumped in anyway. What do you think you're doing showing yourself? Raiden caught the golden-eyed man's arms, who only glared at the king, to ask him as well as stop him. She can't swim. He cried, which reached Casimir's ears, and yanked his arm from Raiden's hold and jumped down. He beat Kasumi into rescuing Adira as the latter could only feel his rapidly beating heart and his overflowing fear while watching the man save his wife. He hurriedly ran down to the bank near the river where the man swam to and reached out his hand to help them up. Adira lost consciousness, maybe from the fall or from fear or from something else, but she was breathing fine so it was a load off Kasumi's chest. Thank. Kasumi looked up from his wife to thank the noble that saved her when who he saw made him pause. Leon, notes, I'm sorry for being absent for a while, I was a little bit busy being lazy, lol, no, really, I was busy with school so I couldn't find time, anyway, I look forward for your comments my lovelies, okay, love you guys, banzai, a life for a life, mommy, your highness, is the princess, okay, your highness, what happened to the mistress? Heiser, Roman, and Alex both rushed towards them. Both of the men quickly assumed their attack stances when they saw who emerged from the water with their princess while the child went to warm his mother up immediately. What are you doing here? What have you done to her? Roman and Alexander both interrogated the man, who was supposed to be back at their empire still in a coma, but was sitting there across them and happened to rescue their princess. What's happening? Stand down, Alex, Roman. He still saved Adira. A life for a life. They heard Casimir's voice command them before they relaxed their stance. But, 
that didn't mean they were not hostile with him anymore. Also, even when their prince sounded relaxed, the glare and the frost in his eyes says otherwise. Here, in front of him, was a man too obsessed with his wife that he almost damned her to hell. He could not forget that no matter how long it took or no matter what he did, just because he saved Adira, doesn't wipe all the sins he had done against her and the crown. This was just a one-time thing. He'll close his eyes about seeing him here in exchange for rescuing Adira from drowning. However, even when both of Alex and Roman's blades were almost at his neck already, Leon's eyes were still fixated on Adira's unconscious form. Raiden, trying to distract the trio's attention away from Leon, approached Kasumi and offered them a room in the palace for the princess to rest. Thank you, King Raiden. No. It's partly my fault after all, Prince Kasumi. I will also send the best palace doctor to your room to take a look at the princess. We can't take chances. Kasumi only nodded and, once again, offered his gratitude before turning his back on Leon's frozen outstretched hand. Your Highness, do you think that was the best decision? To let that man go free? Roman questioned the aberrance of Kasumi's too mild decision. If it were the usual him, he'd have drawn his sword right then and there and shed blood even if they were on foreign land. Especially since the wife was out cold and cannot see this gruesome spectacle. Nothing should have stopped him. He saved Adira's life, Roman. I'm just repaying that debt. Yes, but wasn't he the one who endangered her life the last time? And I've paid that by almost killing him as well. Casimir then turned his frosty eyes towards Roman's way and shut him up. He wasn't in the mood to discuss about Leon when he still hadn't heard from the doctor, who went in to go and check his wife. What's taking him so long? He groaned before leaning his head on both of his palms before they combed his hair up expressing his utter frustration at being practically useless when Adira's life was in danger. The door then creaked open and Kasumi was already up his seat, wordlessly asking the doctor that came out how was his wife's condition. The elderly doctor took one look at Kasumi's haggard and worried face before giving the man a big gummy smile and shook his hands. Congratulations, your highness. The princess bears your child. He announced and it floored everyone present in the room, which was only Kasumi, Heiser, Roman, and Alex. But the former was too stunned that he couldn't stop shaking the doctor's hands while still trying to wrap his mind around this old man's words. It couldn't be that his just being a senile old man and mistakenly gave him the wrong diagnosis, right? A child. Did you just say a child? Yes, your highness. The princess's nausea, fatigue and other symptoms were because of her pregnancy. So please bear with her if she starts to crave for different things or becomes too moody from now on. The elderly doctor kindly informed Kasumi of the possible changes in his wife's attitude and wants. Roman and Alex were the first to snap out of it before the former beamed and congratulated Kasumi with a bright aura around him as well. It was as if all the bloodlust that these two held a while ago were nothing but an illusion as it was quickly wiped away with extreme happiness from this big and wonderful news. I is it fine to see the princess now, doctor? Alex asked for the silent Kasumi, who was still stunned out of his wits. Sure, she's already up and fine so you better go in and talk with her, your highness. The doctor slightly bent his old and cranky body while giving way to this completely frozen prince. It was Heiser who made him take a step, by pulling him by his hand, after getting tired of him just standing and gawking there like a statue. Mommy? Baby? The woman, who was sitting comfortably on the bed, turned to them from staring at the outside world and smiled. Ayadira. Yes, Casey? I is it true? You? You're pregnant? W.I. with my child? The man repeated slowly, still unable to believe it even when he heard it from himself. It still felt like a very, very beautiful phantasm. Adira's hands then moved to her belly as she softly caressed it before turning back to her husband with teary ashen eyes and answered him with a pretty smile. It seems so, husband. Kasumi carefully and gingerly wrapped the woman inside his arms, incredibly happy about this news but also extremely scared at how fragile she must be now that it wasn't. Only her. Hi sir. Is something the matter, baby? The woman noticed the child still standing by the door and just staring at them. It was his turn to be frozen solid by this news now. It had a different effect on him when he heard it from his mother herself. And then suddenly, large beads of tears fell from this beautiful child's sapphire eyes. Am I?
Am I not mommy's baby anymore? Because mommy already has a new baby. Adira's heart twinged painfully at hearing the little child's anxiety and fear that she could only sigh helplessly before softly beckoning him over. When the child arrived at her bedside, she engulfed him in a soft and warm motherly embrace before petting his silky and smooth raven hair softly coaxing him. Heisa will always be mommy's baby. This new baby only means that Heisa will be a big brother soon. It means that you need to protect your little sister or brother. I can count on you, right? Adira asked to which the child replied with a gentle bob of his head before adding, UN. I will protect the baby with my life. Thank you, big brother Heisa, is what your little sibling said. And mommy says that big brother Heisa also needs to protect his own life. Because mommy will be really, really sad. The child cheered up and pumped his fists animatedly getting fired up with his new mission. To protect the newest addition to their little family. Notes. Happy 111 chapters to us. So to celebrate the triple numbers, here's a lovable chapter for everyone tilde tilde. What do you think will be the baby's gender? Comment your thoughts, my lovelies. Banzai, the little surat. The loud slamming of the door rang on Iris desolate, dark and empty room as she leaned her whole weight against the door and slowly slid to the floor. The red and warm patch on her cheek barely visible against the moonlight that poured in from her windows. The stinging pain taking her back to when she visited her father, who was locked up in jail. Father, I brought you something you might want to eat. I I baked it myself. She timidly offered the sweets and pastry to her disheveled looking father. His hair was tousled messily and his beard had slovenly grown. Gone were his prim, clean and proud look as a baron. He had been degraded to such. Shifting his piercing and angry glare towards his daughter, he swiped everything she made for him off the table and mocked her. Instead of doing something this unnecessary, why don't you focus more on seducing the first prince, you useless imbecile? He barked that made the girl flinch and retreat in her seat. He had always been like that calling her derogative names and making sure she never forgot her place, why she was there and why she was even given the chance to live a luxurious life, far from the life that she used to have that was no better than a surat. For what purpose did I create you, you phony maiden of light, if you can't even serve your purpose? Yes, that's right. Iris is not the maiden of light. In fact, she believes that fabled woman does not exist at all. She was a product of countless experiments that also claimed countless of women's lives. The people who made her, a couple of barons, which of course included her foster father, Baron Latifolia, and earls and a few Marquis, with which the most well-known was Marquis Devich, exhausted every method they could think of, till the baron stumbled upon a little stray girl with empty eyes and empty mana. She had nothing. No parents, no family no magic and no love, she was a girl born with nothing. And so, she was perfect. Then he took her back and they unwittingly performed their series of rituals and experimented on her until they successfully created her. A girl who can manifest the same fabled light sword magic as the legendary queen or as the handful of scriptures that spoke of this maiden said. She was the perfect weapon. She was their leverage. She was their trump card. Once the people knew of her as the Maiden of Light then surely they would love her. They would worship her and lift her up to take the Empress throne that's been vacant for decades. Iris, at first, didn't like being experimented on. Though she had nothing in her, at least she had her individuality and sanity. But as they told her stories about this woman, how she had everything she was depraved of, she began to want that life. She wanted to be her. And so every day, she would tell herself. I'm the maiden of light, beloved by everyone, the prophesied queen, the woman who will take it all in the end. I am the legend everyone's been waiting for. Every single day, she would look herself at the mirror and tell that mantra to the girl reflected in them. It was what kept her going. Until, she eventually fooled even herself. That was why, when she saw the infamous Lady Silveris, that everyone was whispering softly about, she couldn't help the jealousy bubbling up inside her little heart. She, who had everything handed to her on a silver platter, and her who had nothing. It corrupted her little by little till she allowed it to consume her entirely. It was the life that she wanted, surrounded with overflowing warmth, love and affection, with loving parents behind her, a handsome and capable brother that pampers her to no end, 
a man who would look straight into her eyes and tirelessly show her his undying love. This woman was living the life that was supposed to be hers. How dare she? She grew to hate Adira to the deepest pit of her black-tainted heart. She hated how, out of everyone that she knew and saw, she was the closest to possibly being the maiden of light. And how the place seems to brighten up when she walks in and everyone cannot ignore her presence. She always hated that light and warmth that she brings with her. Or what? Don't tell me you actually thought you were the real maiden of light. Have you possibly forgotten how everything about you is nothing but an illusion? How? Once you strip down all that facade, all that's left is a little street rat I chanced upon. I know. I know that. You. Don't need to remind me. Silence, you slut. How dare you raise your voice against me? Baron Latifolia rose from his seat and gave the girl a strong slap that had his every bit of force, frustration, and anger packed in them. How dare this wench try to go against me, the very person that created her out of nothing? I'm... I'm sorry, father. If you are then begone and do your job properly, you bitch. And with that, the Baron pivoted on his heel and went back to his small and creaking bed on the corner, still fuming, while the girl just silently exited his cell. After picking up the pastries her father thrashed, and headed home. Shifting the blame for all the misfortunes that befell her to Adira, she finally decided on the one thing she could never crawl back out of again. She had gone too deep in hell to even hope for salvation at this point. So she was dragging that hateful woman with her, if it's the last thing she'd do. If I can't have what I want, then neither are you. Iris pledged in her heart before grabbing her cloak and, once again, left the safe place she had been residing in venturing out on this cold, dark night. Back on the little royal family, who had to extend their stay on Bikerest for a few more days, Adira was finally let out of the room and intended to bask in the sun and relax. If not for her husband that made a fuss on everything she did, he had completely left his work as an ambassador on Roman's hands as he accompanied Adira wherever she went. Casey, seriously, you're annoying me. She finally tried to shoo the man away and briskly walked away. But Casimir had longer legs, so he had longer strides and immediately caught up with her. Don't walk too fast. Seriously. I mean it. Shoo. No. Go away. While Alexander, who was left to look after the little raven-haired child, could only sigh as he looked at this married couple still being silly even on foreign grounds. Heisa looked up to him after briefly tearing his eyes away from his mother and back to her again, who was still trying to get his father to leave her alone. Are they fighting? He asked. No, they're not, little prince. They're... Hum, I'm... Not too sure. Alex took back his words while watching Kasumi suddenly pick Adira up in his arms and carried her over to a shade before placing her down. You stay here. Don't stay too long out in the sun. I'll get the servants to bring some refreshments out here. Just please behave, my wife. Kasumi scolded Adira which caused tears to well up on her eyes. She was indeed becoming moody, snappy and often dislikes having Kasumi hover around her. However, if the man decides to do what she wants and stay away, then she'll snap at him and attack him out of nowhere. I'm sorry. It's my fault. I did not mean to scold you. Please stop crying now. And as quick as a snap. Casimir bends the knee and pacifies his whining wife, trying to coax her like a spoiled little brat. Adira always stops whenever he does that though so it was all good. It was like now that her hormonal balance were off, she was acting more willful and cuter. As well as starting to display her affections for Casimir out in the open. Kiss me and then maybe I'll stop. She demanded. Casimir could only chuckle at his adorable wife and kissed her full on her cherry red lips before her tears finally stopped. When Alexander was sure that the two was already done with their everyday drama, he brought Heisa closer to them before setting out to find a servant and relay Casimir's orders. Not long after, Alex came back with servants that brought lots of cakes and pastry for the pregnant woman and the little gluttonous monster to feast on. Casimir, after all, wasn't a sweet tooth like this mother and son pair. However, he enjoyed watching them relish the sweets. A servant caught up to the others, while carrying this white box, and gave it to Adira while saying, Someone asked me to give these to you, princess. They said you loved them. 
Adira took the box and opened it to find the same cakes Rame got from her favorite store at Baron Niveria's Fief and brought back some for her. It made a sweet smile decorate her lovely facial features as she turned to Kasumi. It must be my brother. Only he knew how much I loved these cakes. She exclaimed which only caused a frown on the man's handsome face, as if telling her how much he disagrees to her words. Wrong. I know it as well. In fact, I could list down everything that you like right now. And I would be on top of that list. It's me. I'm the one on top. Heisa inserted indignantly. He wasn't allowing his father to take his spot as his mother's favorite. I actually know them too. Alexander, although silently, softly whispered in his heart who refused to give that particular round up. Fine, fine. You know it very well. Adira laughed before placing the cakes among the array of other pastries as well. They were enjoying the sweets with happy hearts when suddenly, that happiness was nipped at the root that caused everything to crumble down as the little child suddenly coughed out blood and fell from his seat. Hi sir. Notes. I know you hate me for this. Anyway, a little heads up for everyone, since from now on, I'll be burdened with consecutive exams, I'll have less a chance to update. So please, bear with me. Thank you. Banzai. P.S. Let's try and get to a hundred comments this time. Love you. Ten days. It's been a week since Heisa fell unconscious, a week since Adira ordered Alexander to find the demon that put her child in this state. A week since Adira erected a flaming barrier that burnt anyone she didn't want going near her child. So, in other words, it was only Kasumi, Alexander, Roman, and the doctors, who were allowed to go through her barrier. She had been on her child's bedside since day one and refused to leave, not even when Kasumi asks her to change shifts and let her rest. There was that time when Kasumi tried to move her to a bed so she could rest properly but she burnt him instead and gave him a fiery glare. Since then, Kasumi learned never to remove Adira from her son's side. Kasumi passed through the barrier of flames and approached the sleeping woman hunched over Heisa's side. She was very pale and the bags under her eyes were very visible that served as proof of how weary she had become since Heisa fell ill. The doctors of the Bycrest Kingdom diagnosed Heisa as being poisoned by this peculiar poison, from an unknown origin, that kills the host after 10 days. However, though they know what was poisoning Heisa, they didn't know the cure to it. Albeit, King Raiden said the Maiden of Light's power could detoxify whatever poison was killing the child. Adira could kneel in front of Iris and beg her to save Heisa's life but Kasumi stopped her, saying that a queen should never bow to anyone and that she should, instead, compel the woman to cure her son. But Adira knew Iris would never do that. No matter what she did, she knew Iris would never help her. This was Iris, the woman who's hated her even from her first life. Casey? Adira stirred awake and rubbed her tired eyes before sitting up straight. I'm sorry I woke you up. You need to rest more, Adira. That won't do any good to both of our children. Even if I try, I can't, Casey. I always see Heiser's crouched form as he continued to cough out blood before he eventually fell down. All I could see when I closed my eyes is my little boy's suffering. Adira slowly shared the traumatic image of her son falling as tears spilled down from her tired and puffy ashen eyes and sobs racked her worn-out body. Her husband took her into his warm fold and tried to comfort her silently. Even though he knew how strong his wife was, he was also painfully aware that her sole weakness was her heart for her family. And he knew that this incident had hit her too hard and at the spot where it hurt her the most. He must make sure he finds the one who did this to his son who caused such heartache to their family and he will make sure he'll hurt them a hundred times more. Oh, he won't kill them. That is too mild of a punishment and too quick. He will make sure they suffer so bad they'll wish he just outright killed them. Cradling his woman in his arms, who fell asleep from extreme exhaustion, a deadly glint coruscated on his icy platinum eyes. Raiden visited the Vasilis room, but couldn't get past through Adira's burning barrier. So he opted to say his piece from the outer wall instead. Kasumi had briefly stepped outside and so, Adira was sitting alone with her son. Princess, if it helps, I'd like to tell you a legend. He started but Adira did not answer nor even turn to acknowledge him although he kind of expected that. Regardless, the man continued, there was a legend that was passed down to our royal heirs. A maiden, so fair, beautiful, kind and strong, 
who was our ancestor, was given the title of Maiden of Light. It was because like a warm beacon of light, she guided her people to prosperity, peace and healed them from their troubles. They say that this maiden, did not only have the light sword magic, but also the ability to attract all attributes towards her and also the power to devour anything and everything if she so desired. All she had to do was wish for it to happen and the gods will be at her beck and call for she was their most beloved daughter. Raiden finished and studied the unchanging expression on the mother's face. It was too empty and stoic as she continued to watch over the child. I'm not saying the gods don't love us, but we never know what a little prayer could do. Especially you. The man continued to encourage Adira and barely whispered the tail end of his sentence. He needed to provoke her into saying a prayer. To witness her bloom into the full-fledged maiden of light. To see her realize what she was all along. Show me a good debut performance, O oh Miss Beloved Child of the Heavens. He didn't how know how long it took before Adira finally twitched and moved gently to reach out for her little child's hands. There was nothing to lose with a little prayer, right? The gods will help her save her son, right? Please, I beg you, whichever god is listening right now, save Hysa. Adira whispered against Hysa's hand and closed her eyes. She knew it was futile although she was a believer. However, she still chose to believe that the gods would help her. Sadly, nothing happened and Hysa was still asleep and unresponsive. So the woman could only cry in pain and sorrow. She couldn't help but question the way she cared for Hysa. Was it enough? Did she lack anywhere? Where did she go wrong? Why did this happen to her son? Why Hysa? Alexander finally returned after investigating and tracing where the poison came from. After his extensive investigations, he found that it was from the cakes the Lord Silverus, or so they thought, gave to the princess. And Alex wasn't even the least bit surprised when he found out whose doing it was, because the cake was never meant to reach Hysa. It was always meant for Adira. Hysa just unfortunately took the first bite out of it and suffered instead. Passing through the barrier the woman made after ignoring the king of Bycrest, who oddly and awkwardly stood still outside the barrier, the knight knelt down to deliver his report. I found the person who sent the poison, princess. They are currently at the border town between Bycrest and Vasilis. What are your orders? Take me there, was Adira's cold and deep response before her fires turned whitish blue. I'll personally burn them to ash. Notes. Hi Tilda so my new updating schedule might be weekly now since my weekdays are always loaded with exams. Anyway, still looking forward for your comment guys Tilda love YA. Banzai? A mother's fury. Adira and Alex journeyed across the towns as fast their horses could go and miraculously, what would usually take three and a half day worth of travel, reached the border town in two days. The Adira of then was purely fueled with her extreme anger and adrenaline that was pushing her past her limits. And Alexander could not even dare to lag behind her or make her stop to rest. Upon reaching the town, which was a part of the Vasilis Empire, Alexander led Adira to the culprit after meeting up with his informant and supplying him with necessary info. He had left someone to watch over this person to make sure they cannot escape again. The air felt incredibly heavy and hot as Adira walked past a few citizens that made it terribly hard to breathe. The heat was too odd considering that they were almost entering winter season. The person sitting over there, under that ragged dirty brown cloak, is the person you are searching for, princess. Alexander informed Adira while he held out an open palm towards the cloaked person, who faced their back against Adira. The woman thought that she would be able to, at least, retain a bit of her sanity and reason when faced with the person that poisoned her child, that she might be able to, rise above her hatred and be the better person. But, hell no. Everything inside her just snapped when she saw the very object of her fury and rushed towards them in one quick leap. Thrusting out a hand, she threw the person over her shoulders in one strong and fluid movements before driving a knee towards their torso and kicking them away. Following up with a series of body blows, a kick to the chin and to the side of their head. Seeing that the person was still struggling to get up, she stalked towards their hunched figure before once again kicking their torso that sent them rolling away. By now, Adira was sure she had broken numerous bones inside that gangly figure. As each move was made with the intent to slowly break them and rob them of the strength to even fight back. They do not deserve a swift end. The person was surprisingly light and soft. 
and as she tossed the person away once again, the hood finally came down and revealed Iris' face contorting in endurance of extreme pain from being tossed and clobbered, around by Adira. It's you. Adira's voice was low and chilly. It didn't surprise her to see that disgusting face anymore. But what she did not understand was why she had to drag Heiser into her hate for her. Time and time again, I tried to be the better person and ignored you. Countless of times. But you continue to hackle me. And now? Now, you hurt my child. Your actions brought upon me ungodly amounts of rage. I will definitely burn you till nothing, not even your bones, are left. Adira once again extended her hand and caught the woman's face, defenseless and couldn't even get a defense up and ignited her whitish blue flames, slowly and painfully burning the woman's face. The smell of scalding flesh pervaded around the place that the gallery couldn't help but act in order to help the poor screaming and agonizing woman bullied to death by someone stronger than her. Because they didn't know what exactly made Adira blow like this. They all thought that what the lady was doing was entirely unreasonable and cruel. However, as soon as they took their first step, Alexander suddenly slashed at the ground between them and carved a deep line. You are not to disturb my princess. Anyone that so much as takes a single foot across that line will have to face me. He stated before taking his stance that scared the townspeople, a lot of them already feeling their knees almost buckle from under that intense pressure. Here was the red-headed executioner of the empire. They'd have to be an idiot to act against this man especially when he's as serious as that. How can they even possibly land an attack on that man that has slain countless soldiers and generals alike? Hence, they could only pray that the woman's suffering be cut short and surrender her soul to the Grim Reaper because the way the Lady Silverus looked right now, there was no way in hell she was stopping till the woman melts in her hands. And just when they thought that Adira had melted the girl's face to her bones, Cassini arrived just a few minutes behind the Lady Silverus. Adira, the woman, upon hearing her husband's voice, momentarily paused before turning her bloodthirsty gaze towards him. Why is he here? Could it be something happened to Heisa? Heisa, what happened to my son? He's awake. Cassini wasn't there to stop her at all and this flabbergasted the townspeople. How could their prince entirely ignore what his fiancée was doing? Could he not see the woman dangling from the lady's hands with a burnt and melted face? After hearing Casimir's news, Adira promptly let go of Iris and rushed towards Casimir, her body still fiery hot and burning that the moment she touched him, it immediately scalded the man. However, Casimir paid it no mind and instead smiled softly and reassuringly at her. And he's looking for you. Tears steadily fell like rain from Adira's eyes as the news slowly washed the bloodlust, that consumed her, away allowing her to breathe a little bit easier for the first time in a while. But not yet, she cannot relax yet till she sees him with her own eyes. She immediately mounted on her horse without further ado, already forgetting Iris, who fainted from the sheer pain and agony Adira put her through, and sped away. Kasumi casted a cold glance towards the fainted woman and ordered Alexander to take her away to be patched up. Oh, it wasn't over yet. He hasn't destroyed her thoroughly yet. She cannot die just yet. He went after his wife to make sure they could make it back fine. Adira had spent too much energy just by traveling past her limits alone. Now, she had to travel back with the same speed and not even stopping for rest. She's bound to collapse sooner or later. And though this scared Kasumi to no end, he also cannot stop her. He cannot hope to make a worried mother, who's on her way to see her child, slow down. And looking at her racing to get to Heisa even a second earlier, took him back to when he received the news of Heisa waking up. Heisa, in truth, woke up just a few minutes after Adira and Alexander had left. Raiden remained in the child's bedroom, past the barrier, and saw everything that happened. As soon as Adira left a kiss on the child's forehead and hurriedly left in a fit of silent anger, a faint glow of golden light first started on the spot where she kissed him before it slowly crawled down and encased the child's slumbering form. A few minutes of dull glowing and one sudden burst of light that easily filled the room and momentarily blinded Raiden, Heisa's eyes gently fluttered open. He was scanning his surroundings before he carefully pushed himself up and called for the first person that he wanted to see. Mommy? Incredible. How marvelous. 
Raiden whispered to himself softly while feeling those shivers running up his spine that made all the hairs in his body stand up like straight pins. This was the Maiden of Light's prayer, her infamous healing magic capable of healing any ailment. I want this power. I want it. Kasumi cannot have it. Mr. King, where is my mommy? Hi sir, who just noticed the man standing outside the circle of flames that surrounded him, asked his voice ragged and raspy. Oh. I will go ask someone to call your father. And with that, Raiden left the room to order someone to fetch Kasumi and deal with his son. But I want mommy though. Heiser wanted to say but the man was already out the door. Well, he could just ask his father to get mommy or maybe, they were together. After returning to his office, he wrapped his arms around himself to take control of the exciting shivers spreading throughout his body before he laughed out loud. Amazing. To have that chance to see the Maiden of Light's powers up close. And here I thought the prowess she showed on the battlefield was just a fluke. Incredible. I want her. I must have her. He continued to laugh while running his hands up his ebony locks, a manic kind of interest spreading across his bright amber eyes. You're not going back to your empire again, Princess Adira. You're mine, O oh Miss Beloved Child of the Heavens Tilda. While on Kasumi's end, he was tending to a few paperworks that needed his attention and signature when a servant, gasping for breath, told him of the wonderful news. The little prince. He woke up. Kasumi was already up his seat and about to rush to Heisa's room when another servant informed him of the princess being missing. Where did she go? King. King Raiden said. She and her knight went to the town at the edge of the empire, between the Vesilus Empire and Bycrest. The man wasted no time and hurried to Heisa's side to check on him first, and reassure him that he definitely was going to bring his mother back without fail, before he sets out to fetch Adira. Just hang in there a little more. Okay. Yes. Father. Heiser spoke quietly that made Kasumi pause and freeze on his place. It indeed truly felt wonderful to hear your child address you as such. No wonder Adira almost went insane when she first heard Heiser call her mommy. Kasumi could feel a smile spread through his cold visage and left a gentle kiss on the child's head before he left. We'll be back, son. Notes. Here you go tilde tilde before I vanish for a week again. Looking forward to your comments tilde tilde banza a. P.S. Thank you for the support always. Love why guys. P.P.S. A little edit since I noticed a lot of you were having trouble recognizing who the king was. And here I thought I made it obvious. A warning. Adira breezed past countless servants and doctors alike that frantically tried to get her to slow down a bit. But they were talking through deaf ears as the woman almost shoved them out of her way. Princess. Please. Slow down. You are with child. Please take care of your body. They continued to cry while tailing behind her walking straight back to the room where she left her slumbering son. She wasn't in her best mood to deal with them for her reputation and image didn't matter as much as seeing her son healthy and sound. Move. She commanded at Roman, who was standing guard at the door, a bit too harshly than necessary. However, the latter understood her though. This woman before him was a mother that was dying with worry and everyone, constantly crying out for her to stop and slow down, was annoying her relentlessly. That and she hasn't rested well since the little prince's poisoning accident. So, of course, she wouldn't be patient and gentle enough to address anyone. Roman immediately stepped aside and gave room for Adira to pass through him and enter the bedroom where her son's been waiting for her. As soon as she opened the door, Big blue sapphire eyes flicked towards her way and a smile bloomed brightly and happily on his cute little pretty face. He looked like how he usually was whenever he greets her a good morning. Mommy. He beamed before warm and slender arms reached out for him to encase him inside his most favorite embrace. Hi sir. My baby. Mommy. Mommy was so worried you'd leave her. Mommy couldn't protect you. I'm sorry. Adira cried as she tightened the hug making sure the child knew how scared and sorry she was, as she visibly trembled. Mommy doesn't need to apologize. Heisa is not leaving Mommy, because Heisa loves Mommy as much as Mommy loves Heisa. Heisa will always protect Mommy. The child tried to comfort his mother when the arms that kept him plastered against her chest suddenly loosened up and Adira collapsed beside him. Ah! Princess! Adira! Mommy! Kasumi! Heisa! Roman! 
The servants and doctors all exclaimed as the former hurriedly rushed towards her side and picked his wife up, turning his worried gaze towards the doctor, who automatically examined her to check what was wrong. She's merely sleeping. It must have been the exhaustion after being deprived of rest for the past week. Unfortunately, it seems the child she carries is also fine. He informed Kasumi while breathing a sigh of relief himself. Seriously, this royal couple always manages to shave a few years off his life in the short time that he met them. Kasumi felt the tension leave his body slowly before planting a kiss on his wife's head and laid her on the bed to rest comfortably. My wife, why do you love to worry me to death? Adira woke up after a good solid 15 hours of sleep and sluggishly turned to the person that's been softly caressing her hair. How long have you been playing with my hair, husband? With tightly shut eyes, she cutely purred groggily and smiled sweetly while resting her cheeks against the person's cold hand that she snatched. She didn't hear Kasumi respond to her so she peeled her eyes open one by one and found not silver but raven locks and amber eyes staring at her dumbfoundedly. I'm... I'm SS sorry, your majesty. I I I thought you were my husband. Waking up with a shock, Adira sat up straight and cowered away from the man, who should have not been here in the first place, and clearly put her guard up against him. And what is he doing playing with my hair? What the heck's wrong with his brain? Oh. He finally voiced out after seeming as if he was snapped out of a trance and cleared his throat before continuing. I'm sorry. I meant to visit to check how you were doing and found something stuck to your hair. It seems I woke you up and thus you mistakenly snatched my hand. But no harm done. So don't worry, princess. He smoothly lied through his teeth and yet, Adira believed it. When he smiles like that, he really was a far cry from the devil that he was from her past life. But Adira knew better than to let her guard down. She was well aware that it could all be just one big facade that will wear out in due time. Because, he was exactly like this before he took off his mask. Oh, please excuse me for my rudeness, your majesty, but I need you to step out for a moment so I can fix myself. Adira, using polite tone and language, refused to raise her head and look at the man's bright amber eyes. The trauma that she got was too bad that she still cannot help but tremble unconsciously whenever she sees that devious gaze. Raiden, noticing Adira's firm rejection of him and her aloofness, tittered quietly to himself before he gave the woman space and silently left after saying, Then I'll see you later at lunch, princess. Adira, who remained on the bed for a few minutes to collect herself, finally stood up and was about to bathe herself when the doors to her room once again opened and attracted her attention, immediately raising her guard should the person be the psycho from her past again. This time, though, Shiny silver locks popped out from its cracks and platinum eyes looked over to her with relief and happiness. Good morning, my wife. Where were you? How could you leave me all alone here? Do you know how scary it is to not see even a single familiar thing around me the moment I wake up? Were the questions she replied to his greetings. I'm sorry. I momentarily stepped out to check on Heisa, if he was eating properly and well. If I knew you'd wake up at this time, I wouldn't have left. Kasumi briefly panicked as he tried to explain to his wife his comings and goings as concisely as possible to avoid upsetting her and making her think useless doubts. And well, Adira could only pout and sulk. She couldn't retort to anything if her husband was just being a good father to Heiser and making sure he was fine. She, indeed, would have preferred that as well instead of staying by her side all the time while she was out cold. I'm sorry. Was my wife lonely? He cooed her like a little girl which was honestly a bit embarrassing but she was gonna act spoiled for once. I am not necessarily lonely. I just don't like it when you leave me alone for too long. A tilde pregnancy can do great wonders indeed. Who knew my wife could be more cuter than she already is, right? Kasumi peppered the woman like kisses with a slight chuckle as he continued to pamper her. He could have done more if Heisa didn't arrive a few minutes after and seized his wife's attention again. Mommy. Really, every time. The rest of day was spent uneventful, despite the awkward atmosphere at lunch, and she got to relax under the shade of a big tree while having her afternoon tea with Heisa. Mind you, this time, each sweets were thoroughly examined by Kasumi and his subordinates before it was offered to her. He couldn't risk another poisoning incident again and he also cannot take the joy of relaxing tea away from his wife and son. 
It was only her and Heiser enjoying the sweets though as Kasumi had to attend to his neglected job and finish it fast so they could return home. They had been extending their stay for far too long already and any more was starting to feel uncomfortable for the first prince. It was like something was keeping them from departing and returning back to the empire. Adira was enjoying a peaceful tea time with Heiser when the princess of Bycrest, she hadn't seen since they got here, suddenly appeared before her and said, Good afternoon, Princess Adira. This is the first time we've met so I get that you might feel apprehended with my presence. I am Princess Rivian Sito via Aestia, the current king of Bycrest's sister, and I come to you with words of warning. Riv, even in this life, you're still good to me, even when you don't know me that much. I really missed you, cute Rivian. Adira thought to herself as silent tears slowly trickled down her face that surprised the princess of Bycrest and panicked, thinking she might have offended their guest. Di di did I say or do something offending, Princess Adira? No, I'm sorry. I just remembered something sad. What was it that you were saying? Adira quickly dismissed her worry and calmed her down before composing herself as quickly as that. I've come to warn you, Princess. You and your family need to go back now before it's too late. A storm is brewing and getting ready to hit the empire. I do not wish for deaths just because of this stupid maiden of light my brother's been obsessed with. Please, return tonight before you are trapped in here. She quickly warned Adira as softly as she could to avoid the ears that's been keeping her and Adira's family in check. Rivian knew that just saying a few words wouldn't get the princess of the Vasilis Empire to move but she had no choice. She needed to warn her despite her brother's threats. She didn't want her to get swallowed up with his obsession as well. Because he discovered that she was this maiden of light that he's been searching for decades now and he wasn't planning to let her go back. While on Adira's end, who was still oblivious of her true nature, thought that maybe the king of Bycrest heard of what she did to Iris in the heat of the moment and was planning to retaliate. Also, she knew Rivian would never do harm to her. Even from her first life, Rivian was the only person she could confide in when her half-brother decided to lock her away from the world. Thank you for this warning, R.I. Princess Rivian. I greatly appreciate this. Thank you so much. Adira thanked the princess for the urgent warning despite the risks that it entailed before engulfing her in a tight hug for the first and last time since she got reincarnated. She will always be grateful for all the things Rivian had done for her, both present and past life. Turning to grab Heiser and hurry back to Kasumi's side, Rivian could only watch the woman's small back fleeing while feeling warm and sad tears fall from her eyes. Adira. How strange. It feels as though I knew her from a long time ago. Please, goddesses, keep her and the family that she loves safe. Notes. I have been absent for a while now. So sorry for that. I had to face the cruel reality of consecutive exams that I didn't get much free time and motivation to write. But I am very happy to read the comments people left in the various chapters of this story. I hope you will all stay to support SBAPV until the end. Banza A. Tilda. Wake the slumbering demon. After being warned by the princess of Bycrest herself, that night, Kasumi and his family secretly fled in the middle of the night. Adira was especially nervous due to the fact that she had once been imprisoned in that very kingdom with no hope in sight and now, as she makes her way back with her family, she was fervently praying that they would be able to return home safely. After passing through the borders between the two kingdoms and finally laying her sights on the palace growing closer in the far distance, Adira let out a sigh of relief. She was able to return safely. She was home. Kasumi noticed her tensed shoulders slump in obvious relief and relaxation as he leaned forward to reach his hands out and caress the woman's pale face finally, regaining its usual lovely rosy color. Are you okay? What's bothering you? Adira smiled at the uncanny warmth of her husband's touch, and the beautiful worry interlaced in his deep voice. That was exclusively only for her and their little family. She leaned on his touch and held his much larger hands underneath her smaller ones as she softly shook her head and answered, Everything's okay now. I was just unnecessarily worried about how my revenge on the Maiden of Light got us into trouble. About that. My wife, there's something I think you need to know. Kasumi started and tried to break it out to her as gently and calmly as possible. This piece of information, which he thinks that she, herself, doesn't know, was long overdue. She needs to know this part of her identity. 
She deserves that. You. The truth of the matter is that you're. And in that moment, along with their carriage tumbling onto its side was a deafening, loud sound of explosives. Adira reflexively wrapped her arms around Hysa to protect him while the latter tried to protect his little sibling inside his mother's womb after being jolted awake by that loud sound and their tumbling carriage. Kasumi also wrapped both Adira and Hysa inside his arms and immediately asked them if they were okay after their carriage had settled down. Yes, I'm fine. Hysa. Adira groaned in reply and looked down onto Hysa to check if the child was fine. It was then that she noticed how the child had casted a thin protective layer of black mist around them and a thick and heavily concentrated mist around Adira's belly. Hysa. Hysa protected the baby. The little boy spoke when he met his mother's astounded and happy eyes looking proudly down at him as he instinctively prioritized the unborn child's safety. Yes. Now, you're not only mommy's hero but also the baby's hero. Thank you, big brother Hysa. She smiled warmly before planting a kiss on the child's head and Kasumi helped them up. After making sure that there were no casualties among them, the grunts and clanging of swords amongst the mixed cries of inquiry of their status reached their ears. Your Highnesses, Prince Kasumi, Princess Adira, Prince Hysa, Mistress. Are you okay? Move out of my way, you bastards. Your Highnesses, Goo, these bastards just don't die out. They could hear Alexander, Roman, and the other knights try to get to them while also fending off something. Or rather someone. Is it bandits? Soldiers? Did Raiden pursue us? He won't let me go that easily, will he? Adira's thoughts were getting gloomier as she thought about those manic amber eyes that continued to haunt her relentlessly while also feeling a chill coursing up and down her spine. C.A. Casey. I'm... I'm scared. She whispered too softly, as if afraid that any louder than that would lead that man to where she was, that if Kasumi didn't notice her trembling, he wouldn't have heard her little frightened voice. It'll be fine. I'm here. I won't let anything come near you or Hysa. Kasumi reassured his wife. Although he doesn't know where exactly her fear was stemming from, he knew that she was dreadfully terrified of the king of Bycrest. And that was enough reason for him to remove the said man out of her sights and out of her life. No matter if it led to another war, he'll just have to subdue and swallow them whole as he brings their country under the empire's control. Kicking the roof of the carriage down, no matter how sturdy or thick of a wood it was, it crumbled all the same under the might of a pissed-off great demon lord. And sheathing his sword off its scabbard, Kasumi fluidly slashed down all the rogues, with no single wasted movement, that stood frozen in between him and his entourage. Report. He icily spoke while twisting his sword that he stabbed into the last person's chest and ended his poor pitiful life. Roman immediately stepped forward, as if on cue, and reiterated what happened from their point of view, who were a few ways away from their carriage as instructed prior. It seems that a few rogues were lying in wait to ambush the royal's carriage and, after disorienting the demon inside, attempted to finish things cleanly. However, Alexander and Roman were too quick on their feet that they managed to fend off some, that got as close as a few steps away from the tumbled carriage, long enough for the others to catch up and help. The weird thing about these rogues was that they were too skilled and too organized to be just a random bandit group thrown in a group at the last minute as they chanced. Upon the royal family's carriage, Kasumi used the tip of his sword and tore the cloth that hid the dead man's who was the most formidable out of everyone yet was lying lifelessly on his feet, faced to confirm his suspicion and indeed found a familiar profile. His. Roman gasped as he recognized the person. One of Marquis Devich's men. Kasumi finished for his right-hand man. Truly, they have begun to move and even chose the moment when he returned together with his family to make sure he was preoccupied thus tying his hands. How cute. There was the almost forgotten kind of chill in the air as Kasumi turned to address the few men directly under him, he brought with him to Bycrest, and they all stood stiffly in attention when they once again met with the great demon lord of the empire. It seems that I have been silent for far too long that these maggots have dared to step out of their line. Men, the other faction's coup d'etat has begun. From here on out, we must tread carefully back to the palace and ensure the utmost safety of the princess and the little prince. Anyone that so much as dares to show even a little bit of intent to harm, then, 
Casimir's cold voice trailed off but gestured the missing detail in his instructions as he swiftly swiped a finger across his neck and smacked evilly. The final instruction was easy and as clear as the bright sun rays glazing over their lively figures all ready and eager to go chopping and skinning some bastards up. Anyone that dares to harm the Princess Adira and the little Prince Heise can say goodbye to their heads. Yes sir. They simultaneously cried out in confirmation that they understood and heard his command loud and clear. Piss this man off and you're on a one-way ticket straight to hell. Atilda why did they have to go and wake the slumbering docile demon up? When this demon arises, then hell shall descend upon their pitiful lives. Those bastards doesn't seem to learn at all. Notes. Hi Tilda I'm finally back. I am very sorry. My wife, school, had become very demanding of my time which was why I couldn't come and write a new chapter. But today, I managed to escape and finally wrote one. Banzo i.e. Tilda. Then, I'm looking forward to your thoughts again, okay? Love lots Tilda. A hidden lover. Kasimi, together with his little family and his handful of knights, continued to push forward towards the palace. There were a lot of mishaps along the way, like traps, ambushes, and whatnot, but it didn't stop him from slashing and carving his path back to the only safe place he knew would protect his family while he sorted things out. However, as they neared the palace, the knights, mercenaries, and assassins sent to stop their advance, grew more in number and in strength than before. Now, it wasn't only Marquis Devich's men blocking their way but also the Dalriada's army and a couple more noblemen's knight order. Why would the Duke Dalriada allow this? Why would he acquiesce with this rebellion? Kasimi couldn't help but wonder as he continued to fend off the knights that continued to attack them. He wasn't that worried about them hurting Adira because he could see how they were also trying hard not to get her caught up in the fight. Hence, there could only be one explanation why the Dalriada army was mobilized. It's Triton. He's taken control and assumed the Duke's position. As if finishing his thoughts, Adira spoke behind him while keeping Heisa by her side at all times. Not because she needed protecting but because she needed to protect him. She was after all his mother. And it was a mother's duty to protect their child no matter what. Kasimi nodded his head at his wife's words as he slashed the neck of the opponent in front of him. He then turned and called for Alexander. Roman and William to relay his instructions. If we go at this current pace, then it'll take us forever before we can get Adira and Heisa back to the safety of the palace. That is why I want everyone to grab a partner, a little similar to Adira in height and build, and spread out. That should confuse the pursuers for a considerable time and allow us to sneak her away. Receiving their orders, the aides of this great demon lord filed out and grabbed a knight that would more or less pass as Adira when hidden with a cloak. I say more or less but unless one trained their eyes on the person, they would be able to fool a couple of agitated soldiers and mercenaries for a while. It was clear to Kasimi how, their aim were only not to shave their small numbers down but, they were also trying to take Adira, at least carefully as to not injure her. Else, they'll have hell to pay. While they were pairing up, there was but a shortage of people to disguise as Adira. And that was when an assassin, who managed to slip past their defenses and came as close as possible to Adira, entered their sights. With an outstretched hand, the assassin tried to reach for Adira but Kasimi was quicker as he was already in position to slice off that person's neck if not for Adira. Immediately noticing who it was and managed to stop her husband's momentum. Stop! With Kasimi's blade practically already slightly digging onto the assassin's neck, both froze on their spot as they heard her loud cry. Casey, lower your sword. That person is not an enemy. Although reluctant to let his guard down, Kasimi obeyed his wife regardless and lowered his weapon. If this bastard even tried anything funny then he won't hesitate to impale this bastard with a thousand icicles. Forget about overkill. He will ruthlessly mangle this person's corpse until it would be very hard to identify him and maybe feed him to some monsters or throw him off a cliff, whichever works. The person straightened his posture before he went down on one knee and bowed in reverence to his wife before taking off his, um, no, scratch that, her hood. Welcome back, your highness, Millimeter. I'm back, Athena. Adira bobbed her head in acknowledgement at the once nameless assassin who was originally sent to her side with the orders to kill her in her sleep but then ended up hers to command, now with a strong and mighty name Adira bestowed to her. What's happening here? 
Adira asked her. That was her cue to report the results of her reconnaissance mission under the Baron and his daughter's noses. The Baron Latifolia, a couple of days after your highness's departure, was set free by the new Duke Dalriada. As it was done illegally, his majesty sent a small fraction of the Vasilis knights to pursue the Baron yet to be acquitted of his crimes. It was a few days after the Baron had gone missing that I found out that his escape was the Duke Dalriada's doing. Doubting that young Duke's purpose to setting that vile man free, I tried to investigate things and found out they had been planning this coup and usurp the throne. However, because I was hurrying to relay this information to you and warn you of the impending danger, his men discovered me and I was barely able to escape with my life. Forgive me for being inadequate, mistress. Athena narrated and hung her head down in shame with her blunder. Yet Adira was smiling at her with pride. To think that she was able to escape Triton and his cronies and even made it that close to her, as she slipped through Casimir's top-tiered knights undetected, was already a feat in itself. Although, she'll have to do better than that if she hopes to try and blind this mighty demon and take him off guard. No one might be able to pull that off, save for Adira, though in another sense. I'm sure you did your best, Athena. Thank you for coming to greet me. Kasumi and the others, who were watching and listening to their conversation silently, finally closed their agape mouths and the former cleared his throat, silently conveying to his wife the request that he be introduced to her well-hidden spy that even he did not know of. So she was her spy, and I thought she was another addition to her ever-growing harem when I discovered them in that room that night. Oh. Husband, this is Athena. She's a spy I planted in the ex-baron's midst. Hello, your highness Prince Kasumi, I am Athena, Princess Adira's lover. As Kasumi was heaving a sigh of relief at his doubts finally clearing up, the woman's words reached his ears and made him freeze. Not only him though, the others, who were currently close to them and not busy, also froze in shock after hearing her claims. What did this woman just say? Athena, stop your jokes. That idiot easily believes things like that and turns crazy. Please save me the trouble of having to pacify that demon. Adira sighed in exasperation as she gently shook her head at her servant's antics. Oh but I do plan to be your lover, mistress. Even if this love is forbidden and must be hidden, I will be fine with it as long as I have you. She grinned with obvious delight with those happy sparkles at the idea of being Adira's hidden lover and the thrill of a secret tryst in the dead of the night. Atilda wouldn't that be magical? Really, Athena? Adira? She heard Kasumi exclaim and she turned to see his worried, distraught and panicking face. He was not sure what was happening but a woman just boldly declared herself to be his wife's hidden lover. A hidden lover? Seriously? You seriously believe that? Be you but. Look here, I am practically chained to the bed after you always demand for attention and then getting ahead of yourself and subsequently go too far. You seriously believe I even have the chance or energy to find a secret lover after you exhaust me so? Agitated and irritated with being doubted, Adira's mood flipped to a bad direction as she flared and unconsciously blurted out some information they most especially did not need to know. Your Highness, please do think of your wife's constitution. William, the ever insensitive and outspoken knight of Kasumi, commented while he woefully patted his superior's back and added, at least try to do it once a week or twice a month. That shouldn't burden the princess too much, right? He playfully winked at Kasumi while doing a thumbs up sign and looked incredibly proud at his suggestion, as if he was doing the man a great favor. You, shut up. Roman immediately grabbed William's collars and forcefully removed him from Kasumi's immediate sight. What the how cruel. To think that you would exhaust my mistress like so. Athena looked down at the Empire's prince as she regarded him with derision and distaste. All men were ugly in her eyes after all. It was only Adira who was sparkling so brightly in her eyes. Anyway, we've got no time to be dealing with this. Athena, you'll be pairing up with Roman and disguise as me to confuse the enemy, so please do get ready and be careful. Adira quickly changed their topic and paired Athena to Roman to disguise as her. With all due pleasure, mistress. Even if it pains me to be separated from you again, I will obey your orders and be the most brilliant decoy in this operation. So please watch over me, mistress. Athena gallantly said, took Adira's hand and planted a kiss on them before flashing her a cheeky grin. If she was born a man, 
so many unfortunate women would be ensnared with this devil's charms with no hopes of coming out of her spell. Casimir's hackles stood as he regarded the woman as an enemy in a strange sense as Heisa also hissed at her, who blatantly and shamelessly flaunted her affection for his mother in public. Stay safe then, my beloved mistress. Athena bid farewell after donning on a cloak and riding with Roman as they took another route. While Adira could only wave her hand in farewell as she was locked inside Casimir's and Heisa's arms, wrapping her in a possessive yet warm embrace. Why does it feel as if Heisa's becoming more and more like Casimir? Notes. Hi darlings Tilda Tilda so sorry for being absent for a while now. My wife caught me in a trap and thus I was once again enslaved to another hellish week. Anyway, I get to enjoy my mistress, break, for a while before I'll have to once again return. So Tilda give me some love and let me read your comments Tilda Tilda Banzo I. Just you and me. Alexander paired up with Adira while William and Kasumi picked two knights with the leanest build among them all to hide under a cloak before spreading out. But of course, before they did, Kasumi made sure he gave Alex a piece of his mind as he whispered softly, I'm entrusting Adira's safety to you. Protect my wife, Alex. Make sure they make it back to the palace safe and unhurt. And he passed by the red-headed knight to join his supposed-to-be partner. Although he hated to part with Adira, he also knew that those bastards would know that and hence, they will locate her much easier. Of course, your highness, even at the cost of my life, I will never allow anything to hurt the princess. Alex whispered his reply, unheard by the first prince, as he watched the person he would do anything to protect with wistful eyes. Son, go high and demolish anything that poses danger to your mother and your sibling. However, do not be too complacent and take care. Kasumi instructed Heisa secretly and watched his child with pride when the little demon nodded his head in agreement and with determination in his sapphire eyes. It seems that whenever it came to protecting Adira will they finally see eye to eye. I'm very proud of you, my little boy. He added and left a kiss on Heisa's head before also walking close to Adira, who was observing them with warm happiness, and left her a kiss as well. It will just be for a while. They will meet again soon. See you at the palace, husband. You must make sure you return to us. Adira bid him farewell before walking away with Alexander and Heisa. They all scattered in different routes and those that were meant to ambush them were momentarily disoriented, confused to who among those hidden under the cloak was their target, and they also started to disperse. It was precisely what Kasumi wanted. Divide and conquer. While Kasumi and his knights were preoccupied with all the skirmish right in front of them, Triton, who was watching from a high vantage point, saw Adira's figure making her way back to the palace with the red-headed knight and the large, black as ebony. Dragon that soared high to the skies from the trees where their group momentarily sought refuge. It's about time I rectified some things, he mused. Just a little bit more, my love, and I will have you back. It will be like how things were. Just you and me, he whispered lovingly, one-sidedly feeling excited about this reunion. The first part of his plan had already been fulfilled to successfully separate Kasumi and Adira. With Kasumi temporarily out of the picture, a lowly knight, such as the Marquis Vorai's heir, was no match for him. Well, shall we go and meet up with my wife? He turned on his heel to make way and meet Adira halfway and set things right. While the woman, who was on the streets, fought her way back to the palace while also trying to protect the unborn child that was in her womb. She couldn't go all out on her opponents, who wore the Dalriada's crest, were also clearly going easy on her, as if afraid to hurt even a single strand on her hair. Heisa was up on the skies and would occasionally swoop down to either roast or flatten anyone that dared to block his mother's path when he was suddenly shot down from the sky after going around once. Heisa! Adira's scream alerted Alexander and he was momentarily distracted with worry for the young child when what he saw his mistress run towards to wasn't the little prince, but a huge big-ass black dragon falling from the skies. Princess! Don't go there! Alex tried to stop her but he was blocked by his opponent successfully sneaking in a punch or two before he managed to collect himself and fend them off still worried and distracted about Adira who was running off towards that dragon. Now, with Alexander also out of the equation, Triton finally met up with Adira, who didn't notice him coming due to her worrying about Heiser. 
and blocked her path with an outstretched arm as if welcoming her back to his embrace and a very happy smile. Welcome back, my queen. What nonsense are you spouting off your damned mouth, Triton? Since when was I your queen? I am Casimis and no one else's. Adira shot back hatefully. She had enough of his madness. Not only was she worrying for her child that was shot down from the heavens, but also for her husband that was still out there fighting off their pursuers and cleaning things up. And now this bastard comes up to me with some crap about me being his queen. Forget about manners and grace. He certainly doesn't deserve it. Adira raged in her head while raising the sword she managed to steal from one of her pursuers and brandished it against the unfazed man. He was just standing there and looking at her lovingly, as if amused by her feistiness and struggle. Come on, Adira. Come back to me. It'll be just like it was before. Just you and me in this damned rotten world. I'll be the king and you'll be my queen. And that'll start with correcting a few things, like Casimir's death for one. It was like something inside Adira just snapped all at once as she rushed towards Triton in one quick and fluid movement and attacked him. However, the man was able to block it as if he could see through her. With a slight chuckle, he kept his love-filled eyes on her and said, in a sickeningly sweet and soft voice, Really, thank God, you didn't change. Adira felt shivers run up her spine as she watched madness in the man's eyes. He looked as if he was slowly devouring her. Like a serpent slowly crawling its way up to her neck to slowly yet carefully coil around her neck, choking and claiming her. Feeling her skin crawl in disgust and hopelessness about fighting him, she turned tail and ran back the other way to shake him off her. She knew that he won't play nice if it meant capturing her, more so when he finds out that she is pregnant with Casimir's child. This Triton was different and strange. I need to escape. I need to someone who can help me fight him off. As she was preoccupied with escaping from Triton's gaze that she could not help but feel on her every time, a man was also rushing out to her. He had his arms raised above his head, to more or less cut her a little bit and slow her down, and she hurried to get her defense up. No good. I won't make it in time. At least. At least the child. Adira wrapped her skinny arms around her belly and crouched down to protect the child she's carrying when, not only she did not feel the attack reach her, a grunt and the sound of something heavy falling on the ground reached her ears. Big sister. Are you okay? Adira heard an, almost, manly voice and she whipped her head towards the owner of the voice and found a handsome black-haired beauty reaching out his hand to help her. Up, sporting a very worried face. Oh, Owen. Can you stand? Are you okay? Are you injured anywhere? Tell me, did some other bastard try to hurt you as well? He shot question after question in rapid succession as he fumbled about her, checking her for other injuries. He could feel himself tremble in fear when he saw that Buffy mercenary tried to cut her in the most hideous and brutal way. How can a man as big as that bastard try to bully his beloved and fragile big sister? These lowlifes don't even know who they're up against. To try and kill you. Shame on you, you bastard. Owen raged and stomped on the fallen and unresponsive man before dragging Adira away from the streets. Owen. Thank you for saving me. You've become very good with the sword. Little Owen has grown up, indeed. Adira complimented the teen with a sigh of relief. Well, of course. I did promise you that I would grow up to be your knight one day. And you did just that. Really, I've got myself some fine heroes, huh? Adira softly whispered to herself before remembering about Heiser. Owen, I need your help. Please take me to the West District. She pleaded to the team. The latter, who could not resist anything this woman did, originally wanted to shake his head in rejection since it was dangerous outside but, when met with that beautiful ash-like pleading eyes, he couldn't help but automatically nod his head. He helped her make her way to the district where she saw Heiser fall. Upon arriving, there she saw her child back to his human form and curled into a ball while clutching his bleeding side. Hi sir. Baby. Adira rushed to him and picked him up into her arms when suddenly the horns blew loud to alert everyone. And that horn was only heard when there was an attack. As if confirming Adira's fears, the soldiers stationed atop their kingdom's walls were passing on the news while also preparing for the siege. The kingdom is under attack. The kingdom is under attack. The flags belong to the Bycrest Kingdom. The Bycrest Kingdom has come to invade the Empire. Notes. Hi.
So I just survived my wife's wrath and have successfully respawned. So I come here to present to everyone another chapter. Banzai. Forgive your author for being absent these past few days. Much love to everyone. I need my wife. He came. Owen heard Adira's faint whisper before she struggled to lift the little boy on her arms, still bleeding and suffering. Aside from she was starting to panic, Hysa was a bit too heavy for her to lift by herself anymore. Who has come big sister, and give him to me? Owen offered to carry the child Adira called her baby. Although he hated to think that this child was that hateful prince's child but he was still his beloved sister's son, so isn't this boy technically his nephew? Also, he didn't want to be labeled as a good-for-nothing uncle. He came. Oh no. What do I do? Owen heard another low whisper from the unfocused Adira that he had to shake her a bit to get her attention again. He had this gnawing feeling that if he left her like that, then it would be dangerous for her. Big sister. Let's go. Your son needs a doctor as soon as possible. The sound of urgency in Owen's voice and the fact that Hysa was still bleeding from the place where he was shot at finally snapped Adira. During Hysa takes precedence. She can deal with Raiden possibly leading that cavalry later. She needs to find someone that can help her child first. So she lead Owen towards a nearby clinic that she happened to pass by on one of her outings in town. She could keep him there for a while. She could leave Owen there to protect Hysa. Where are you going? Owen immediately asked as soon as he noticed Adira stepping back, as if trying to slip out undetected. I need to go. If I stay here, he will find me and he will kill Hysa, no. He might even kill everyone. Adira was shaking really hard as she desperately tried to calm herself. She knew Raiden wouldn't let her go that easily. She just had to delude herself that she finally escaped his claws when in fact she never did and she might never will. Who is this coming for? Owen. Please protect Hysa. Please. I beg you. Protect my child. She didn't even let Owen finish his question when she took his hands into hers and squeezed them tightly, begging for him to protect the injured child. She was sure that Hysa will be safe as long as she wasn't anywhere near him. That way, that man would also not find him. She can protect Hysa and if worse comes to worst, Owen will be there to guard him. What about you? I'll find Alex. I can get Alex to protect me and I am plenty capable to defend myself from a few goons. So I'll be fine. Just please, promise me you'll protect him. Adira left the clinic after she was sure that Owen will protect Hysa while he was treated there and was supposed to make her way back to her original goal, to the palace, but instead she took another route and headed to the place where everything ended her past life, the capital's central church. I'll assess things from there. I might be able to figure something out up there. She thought to herself, completely ignoring the glaring fact of how her life ended up there by now. To her, although the events were a little bit different than it was last time, it seems that things were being forced to run like how it was from her past life. Perhaps, this is the end of my dream. It was a very happy dream though. Adira sadly thought to herself after she arrived at the church's bell tower and saw the army Raiden brought with him and the Vasilis army advancing to their defensive positions and Kasimi who was steadily advancing back to the palace. However, she could not see Triton anywhere. And as if knowing she was looking for him, Triton's voice came from behind her. Adira. It was just like the last time meeting him up this church's bell tower, however, Hysa was not here, she didn't burn the capital, and the man didn't address her in the same hateful voice he used to her the last time. Instead, he spoke to her with undeniable warmth, yearning, and love. So soft, gentle, and warm. I knew you'd return to me. Why? Why can't you let me go? Adira didn't know what made her ask those words. Perhaps, she was tired. Perhaps, she needed to know the answer, what was holding him back? Why was he chasing her? What does he want? Just why won't he stop? Simple. I love you and I don't wish to let you go. The man replied with ease and smiled as he took small careful steps closer to Adira. However, I don't love you. Kasimi is the person that I love. Why can't you accept that? No. You love me. I know it. I know you love me so much that you're only with him to spite me. Well, you've won. I'm dying in jealousy already so please stop this charade already and return to me, plea. Triton, I really don't love you. 
and I'll repeat it as many times as it takes for you to accept that it is Kasumi whom I love and it is only him. She cut him off. The man's face paled after hearing the clarity in his beloved's voice as she proclaimed her love for the man that took her away from him. It was something that he miscalculated, because he was sure that she would still love him. While Adira was dealing with Triton at the church's bell tower, a hooded figure suddenly emerged from Kasumi's opponent's shadow. The same hooded figure he fought the last war, as the newcomer thrusted his sword through the soldier's chest and quickly took his life. What bad luck to immediately run into you, Prince Kasumi. I would have wanted to emerge from my darling's shadow. He mockingly shook his head and clicked his tongue. That voice. It can't be. It seems you already figured out my identity, as expected of the Empire's great demon lord. Guess, I no longer need to hide myself under this hood, huh? The man mused to himself as he watched Kasumi's flabbergasted expression and knew then that the latter had discovered his real identity. Vivid amber eyes and raven hair was revealed under the hood that kept it hidden and the person smirked. What is the meaning of this, King Raiden? And Tilda you see, I was searching for my fated queen. Who knew you snatched her for yourself? I really, really hate that, you know? Stealing from me is unforgivable. Unforgivable. As if a switch was flipped inside the man, he started to hysterically slash his sword at the dead soldier beneath his feet while madness quickly spread in his amber eyes. He was going mad with anger when he discovered that Adira had fled away with another man. Why would she fly away with this maggot when she should be mine? She's mine. The Augur said so. The Maiden of Light was supposed to be mine. So why is she with Kasumi? Why does Kasumi get to claim her? Why? She is not your queen. She is mine. What Kasumi hated more than anything in this whole damned world was random men suddenly popping up and then claiming his wife to be theirs. Why do they always say that? He was getting tired of always being on his toes, on the lookout for possible rivals, that he was honestly a little bit okay maybe not a little bit, but a whole lot relieved when Adira finally tied herself to him and married him. So why do they still keep coming even though she's already mine? Even though she is already my wife? You don't even know what she is capable of and you're letting her rot away like this when she could achieve more, so much more. With her full capability, she could have the whole world at her feet. She could rule and dominate them all. She only needed someone to guide her. That isn't what she wants, is it? Raiden was speechless after hearing Kasumi's simple answer. It was all just as simple as that. Even a grade schooler would know. Kasumi simply wants whatever Adira wants. If she wanted to conquer the world, then he will support her. However, what the woman really wanted was not those. It wasn't power, or fame or whatnot. She only wanted a warm family. She only wanted love and she was desperate for it. That there were times Kasumi could see in her eyes how unsure she was if she was taking things for granted. If she wasn't thankful enough for the love she was getting, which was very odd to Kasumi. Because, to him, she deserved all the love in this world. A pure and kind soul like has deserved everything she had. What does it matter what she wants? In front of absolute power, does that even matter? Was Raiden's chilling reply to Kasumi. To this king, nothing mattered more than that complete and utter dominion over everyone else. To him, standing atop everyone was more important. To feel that exhilarating feeling of seeing these tiny little maggots struggle to climb their way up to him. And Adira was the key to that kind of future. No, the power that rests inside her was the key to open that door of possibility, which was why he was desperate to acquire the Maiden of Light. If that is what you think, then won't you give me the Maiden of Light? You don't care for power, right? I don't need this Maiden of Light that all of you are dying to get your hands on. Kasumi answered him and Raiden couldn't help but smile in victory. If Kasumi says that he didn't need Adira then maybe it'll be a bit easier to take her now. But, oh boy how wrong he was. Then, however, I need my wife. So, no, I'm not giving her to you. He didn't even let the man get another word in as he launched a series of heavy attacks that all Raiden could do was take the brunt of all those assaults and defend himself. A Kasumi that had nothing holding him back was like a feral dragon trying to gobble a dozen of men whole. He didn't have a moniker great demon lord for nothing indeed. He was just like that overpowered last boss in the very last and most difficult level to pass. 
But even this great demon lord could do nothing at the face of a perfectly honed dark magic that sneaked around to bound and incapacitate him. The king chuckled lowly before it slowly evolved into a mocking guffaw as he ran a hand through his messed up raven locks and attempted to comb it back to its original. Look. You see, Prince Casimir, I am not asking you. I am demanding you. Beside you, she'll be utterly degraded into this good-for-nothing little wife playing house with you and your son. However, by my side, she'll rise above everyone else and they shall all bow down to worship her splendor. If you know what's good for her and your empire, you'll surrender her to me and I will withdraw my troops immediately. Let's not make this any uglier than it already is. You and your army, no matter how strong and formidable you are, cannot hope to escape this slaughter unscathed with how unprepared you are. So think very well as this empire's prince, your highness. Will you sacrifice your country for one Adira? He ranted and ranted while keeping the bound Kasumi dangling off the shadows that wound around his four limbs. It was true indeed. The Vasilis Empire had been caught unguarded this time given that they simultaneously need to deal with the rebellion of some nobles, particularly Triton del Riada that literally does anything, whether stupid or insanely stupid, just to take away his wife. How does she manage to rope in the crazies? Not that I can complain, but still. Adira, who tried to sidestep and escape Triton, unfortunately came face to face with a heavily disfigured iris, with her face too damaged to be even recognized, that even, though she was healed, with a melted face like that, anyone would have wished they were killed instead. Especially someone as vain as her. You bitch. You monstrous bitch. You did this to me. I will kill you. I will really kill you. She rapidly screamed at Adira before she glowed golden and materialized the same sword that killed her the last cycle. She rushed at the stunned Adira and attempted to thrust it at her when she was deflected back by an invisible force when Adira screamed, Stay back! It was all a mess. The things that were occurring all at the same time. The Bycrest army attacking the Empire. Kasumi captured by Raiden. Heisa shot down by the Bycrest soldiers. Triton's rebellion. A pincer attack from two separate unassociated powers. It was all bearing down on Adira that her heart had started to darken, and with this darkness was the destruction that Raiden had always hoped to see. The very bright morning sun was suddenly hidden by very thick and dark clouds that would even make people think that night time had come too soon. The skies growled in anger as flashes of light danced here and there. The soldiers and mercenaries, regardless of which side they were working for, all briefly stopped to observe the unexplainable events unfolding before their very eyes. You should all just disappear. And with Adira's words, light rained down from the furious skies that attacked both the armies fighting outside the west walls and the soldiers duking it out, trying to keep the first prince and his knights preoccupied till they achieved their objective. This is, Kasumi raised his head and watched the skies light up and rumble in furor before sending down beams of light to burn anything and everything. Friend, foe, buildings, or whatever, as long as you stood in the way, then you'll without a doubt burn away. He redirected his gaze to the amused and disgusting excited expression on Raiden's face before the latter spoke. Atilda Tilda the beloved daughter of the God's heart has darkened. This. This is the maiden's cry. Nothing can stop this unless. Unless what? Unless everything burns down. Notes. Extra long because I've also been absent extra long tilde tilde I missed you guys tilde tilde I miss waking up to all your comments that I always love to read tilde tilde I hope I get to see another long thread this time tilde tilde anyway tilde I've survived tilde tilde banza a tilde p.s. not promising anything but I might be able to focus on this again tilde hope so tilde the god of destruction your highness the first prince's right hand man dubbed by the commoners as the Empire's Black Wolf, came at the right time and slashed at the shadows that trapped Kasumi to free him. Roman. Please. Go and save your wife. He grunted while trying his best to parry against Raiden's shadows. It wasn't that he was stronger than Bycrest's king, but he just wasn't falling behind in strength and techniques. Roman knew that the Kasumi now would not be able to function well when he knows his wife is in imminent danger. He knew that all too well as this was not the first time Radian's been able to squeeze himself into Kasumi's mind and poison it. This king always had a way to exploit Kasumi's weakness painfully and disgustingly well. But. Go, your highness. 
Another voice came before they both saw an attack come from Radian's blind spot and the newcomer managed to get a hit in and wounded the latter's side, although a bit shallow but still enough proof for Kasumi to entrust Radian into their capable hands. I would love to be the one to save the mistress from her misery but I know she'd prefer you. The woman said with a smirk as she leapt back to keep a distance between her and Radin and his shadows. Kasumi, after seeing Athena helping Roman face the enemy king, spun on his heel after leaving the both of them in order. Don't die on me. With all due pleasure, your highness, Roman replied. Of course. As Princess Adira's lover, I shall prove my love and loyalty to her by presenting this bastard's head on a spear. Athena proudly exclaimed. The Empire's prince had a lot of questions about some aspects on her sentence but decided to ignore it for now. They'll have plenty of time to sort those out later. For now, his wife takes priority and stop this destruction immediately. Wait for me, Adira. I'm coming. Well, I thought you'd be headstrong about it and charge towards the princess without alerting the first prince to claim the glory of being her savior. Roman commented and smirked at Athena's way as soon as he was sure Kasumi was nowhere near their spot anymore. She needs to know that she isn't alone. And the person that she needs that from is from her husband, not me. Athena answered gloomily. Although she admired the princess very much to the point that it was bordering love, she also knew that she could never take that special spot in her heart. That was why, she was content with being Adira's friend and trusted companion as long as it meant being able to stay by her side. It's okay. I'm here anyway. Roman mused with a slight tinge of red coating his cheeks. Shut up, was Athena's cold answer while hiding her blush from the man himself. Aadira. What's, what's happening? Shakily, Triton called out to the woman glowing golden while gradually turning dark. Emptiness was all that could be seen in her once bright and lively ashen eyes. Wintry apathy masked her beautiful doll-like visage. It was just like before. Only this time, an almost transparent, floating, ghost-like person could be seen wrapping his arms around Adira's neck gently, as if to protect her while also appearing very clingy, while smiling coldly towards Triton and a bleeding and damaged iris. Do you also want them to disappear, Adira? I can make that come true. I can erase them if you ask me to. One word from you is all I need. My dear, the man's voice, ringing like gentle bells, uttered dark and sinister words which was a stark contrast to his beautiful and light yet cold and disgusted image. You are, I am called Apophis, the god of destruction. I have come to answer my beloved child's wishes who finally called upon me. He answered Triton before shifting his eyes towards Adira, the coldness suddenly melting away and looked upon her with warm fondness and love as the most unlikeliest smile graced the god's strikingly handsome face. So, are you the maggot that dared to anger my beloved Adira to this point? Feeling the chilling death slowly creeping up his spines as the loving warmth in the god's eyes quickly shifted to the eyes of a higher being that was looking down on his prey, Triton unconsciously took a step back. Iris, however, was further enraged. Not only was Adira the most perfect in everyone's eyes, literally, she also turned out to be the true maiden of light that everyone's been searching and waiting for a long time. The maiden of light whose identity she had stolen, no, that was forced on her. The only person blessed and favored greatly by the fickle gods. Why do you always take everything for yourself? You, the ugly one over there. What are you doing staring daggers at my dearest Adira? Taking offense with watching Iris seethe in uncontrollable anger while glaring at Adira to death, Apophis shot Iris an annoyed look. He didn't remember allowing anyone to gaze upon his favorite child with eyes like this insolent one. For forgive me, your holiness. Iris quickly bowed her head and tried to hide her gaze from this god. However, she could never hide her jealous heart no matter what she did. Not in front of this god. Ah, I see. You envy Adira. I understand. Beaming upon hearing the god's words expression of understanding how she was jealous of how Adira had everything she wanted, Iris looked up to Apophis only to be met with the same disapproving, unamused and unbothered cold gaze the god had worn to regard her earlier. I also envy the gods she always calls to. Like that bastard Sekhmet, who loves to gloat to my face how she had called to her to heal her beloved son and also a few times before that. Even though she just got lucky. What the hell do I care about that? 
Iris screamed as she listened to this god complain how Adira never seemed to call for him. How he never had the chance to do anything for her. Even from her past life, she never asked Apophis to destroy anything for her. Instead, she destroyed everything with her own two hands. Eventually calling to Osiris to return to the time before her fate had been sealed down an unforgiving and heartbreaking path towards her death. Words could not begin to describe how much he was dying with envy by then. Especially when these gods start to gloat right in his face. Well, little ugly one, you don't need to care. Because that ugliness in your heart is something I can never fix even if we give you a thousand chances at life. Iris was flabbergasted with the biting words from the god himself while the latter was trying to pamper the lost and apathetic woman as much as he could. Adira. Why is, why is Apo? Triton wasn't even able to finish the god's name before he was thrown out and pinned up to a wall by an invisible force as soon as the god turned his eyes towards him. Because, how dare a mortal like this insect utter his given name, right? There was only one human who was ever allowed to do such insolence and get away with it. Who allowed you to utter my name, you insufferable maggot? While the man was taking a beating from this temperamental god, Adira looked onto them with void ashen eyes before redirecting her gaze on the destruction currently attempting to swallow the whole empire and everyone in it. She couldn't see her son ruling the skies with his might. She couldn't see her beloved silver locks fighting back to her side. There was only a messy war between three forces and enemy flags irritating her to no end. Since it had come to this, she'll just have to erase every. Adira. Notes. Back with another chapter for everyone tilde since school will start again in a few days. I figured I might as well drop a few chapters before it starts to haunt me again. Looking forward to everyone's comments as always tilde banzo i.e. tilde tilde. All the bits and pieces. Adira halted and froze on her spot as she heard that same voice she grew used to hearing every day. Turning her body around slowly, she regarded the man. The same emptiness was still there but she was looking right at him. However, it was all she did, just staring at him as if he was some stranger that happened to know her name. My wife, you're fine. That's good. I'm here, so you can stop this now. Kasumi tried to reassure his beloved and get her to calm down enough for her to stop whatever was happening. But, Adira did not move nor speak. She didn't do anything. Haisa. Where is Haisa? Finally noticing the child that should have been stuck beside her, almost like an adorable accessory plastered to her with the most durable glue, was missing. Is that the reason she's lost control? As if finally hearing and registering what Kasumi was saying, tears streamed down Adira's eyes and in the most heartbreaking and soft voice answered him, I... I couldn't protect my child. He was... He was shot down. Please help my child. Protect Hai No. The only way to ensure my family's safety is by erasing everything in here. Everyone shall pay for hurting my family again. And with that, Adira once again turned outside before kneeling down in front of Apophis as an act of prayer and plea. I beg you, God Apophis, be you. Before Adira could complete her words, Kasumi reached out his hand to cover his wife's mouth and stop her. If what he thinks is right, the god's actions were born from Adira's wishes. So if he can stop her from uttering a prayer, maybe the god won't also move. But Kasumi was too preoccupied with watching the god's movements that it slipped his mind that his wife wasn't a weak, docile and fragile creature that will silently take whatever was thrown at her. Especially something that annoyed her. Thrusting out her hand, Adira grabbed for Kasumi's neck in a claw-like grip, digging her nails into his flesh, to get the man to release her. However, the man was also proving to be as stubborn as he refused to let her go. A. Hey. Adira. It's me. It's Casey. Do you. Do you not recognize, me? As soon as Kasumi managed to squeeze those words out, the strength in Adira's grip started to lessen and her hold loosened a bit. Noticing how he was slowly starting to reach her, he pushed further and called out to her. My wife, it'll be alright, it's fine now, trust me. I promised I won't allow anyone to harm you or Haisa and that promise stands true. Adira's muscles stiffened, when memories of when she discoursed her past life to her husband resurfaced in her mind, and tears threatened to flow down once more. Kasumi knew he had finally reached her. A little more push should do it. My wife, won't you trust me with your life? 
Adira craned her head when she felt Casimir's hold on her loosening and saw his gentle and warm smile, bringing back memories of when she said the exact same words to him, when she decided to save him from the assassination that took his life the past cycle. Who's banned? What took you so long? Focus and a recognizing glint finally returned to Adira's beautiful ashen gray eyes before she wrapped her arms around Casimir's neck and she bawled like a little child, as she clung to him for dear life. It was only in front of Kasumi that she could allow herself to crumble down like that, because she was sure that he would pick her back up, all the bits and pieces, and support her with all the love he got. Kasumi was the half that made her whole and perfect, the half that never got tired fixing and building her up every time she went crashing down. I'm sorry for being late. The man didn't get to finish his words before he was taken off guard and forced to take a step back when a dark mist, as dark as ebony, swallowed his wife. He immediately got up to his feet and assumed an attack position while the mist gradually melted away and revealed a newcomer who could be seen wrapping his pale and lean arms around Adira's trembling figure. I missed you, my lovely queen. That was so naughty of you to flee away with another man in the middle of the night without even telling me goodbye. But no worries, we can settle that later, right? After our wedding. He lustily whispered into Adira's ears that sent the woman back into a spiral of fear and trauma that made her shiver so bad while looking as pale as a corpse. Hey, dearest, you're not planning on stopping this, right? Why don't we destroy everything together? You would love that, right? That's what you wanted, right? He continued to chatter before shifting his gaze towards Kasumi, who couldn't help but stay on his place for fear of this dangerous man inflicting harm on Adira and smirked tauntingly, et intriunt sinitis in rare tenebris vos, et audit vos and memordiant. Factor essent, et delecti, let the darkness devour you, as you hear my voice and listen. They were the ones who took your beloved away. I purposely let him go to meet you so you would let your guard down, so that when you do, I can make you entirely mine. Igniting and poisoning Adira's already weak mentality, Raiden spoke dark spells into Adira's ear and smirked evilly as Kasumi just willed his feet to move after seeing his wife's figure crumbling down in pain and fear. Kasumi leapt into action and swung an attack at the man only to be blocked by his wife. There was a strange look of hatred in her beautiful grey eyes, a look he never once saw on them whenever she looked at him. You killed my son. She spoke and rushed forward to engage him in a close-range combat. She was a hell lot more predictable when she was consumed by hatred so Kasumi did not do anything except dodge her. He would never raise a hand against his beloved wife. Why did you do that? Why kill my son? My child that did nothing wrong. My son whose only fault was having me as his mother. Why him? She cried as she attacked her husband relentlessly. Kasumi was listening to her nonsense crying and wondered if she was talking about Heisa. Because to his ears, it oddly sounded different like there was another child. While on the sidelines, although nothing that Adira said was making sense, Raiden made sure he enjoyed Adira trying to kill her own husband. And when she does, then he'll be there to help her out of that darkness she'll drown herself into when she realizes how she killed Kasumi with her very own hands. She'll belong to him all her shattered heart and soul, like a puppet dancing only for his own amusement. Raiden sat on the sidelines leisurely and licked his lips when the thought of how beautiful and seductive Adira looked when she danced at the banquet of his coronation. Night replayed on his mind. He would love to see her dance that same dance for him again, this time with no clothes on. And as if the spell, that was only meant to show Adira an illusion of Kasumi killing her beloved child, triggered something else inside her subconscious mind and started crying. You only used me. I fought wars for you. I gave you everything I had and yet, you did not only kill our son, you also conspired with that hateful woman to do away with me, what did I not give you that she did, why was I never enough, and with one strong and forceful strike, with her blade coated with poisonous hate, she drove the blade into his heart, notes, hey, I'm back Tilda my wife just literally killed me the past month and my mistress brought me back to life just now Tilda I'll try to make it up to you and try a double update today. I hope everyone's been looking forward to this new chapter Tilda Tilda Chow Tilda. Banza A Tilda. He remembers. Coughing out blood, he held the sword that Adira should have driven into Kasumi's heart. But he knew it wasn't Kasumi. He knew that she wasn't talking about Kasumi the whole time. 
because he knew what he did their past life. He knew of the sins he committed since long ago. He remembers, my queen, you. You remember? Triton asked but he was only met with burning hatred in those once sweet and timid lovely ashen eyes. This is Lady Adira Ramiria Ear Silveris, the one betrothed to you, Triton. Say hello. Duke Dalriada introduced the six-year-old Adira to the also six-year-old and stuck-up Triton. Hello. Came his curt greetings but the little Adira did not mind it one bit. Instead, she smiled sweetly at him and offered her best and politest greetings to him. She curtsied as gracefully as she could which only looked cuter as she struggled to do it as perfectly as possible to impress and leave a good impression on the boy. And then the boy found her lovely and cute, so he did not say more about the marriage that was planned for him without his knowledge. He got a cute, fragile and sweet fiancé out of it so it was fine. And she was from the only other ducal family. Adira, you remember me, don't you? You remember everything I did to you the past life? Triton asked shakily dreading to hear the word that would shatter everything, and after a short silence from the woman, she spoke, yes, it was just a simple word of affirmation but it tore the man into pieces, it broke every illusions he built to sustain himself in his everyday struggle against the past he was trying damn hard to rectify, it destroyed whatever plans he had to try and take her away, because now he knew that whatever he did, there's just no way he could ever have her. I remember how much you hated me every single day of my pitiful life to the point that you would even drive me to my own deathbed. No. I love you, Adira. Then and now, I deeply love you. I loved you as much as you loved me then. I got complacent, believing you would love me no matter what, no matter when. Triton, look. An eight-year-old Adira exclaimed as she showed a young Triton her tightly clasped hands. When she knew that she had the boy's full attention, she slowly opened it to reveal what she had been keeping safely inside long enough that she could show it to him. It was a little yellow butterfly that softly and slowly stretched its wings first before fluttering away when it saw the chance. A butterfly. Yes. Do you know what yellow butterflies mean? The little girl happily asked, all smiles and giggles. Triton shook his head as it didn't matter to him what butterflies or their colors meant. It was not something an heir to a duke should learn, so he didn't care. But Adira was different. She had no responsibilities and she was greatly pampered by her family. So she could do whatever nonsense she wanted to do. It was partly why he sometimes hated spending time with a happy-go-lucky person like her. Yellow butterflies means joy. I hope I could give you the same joy you've been giving me for the past two years, my dear fiancé. And a little boy such as Triton was not immune to something as lovely and beautiful as an innocent girl's pretty and radiant smile. Triton, by then, knew that Adira was going to be a perfect wife to him someday, despite their differences. But, you were so strong, so perfect, and so cold. It felt like you didn't need me. I got blinded with pride and found someone frail that needed me, that made me feel like a strong and dependable man again. As the future empress, you need to be strong to support your emperor, you need to be perfect in every way so you can be of help to your spouse and cold when the moment needs it. This empire and the emperor needs a capable and perfect empress so you cannot afford to slack in any way, Lady Adira. Her bridal tutor taught Adira, who had just successfully paved the way for Triton to claim the throne after the prince's untimely death, currently struggling to prove her worth as an empress worthy to stand beside Triton and be his pillar of support. It had just been a month since the prince's assassination and without someone to succeed the ailing and grieving emperor then the empire shall be lost. It was then that Adira stepped in and did everything she could, used every means at her disposal, and schemed as much as she could to clear the way for Triton. She had become very busy that she could not spare a little time for her meals even. If she does get a break, she ends up spending it asleep. Just when she was almost at her limit, she decided to pay Triton a visit. She felt very excited to show him how much she learned although she was already feeling the cracks and the space gradually widening since they started school. And now with this distance and schedule, she feared that it might have added more strain on their weakening and fragile relationship. Skipping her supposed to be afternoon nap, she dropped by his office. It was there that she first saw Iris Latifolia, the woman that would eventually steal everything away from her. And then, they told me how you ran away with the enemy king. I was so devastated, 
so heartbroken to the point I almost took my own life as rest evaded me, but I didn't. In the end I couldn't do it for my child that Iris carried. Where is Adira? Where is my queen? bellowed an enraged Triton as he shot up from his throne and charged at the messenger, who could only cower in fear at his mad outburst. He held the poor young man by his collar and effortlessly raised him off the ground. It was a different sight to the usual poker-faced and uncaring king they've been serving. When the queen was at the castle, he could care less whatever she did or what happened to her. But now that she ran away with another, he suddenly goes crazy like this. And Triton was indeed going nuts with what the messenger just told him. There was no way that what this maggot just told him was true. There was just no way it was possible for Adira to run away with another man, much less his enemy at that. Adira couldn't have left him. Adira cannot find it in her to do that. She loved him too much. She loved him to the point that no matter how much he ignored and took her love for granted, she remained perfectly still at his back, just silently and patiently waiting for him to turn to her. My king, please let the poor man go. The fact that Adira haven't returned, despite the other forces finally withdrawing their attack, is proof enough. You need to let it go. Iris came forward and gently tried to talk Triton out of his uncharacteristic fit. The king grieving for the woman he lost while not caring for her wholeheartedly, slowly felt his strength leave him as Iris' words filtered into his ears and slowly settled in. Adira had indeed left him. She had chosen someone else for the first time since they were little children. It had never happened before so he did not know how to cope with it. And in his moment of weakness, he did something he would not be able to take back ever, and everything went according to Iris' plan all along. From the point where she intercepted that Bycrest's king's message of asking Fadira in exchange of withdrawing his forces, because she knew that Triton would not allow it to happen, to being there for Triton when he tries to deal with his perceived rejection of Adira's love that was always there for him. As a result, she carried the next heir to the throne. She was able to successfully integrate and made herself invaluable to the throne. The days stretched to weeks and to months. Triton's health continued to deteriorate as he spent countless of sleepless nights haunted by the fact that he had lost the only woman that faithfully loved him no matter what. His depression eventually reached the point where he attempted to take his life by driving a dagger deep into his already dead heart. However, a news he never expected managed to stop him in time. The news that he finally had a son who will bear the responsibilities of the emperor next. A son he was not able to share with Adira out of baseless fear that she might not see him all the more, being the perfect and cold empress that she was. So he decided to forget Adira. He decided to leave her memories and her warm love in the past where it shone the brightest, before he slowly took away her sparkle and radiance and killed her heart always fooling himself that it was not his fault. Then you came back with vengeance, your beautiful heart poisoned with deep-seated hatred for me and the whole world that turned their backs on you. I didn't want to kill you. I wanted you to return to me even if you hated me so much. I wanted you back in my arms even if I had to break all your limbs. Fires, explosions, and cries rang out one early morn that jolted everyone out of their deep and easy slumbers. Triton thought that it was the Bycrest Kingdom again that had come to take control of the Empire. But it wasn't. Unbeknownst to them, Adira had laid waste on the Bycrest Kingdom before she moved on to destroy the Vesilus Empire. It was time that they paid for all the hurt she had to endure for love. Meeting on top of the church's bell tower, Triton could feel the relief he first felt turn into anger when he remembered how the woman chose another man and left him. And now, she had the guts to return and destroy his empire, but he could forgive it all. He could forget what happened and they could start anew if Adira would choose him this time, if the woman would choose to stay beside him again. However, it was not meant to be when the woman regarded him with nothing but extreme abhorrence and even attempted to burn him down, if not for Iris arriving on time and killing her before she could. But that wasn't what Triton wanted. He didn't want her dead. Seeing her fragile figure fall from where she stood and her dragon, Hysa, swooping down in an attempt to catch her, Triton rushed forward and inadvertently pushed Iris out of the way. The woman, already on her fifth month of childbearing, couldn't bear the trauma and had a miscarriage. But to Triton then, it was the least of his concerns. He couldn't believe how Iris had killed Adira, the woman who did nothing wrong but love him wholeheartedly. 
the woman whose love he pushed to the utmost limit due to his incompetence and complacency and in the end lost it. But Iris knew that. Perhaps, my indecisiveness, whether to choose the family I was about to have or you, was what drove her to take your life. And I hated myself every second of the next six years of my short life because of that. I hated my cowardly self that couldn't hold on to you more firmly. The day stretched and the Vasilis Empire slowly lost its strength, glory and honor. Partly because their king had went into reclusion and the destruction the mad and vengeful queen had done was not ever addressed properly. The king they entrusted their future to had self-destructed and was deteriorating, himself. He was not the same king that had such great vigor and visions for their empire. So what once was an untouchable kingdom had become disgustingly miserable. Now, it was all but a shell of its former glory. And the concubine, the most favored concubine, was left on the sidelines just like that after she lost her child and her king in one night. Triton spent most of his days in a room at the highest tower in the palace, silently gazing at the destruction that was all his queen had left with a dead and dull look in his eyes. It was all that reminded him of her now. Not a child, not her dragon, but ashes and destruction. He hated how at the end of her life, he didn't see the love that was supposed to be in her beautiful eyes. He hated how even though he noticed how he was killing that pure and battered heart, he never did anything for her. He hated himself so much. Every passing second, minute, days, weeks, and months. There was not a single moment where her memories did not haunt him, where her dainty little giggles, the efforts to match him, her foxy yet cute ashen eyes, and her warm and welcoming hugs and love did not haunt him. And then, the far and secluded temple of the gods, his queen had made to boost his reputation against the masses, came into his view. So I went to the temple of the gods and fervently prayed. Six gruesome years from the night that you left me, I practically lived in the temple and very much ignored the throne you did so much to offer to me. After weeks of just wasting away at a tower, Triton finally came out of his room at the tower. He surreptitiously went to the temple of the gods under the cover of the night, without anyone knowing. Truthfully, it didn't matter much since he never really went out of that dusty room since Adira died. He was rarely seen and he didn't really take care of himself that much. So no one really noticed him nor noticed he was gone. Triton spent his days there, praying. He begged the gods every day to allow him to see Adira again, to see his love once more and tell her everything he was too proud to say. He cried, wanting to see the woman that should have been his, was his, but in the end he lost. He knew his sins. He acknowledged them. And he had no excuses for any of them but he wanted to see her again. He was even willing to give them anything or everything that they, the gods, would demand as payment as long as it meant he would be able to see Adira again. He would do anything to be with her again. He would give up anything to feel her touch again. No matter what it took, he'll do it if it meant he could love her and she could love him again. He will pay anything to turn back time to when everything started. I asked them to give you back to me, so I could love you more properly and they did. They gave you back. However, not to me. Notes. I finally finished writing this long ass chapter. Banzai Tilda. I really didn't want to cut it in half and so it took me some time. I was also feeling really sad while writing Triton's part. But anyway, I hope you had fun and it was worth the wait Tilda. I shall go and maybe start the next as soon as possible. Bye ye Tilda. A warning, reminder, and a promise. They gave you to someone else and I couldn't quite accept that. So I fooled myself into thinking that it won't be long till you wake up and remember that you loved me and only me. That was all I could hold on to the idea that no matter what was said to you or what you saw, you always loved me unconditionally. I love you, Adira. I may have failed to tell you that the last time and betrayed your warm and beautiful love for me all the time but I truly, madly, deeply love you. Perhaps, this is the punishment and the payment the gods have decided for me. Maybe the reason they allowed me to return was to watch you love someone else more than you used to love me and feel my heart bleed as much as yours probably bled then. Triton reached out his blood-stained hands and gingerly caressed the face of the only woman he truly loved both past and present lives. He had the greatest blessing and treasure handed to him on a silver platter yet he failed to see her importance until he lost her, he couldn't love her properly. Perhaps the gods deeply loathed him for hurting their beloved child and gave him the most painful punishment they could give him, to send him back to time and not given. 
the chance to earn her love again. They even made it that he remembered every sin he did so he'd have to live through his second life burdened by it. This second life they bestowed unto him was both a miracle and a curse. And even then, he managed to obliterate whatever little affection Adira had for him by constantly trying to pull her away from the men she now loved the most, Kasumi and, their son, Hysa. And because Adira had no more affection for him left, there was also no reason for her to set out on a war to conquer the neighboring nations and accidentally come across another dragon which she offered to him for a tiny bit of his affection. In reality, he was very worried for her then. He worried to death thinking about what danger taking the dragon with her must have entailed, however, he unwittingly said it in a way that caused the crevice between them to split even farther. And he hated Kasumi for managing to snatch Adira's heart, he abhorred himself for not being better for the most perfect woman to ever come into his life. He could not be better than Kasumi. Now, he could only live in extreme heartbreaking regret. I won't ask for forgiveness or ask you to love me back anymore. This is enough, seeing you happy with someone else while also knowing you remember me is enough now. I just hope you will always remember that I will, for always, love you. He leaned close to Adira and momentarily paused before gently placing a warm and sad kiss on her forehead, pulling back slowly to lock his gaze onto her moist ashen eyes. This is my farewell to you, my one and only queen. He promptly let her go and rushed towards the languid raven-haired monarch, pulling the sword his love buried in him out, and dragged the man with him to hell. He won't allow anyone to interfere in Adira's happiness anymore. No more. The latter jolted as soon as he saw Triton's clear and determined aqua blue eyes lock onto him and before he could even do much, Triton had already seized him in an unlock and proceeded to tilt himself backwards, as they were close to the edge of the tower. It was all too sudden that all Adira could see at his final moment was the same handsome and loving smile he had always given her, the same smile she craved all her life. The past cycle. Triton, being held back by Kasumi's arms, Adira's out-extended hand could only hold nothing but emptiness as both Triton and Raiden fell out, of course, with the latter leaving behind a string of profanities that gradually faded out. There was a pause, a silence, that enveloped the remaining people up on the church's tower before the god, unfazed of what just transpired, broke it. It seems to me that my child needs me no more. As if just reminded of this foreign god's presence, Adira whipped her panic-stricken eyes towards his way and bowed low. While Kasumi could only heave a heavy sigh of relief after seeing how Adira had returned to her usual self. Forgive me, god Apophis, for my transgression of forgetting your presence. Hush, my child, I don't mind. However, I do hope you'll remember to invite us to when you present your unborn child to everyone. Everyone, after all, is looking forward to your child. The cruel god, who did nothing but destroy the moment he was summoned, showed an uncanny warm smile as he cupped Adira's face and made her look up to meet his cold silver eyes. Forgive us when we couldn't help you protect your child. This time, we will protect you and this family that you love. There won't be a repeat this time, my dear daughter. Adira brought her gaze down as memories of how Iris had staged an accident to take her unborn child from her forever, couldn't help the tears that escaped her eyes. The suffering of her previous life, all for the sake of attaining one man's love, had been paid with that very same man's life and smile. This time, she was not gonna suffer the same way anymore because her husband loves her as much as she loves him. She had a very cute and lovable son and also an upcoming addition to their family. She was going to finally find peace and live a blissful life. And because of this God's last words before disappearing a warning, reminder, and a promise, the neglected Iris finally entered Adira's view again. Kasumi helped his wife up, after noticing where her gaze was directed at, and even handed her his sword. Whatever Adira decided from that point on, he will support her all the way even if it meant taking the life of one nameless fallen noble. I never thought you would actively seek your end, Miss Latifolia. After I almost melted your face off, you still rushed here to find me. Eek. S stay away you freak. You're a monster. Why you don't belong here? You and that bastard Triton. Ah, well, I can't exactly deny that but at least know this, Iris. You, yourself, created this monster. Adira, with a cold and chilling glint in her ashen eyes, raised Kasumi's sword high above her head. 
It was then that Iris truly regretted the things she did, because she could finally see it clearly on this woman's eyes her thirst for her life, for a justice that was long overdue. The former abruptly brought the sword down towards the trembling woman that the latter could only let out a whimper and tightly closed her eyes, resigning herself to her fate, when she didn't feel pain being inflicted upon her. Did I die a quick and painless death? Unfortunately, I don't plan on letting you off that easily. I will make sure you bear the weight of your sins for the remaining years of your life. Adira turned her back against Iris and gave Kasumi his sword back, finally relieving a sigh of relief at this final end. Nothing will disrupt. You bastards. They all heard an angry roar as the tower they stood upon in suddenly started to shake and from the edge that Triton and Raiden just disappeared in. A man clad in black mist that was the only thing supporting his broken limbs in place climbed back up with bloodshot mad eyes. If the Maiden of Light cannot be mine, why don't you stay dead? It was Kasumi's turn to get angry this time as he shot the man off the edge with a sword to his head and a bunch of icicles that struck directly to the man's vital spots as accurately as possible, but it didn't end there yet. Heisa, who managed to feel well enough to turn back into his majestic form, was hovering above them when he saw a ball of black mist being thrown away from the tower and instinctively duffed to snatch it in his mouth. Heisa! Both his parents called his name relief and happiness clear in their voices. No. Spit that thing out. That's dirty. Adira, suddenly realizing that Heisa just gobbled the broken Raiden, reprimanded Heisa after hearing a loud crunch in his mouth. The little, not so little, dragon felt sad watching his mother get mad at him and spit out the monarch, bent towards impossible ways, twitching and groaning before it suddenly stopped and the latter finally laid motionlessly on the ground. What the? Was Heisa all it took to kill this dude? Is it because Heisa's the heir of the darkness? Oh, shouldn't it be the king now? Did he cancel out the protection it gave to Raiden? Adira, encased in Kasumi's arms, looked up to her sullen and gloomy-looking son still hovering above them, refusing to come closer until his mother says otherwise. The former couldn't help the loving smile finally grace her beautiful yet haggard visage before she stretched her arms to welcome her baby back. Come to mommy baby. Mommy missed you so much, the woman said. And the dragon, waited no more, changed into his human form and fell right into his mother's arms with a tear-stained face. He really feared his mother would not love him anymore because he failed to protect her and his little sibling. You did a fine job demolishing those bastards that stood in your mother's way, my son. Daddy's very proud of you. Kasumi chimed in with a happy and proud smile as he petted the child still clinging to his wife. Don't care. Heisa just simply replied and stuck a tongue out towards Kasumi before laughing heartily. From now on, nothing should disturb her family anymore, right? Notes. Hi. I went on a sudden hiatus since life had been too demanding and hectic. Since we got confined in our homes till further notice, I figured I should write now. Anyway, part of the reason why I went on hiatus was because I struggled to give them a perfect ending. Yep, that's right people. We have finally reached the end of the story. I really thank everyone that supported She Becomes a Passive Villainess, not all the way. I still cannot believe that this story made a million reads. Thank you so much for your support and love. I hope to write another one soon so please support it as well as you supported SBAPVN2. I love you dear readers. Banza AI. P.S. I came back because a lot had been pleading for me to write again and I cannot let them down. Can I? Thank you, am I lovelies? P.P.S. I truly don't know if this chapter satisfied you so let me apologize if it did not. My sunshine, epilogue, for years, I have chased after you and your love. There can only be one answer to this, my dearest empress. Days, weeks and months passed after the Battle of the Three, or was popularly known by common folk as the War for the Maiden, the Empire of Vesilus, true to its reputation, quickly got back to their feet. Post-war reparations were done immediately the day after the end of the war, spearheaded by Casimir's well-trusted right-hand man, Roman, with Athena, for some unknown reasons only they know. The people of Bycrest surrendered as soon as Raiden's, their king's, death was announced. The empire swallowed the Bycrest under their banner entirely as they became a vassal nation under the Vesilus reign. The few Dalriada knights, who were loyal to their young lord to the very end, 
the mercenaries commissioned under Triton's name, as well as the opposing faction of noble families were all seized land, power, and even their titles, as they were only left with the clothes on their back. The Dalriada dukedom, regardless if it was with the consent of the current family head or not, fell to ruin. With no heir to succeed him, Osiris docilely accepted the punishment bestowed upon him and retreated to the provinces to live out the remainder of his years. Anastasius and Silpha, both good friends of Osiris, were saddened by this chain of events however the latter wished they would send him off with smiles. And so the night before Osiris' departure, the three toasted to their years of mischief, happiness and sorrows of their brotherhood. Iris, the fake maiden of light and a sinner of multiple charges, was thrown to the dungeons. To William's sheer joy which he expressed in his own cryptic words I have gained a playmate. Rumors had it that, every night, the rotating guards would hear whimpers and distant screams echo deep in the dungeons. To whom the cries belong to, they can only guess, and what kind of hell was shown to the wailing banshee, they were better off not knowing and they never wished to know. Ramir's succession was done with the formal and proper procedures and ritual after Silpha abdicated the duke's position and handed it over to him saying, I want to spend the rest of my days with your mother and maybe visit our grandchildren once in every few days. I hope we live the day when you'll give us a grandchild as well, Ramir. To which the latter just responded with an awkward shrug of his shoulders and small smile. Needless to say, Anastasius did the same too, abdicating the throne and passing it on to Kasimi. On his side, however, it was only a matter of Kasimi's will of when to inherit the throne formally. But even as he posed as the crown prince, he was basically ruling as he handled all the necessary paperwork and governed the empire. Anastasius was pretty much having an early retirement as soon as Kasimi took care of things. If you look at it in another way, it was basically the new generation's turn to lead. Heiss's identity, as the last divine dragon of darkness, was still perfectly hidden and secure despite witnesses of his great and majestic image ruling the skies and obliterating the rebels. They never knew where the dragon had gone after appearing near the church's bell tower. Adira and Kasimi's days had practically been peaceful ever since the war. They spent each day lovingly, full and contented with each other's presence. Adira continued to be moody with Kasimi constantly monitoring her and being overall overprotective but she was otherwise happy all the same. The few times she could escape from his needless worry would be the few times he is needed with the post-war recoupments and it becomes Alexander's turn to guard her, who, was, for reasons unspoken, went on to become a noble bachelor. To give the weary and resilient citizens a reason to be merry, Kasimi's ascension to the throne was held in a grand full display. People, from all generations of each family, came to attend the ascendancy of their new emperor. The commoners were excited to see this kind of ceremony for the first time in their lives as it was always a private event exclusive to the nobles. But this time, it was something that their new governing monarch shared to each and every one of them. Regardless of their status as commoners, slave or nobles, everyone was given a day to just relax, breathe and be happy. As everyone thought the coronation ceremony to have ended on a high note, with the crown and scepter resting securely on his head and his hands respectively, Kasimi suddenly stepped forward as if to address all of them. There is something I wish everyone to bear witness to. As everyone here knows, I am deeply enamored with this one particular lady that I just couldn't stop chasing even after all these time. It is also common knowledge how much this lovely woman's charms captivate hearts unknowingly. So much that I am constantly kept on my toes guarding for anyone that might dare steal her. So I am now asking your blessings as I formally stake my claim for her heart. Lady Adira Ramiria Ir Silveris, my sunshine, will you marry me? Asked Kasimi as he went down on bended knees. A royal, the newly crowned emperor no less, kneeling down to another had been unprecedented from all records of the empire's history. It was from that moment on that Kasimi would forever be known as the first emperor who was so head over heels in love with his empress. He knelt as he asked for her hand in marriage, and their formal wedding would also leave its mark on history as the most grand, open and festive marriage of all nobility as the couple shared their beautiful moment to everyone. And oh, you wouldn't begin the imagine who turned out to be the most unpredictable in this story, our dear Melissa Asteria Sile-Niveria. Well, she eventually got engaged to Duke Ramé Dryer for Ear Silveris as they both shared the passion of gushing, 
raving, and rhapsodizing the center of their affections, their empress. Hurrying footsteps, shouts of commands and frantic people scurried all around the palace as their queen started her long labor. The king, also panicking, was asked to step out as soon as signs of delivery started. All of the men, left outside the parlor, were on edge as they listened to the doctor, they had called in, call out his orders. It wasn't that they didn't believe in the physician's capability, but the way his voice sounded to all of them caused a little bit of concern, especially since the temperature was way below normal already. A shrill scream, like a final push, rang so loudly in their ears that got their king up on his toes itching to burst in the room and be by his wife's side. And then, silence fell over them like a big orchestral hall filled to the brim with audience but not a single sound was heard. It was unnaturally quiet. Chill suddenly ran up the man's spine as he couldn't stop himself from opening the door of the silent room. A little cry escaped a tiny child's pouted rosy lips before it turned louder. The nurse, cradling the baby in her arms, gently and gingerly reached out her arms to give their king a full view of his newborn. A beautiful princess with snow-white locks, peachy cheeks and blood-red lips. Tears started pulling on their king's eyes without his knowledge and he turned to his queen, tired and melted on the bed. He was immediately by her side as he swiped aside stray locks drenched with her sweat despite the blazing snowstorm outside the palace. You did well, my wife, thank you so much. How is the child? She rasped in between her short gasps of tired breaths. She's well, healthy and as beautiful as you. That's great. The king, feeling as if something was wrong, turned to the doctor, whose gaze turned solemn and afraid. What is the meaning of your look? As if the cold outside was nowhere near enough, the frost emanating from their king was rapidly seeping through their core, immediately making them shiver tumultuously. My love, it's okay, it is not their fault, please, calm down. No. You. You can't leave me, you. You promised. We'd be together till we grow old. You promised me, I know. I'm sorry but, it seems like, I won't be able, to keep that, promise after all. Mommy, is my mommy okay? What about my sibling? A child ran in extreme excitement before the heavy and chilling atmosphere before him made him pause. My child, please, forgive mommy for, breaking our promise. Please, protect, your sister. I love you my sweet little children, and I love you, my love. At the queen's dying breath, without even having the chance of giving the people she loved and the child she birthed a farewell kiss, the remaining fire in her was snuffed out. Yes, it isn't their fault, nor is it yours, it's that child's. A dark and gloomy voice with a dangerous edge to it made everyone on full alert. Without even understanding everything that just happened, the poor boy moved on instinct and snatched the child out from the nurse's arms and bolted away before his father's hand, consumed by madness, even reached the child. Everything happened too fast and fueled by only his mother's last words, he ran far away from the palace he once called his home. Heartbroken and mourning for his beloved mother he lost and his family undone at every thread. Why do you have to write such an awfully melancholic play like that? What? It's not like it happened anyway. Did you know tearjerkers are a hit nowadays? God, what would the people think if they find out who the real author is? Then, they'll just have to not find out, right? I'm sure you got your ways, husband. The woman smiled cheekily as she adjusted their hood and returned back to their home where the image that greeted them was a raven-haired boy coddling and playing with his burbling little sister. Upon noticing their arrival, they both beamed up at them and joyfully called out Mommy, Daddy albeit the little girl still babbling out her words. Ah, the sight of these cute little ones always heals me. Adira fussed on their children making them squeal in response. Notes. I really didn't plan to make this last part at all as I wanted to give their story an open ending. But as I received lots of requests to give it an epilogue, I decided to make one after years. Don't ask me why I was gone for so long lol. Anyway. Thank you so much for the continued support on this novel even after it ended. I saw a lot of re-readers and was so happy seeing them read it again and again. I am so honored my lovelies. Banzai to all of us. Banzai Tilda. With this, she becomes a passive villainess, not. Has officially ended. Thank you. After story. Moving forward.
slowly peeling his eyes open, ocean blue eyes glanced around a familiar structure of dirty white and dull gold Corinthian columns lined up together and towering over him. Pushing his lanky and weak body to stand up, his gaze gravitated towards the familiar pool of untended unclean water and weeds in front of the statues of the gods and goddesses. He turned towards his own body of almost skin and bones and his incredibly unkempt appearance with long and disheveled sticky hair and long beard that almost covered his pale and ashen face. His surprised and confused eyes went back to the god statues when he thought he saw something flicker from that direction and stayed on their symbols for a good while, before he finally allowed himself to shed uncontrollable sobs that racked his frail and aching body. They had sent him back. They had given him the chance to rectify things and accept that he would never have back what he lost. They had given him the chance to make peace with himself and move forward. And most importantly, they had given him their punishment. After a few hours of just staying there, lost and crying, a new spark of life once again bloomed in his beautiful and calm cerulean blue eyes before he bid them goodbye and gratitude, leaving a silent prayer for the woman he loved, to build a happy family with the people she loved he set course back to the kingdom she left in his care. The rebuilding of the once fallen empire didn't come easy. That was without a doubt. However, their missing emperor came back after abandoning them for a few months and stayed with them through thick and thin that they looked at him at a renewed light as he worked hard for his redemption. The Vasilis Empire was long gone. From its ashes stood the new, Ars Empire, a name that had already been long forgotten and buried by the people of that place but never their emperor. After a few years of dedicating his everyday into raising the empire back onto its feet, the emperor, in his annual excursion incognito, went again to the birth town of his beloved. Ahead the ruins of the Silverous Castle was a cliff, overlooking the rising and setting sun and glittering sea, that didn't exist previously. No one knows how it came to but he may have an inkling as to what did that. Below a lone tree that stood there, there was someone else that got to the spot before him and he was just standing there watching the waves crash below the cliff and listening to the bird's call. He thought to himself that it may have been a stray child, for who else would know the significance of that place aside from him? Walking close to the tree, he opened his mouth about to call out to the team before the latter noticed him first and turned to regard the intruder that disrupted his peaceful moment with his mother. Sharp sapphire blue eyes glanced at his direction and he immediately knew who it was. The teen assumed the appearance that resembled his mother the most. He looked exactly like that cheeky little boy always attached to the hip of his mother, but this time a lot older. Tears sprang up on his cerulean eyes as this face brought so many fond memories of his lost love. And after that fateful meeting, the emperor would never forget to leave a day in his busy week to go to that special place to leave her favorite lily flowers and hope to see that child again. It would take months and almost a year before the teen even regarded him as something remotely close to an acquaintance and simply converse with him. And another few years before the life in him slowly exhausted and he left everything he built, his wealth and the whole empire onto the hands of that child. The only thing that reminded him of the happy memories he shared with his love. It was at his deathbed, before any one of his aides even had the chance to ride their horses and speed away to find this heir that a raven-haired teen with sharp and mesmerizing sapphire blue eyes waltzed into their emperor's room, at the centermost part of their palace without anyone noticing, that their emperor finally saw that same enchanting smile his beloved would always give him and he slept with a peaceful smile on his face. A new emperor, they knew nothing about his life and history, but respected and assumed his legitimacy with their emperor's last words. The only time he got to call the child that way, your mother would have been so proud of you. Son. And the new Oz Empire, ruled by no blue blooded heir but genuine nonetheless, moved forward from the darkest part of their history. Give happiness and be happy, my son. Author's Notes H.I. Tilda I am back briefly cause I wanted to write this part. I still haven't had the chance to formally plot the storyline of a sequel but I might. Honestly, I'm still surprised by the amount of support I got with this book even after it had ended. So thank you so much for the continued support. Anyway, I know everyone knows the new empire's name and what it means. But it's no big brain actually, it's just Adira's initials. LOL. So if anyone's wondering why that name, then there's your answer. I just like the idea of Triton's atonement to dedicate everything he has to Adira, now and forever. 
So there you have your short after story of the other timeline. Ciao tilde banzai tilde tilde tilde. Love, Halloween G.